尊敬的各位来宾 ，esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the ninth China Anglo-Asian Forum. Distinguished guests, welcome to the ninth China and International Forum hosted by the Center for China and Globalization. 有请开幕式环节主持人。CCG 联合创始人、秘书长苗律博士上台。To chair the opening session, let's warmly welcome Dr. Mabel Miao, co-founder and secretary general of the Center for China and Globalization. 掌声有请。Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. 大家好，非常。Good morning. Welcome to. Attend the、uh, opening ceremony of Ninth China Globalization. Today, we are gonna engage in in-depth discussions about the challenges and opportunities faced by globalization, and we will focus on China's role and contributions within globalized context. We are looking forward to hearing your unique insights and sharing your wisdoms in this、uh, event. In-depth discussions about the challenges and the opportunities faced by globalization. Additionally, we will focus on China's role and contributions within the globalized context. We look forward to hearing your unique insights and sharing of wisdom during this event. First, we are honored to have Mr. Wang Huiyao deliver the opening speech. He is the chairman of the CCG and a former counselor to the State Council. Mr. Wang Huiyao delivered the opening speech for our ceremony. He is the chairman of the Center for China and Globalization and a former counselor to the State Council. Dr. Huang, please. Esteemed、uh, Minister Chen Deming and、um, Special Convoy Mr. Xie Zhenghua and、um, Vice Down President、uh, Mr. Liu Zhenming and、um, Ambassador Wu Hongbo, His Excellency Ambassador George Taledo, His Excellency UN Coordinator Xi Chaoji. Ambassadors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First, a warm welcome to everyone to this attending this nice China and Globalization Forum, hosted by Center for China and Globalization. This year marks the 15 years anniversary of CCG's establishment. CCG has long been committed. To research and、uh, advocate inclusive globalization, making its、uh, own efforts to promote inclusive globalization. Last night, we had a grand celebration banquet, attended by over 200 distinguished guests, including representatives from Chinese government. International organizations, and of course, over 20 ambassadors attended, as well as representing from international chamber of commerce, multinationals, and also representing from both domestic and international all walks of、uh, lives in China. So this year's China Globalization Forum will focus on critical. And present topics, such as climate change, the global economic outlook, major power relations, and more subjects that related to the challenging time of our world. Given the current uncertainties, we aim to gather perspectives, recommendations, and of course, collective efforts in. Solving and also tackling those urgent issues. So the forum consists of five roundtables、uh, today. A very important one, of course. 
There are two ambassador roundtables, respectively. The first is to discuss China, US, EU, and global climate dialogue for a sustainable 21st century. And also second roundtable, the China-Europe cooperation in uncertain times, challenges, and prospects and opportunities. And also we're going to have a lunch, and after lunch we'll have a, a trade and economic roundtable focused on China and the sustainable global economy. Where and, uh, and, where and, and also now. The afternoon we will feature business roundtable discussion, reset, renew, reinvest the private sector for economic rebound. And, and also, finally, there is also a Belt and Road roundtable because this year marks the 10th anniversary of Belt and Road Initiative. So the Belt and Road Roundtable will theme of the multi-stakeholder engagement for global development. What will the next decade bring in? Of course, at the beginning, uh, we are also going to have uh, former Minister of Commerce, Chen Deming, and of course, he's also our honorary chair of the Center for China Globalization. He's going to give a opening remark because he just come back uh, from Singapore. Uh, where he just recently attended a big meeting there. So, very importantly, we will get at these ambassador roundtables, we will get into the Sino-US-EU and global climate dialogues to a sustainable goals for the 21st century. Climate change is a challenge for, you, for all humanity, require global cooperation, and CCG will actively participate to promote cooperation. We will have the honor to hear important speeches from China's Special Envoy for Climate Change, Minister Xie Zhenghua, also from a U.S. Ambassador to China, uh, His Excellency Nick Burns, and also EU Ambassador to China, George Toledo Abrinina, and uh, also from China's de for, former, former Deputy Minister, Liu Zhengmin, and of course also the UN coordinator in China, His Excellency Xi the Chatterjee, and, and also we have quite a, a few ambassadors we invited to give a jointly to discuss this very important, highly uh, watched subject, where, where I think that the UN currently also holding a summit uh, that also involve this ur urgent issue. So, second, uh, the, uh, at this, uh, during this period of global turbulence, China-Europe cooperation faces both risks and prospects. We will explore how to achieve stability and development in cooperation during this uncertain time. We hear insights from our European ambassadors. At Global Economic and Trade Roundtable, we will contemplate China's sustainable development in a global economy, seeking new paths for growth to contribute to the global prosperity. And many invited speakers will share their views. The business roundtable, which is very important because we are having this uh, economic slowdown in, in the world and also impact in China, and also how we can boost foreign companies' operation in China, and also trying to revitalize the private sectors and facing the business community for the opportunities and challenges. Of course, finally, the Belt and Road Roundtable will look forward to the next decade, explore how new ideas, new proposals, and of course, new ideas can be generated for the, this global development initiative. So each roundtable will have a sufficient time and also we will have some uh, discussions uh, around that. So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ambassadors and esteemed experts, so in the backdrop of today's rapidly changing global landscape, and we mark the 10th anniversary also of the Belt and Road Initiative, the significance of China, uh, the, that the CCG holding this uh, annual forum will be a a good, a timely contribute to the dialogues, to the exchanges, to our contemporary China situation, and also, of course, for the world development. 
So it is a testimony to our commitment to foster international cooperation and address challenges and opportunities that define our era. So we find ourselves at a pivotal moment in history where the dynamic of international relations, trade, cooperation are evolving at an unprecedented pace. So the world is uh, interconnected through the technology, globalization, and uh, it's heavily intertwined. So we have to really work together. It is a time that with the forces of globalization, innovation, and sustainability are shaping the countries of our global society. So as we have gathered here today, we aim to foster dialogue and collaboration among the nations, industries, and thought leaders. The China Globalization Forum, which has already run into its ninth forum since 2014, has been a platform for exchange ideas, share insights, and also making recommendations towards a more interconnected, inclusive, and prospect future. So this form will transcend geographic boundaries, bring together diverse partic participants and perspectives and expertise from around the world. It is a discussing platform for great ideas and also the innovation that we are hoping to have achieved. By joining this collective wisdom and from the diplomats, academic, government officials, and we hope to build some consensus for the future cooperation. So this form presents an opportunity for us to reflect on the progress we made of the past year and also for the future that we are going to continue to looking forward. And we have to see what can, lesson can be learned and what are the challenges facing, ahead, facing us ahead. So in this endeavor, it is crucial that we maintain a spirit of openness and inclusivity. We must strive to ensure that the benefits of globalization are shared equally among nations and of course that the voice of all stakeholders are heard. Inclusivity is not just a matter of fairness, it is a pragmatic imperative. By harnessing the diverse ideas, perspectives of our global countries, we can unlock innovation and a solution that would be impossible in isolation. So to conclude, the China Globalization Forum is more than just a gathering in mind, but it is also a platform to our collective determination to shape for the better future. Together, let us seize this moment to work hand in hand, transcending national boundary and create a better tomorrow for all of us. As we embark on this journey of uh, new cooperation for the challenging future, we do hope that today's meeting will present a great exchange of ideas, finding solutions, making recommendations, and build up the confidence and that we can share the future for the mankind. So, we're going to expect an excellent discussion today. And once again, I want to thank you all very much for coming to this forum. And we hope to hear your insights and ideas. And I also appreciate all the great uh, delegates and participants attending today. We look forward to your discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, President Wan, for your kind introduction and uh, opening remark. Next, we will hear from His Excellency Mr. Chen Deming, who serves as the Honorary Chairman of the Center for China and Globalization, as well as, as, well as the Honorary President of the China Association of Enterprises with Foreign Investment. Also, he is the former Minister of Commerce in China. In today's speech, Mr. Chen will share his profound insights on globalization, 
International Trade, Investment and International Cooperation. 下面我们隆重的要邀请陈德明先生。陈德明先生是全球化智库的名誉主席，同时也是中国外商投资协会的名誉会长、商务部原部长。我们热烈的欢迎陈部长，有请。Your Excellency, Ambedas, Ambedas. Uh, I think uh, everyone living in China a long time. Maybe you can speak Chinese. So next time I will speak Chinese. Yesterday I just came back from Singapore to take the international forum. At that I meet some old friends such as. Uh, uh, Posco Lamy, uh, Robert Zolik, Tim Gatner, and so on. Uh, Honorable Ambassador Xie and Special Envoy Wu, Vice Minister Liu Zhenming, I just came back from Singapore where I participated in a discussion of global think tanks and that was uh, that coincides with uh, what we are discussing today so first of all I'd like to thank CCG colleagues for writing the a speech for me as well written but uh, uh, I will not be reading from the speech but uh, I would like to share with you the insights that we are, that uh, has been generated in Singapore. So the first, uh, th there were three topics there. The first one is about uh, uh, globalization, whether we, sh whether it is uh, deglobalization uh, or reglobalization. I would. I shared my thoughts there, and in general, I feel that uh, they w we were all ag we would agree that we are in a in an age of uh, consolidation, and there is still risk of uh, fragmentation. But so long as trade benefits all parties, so long as capital continues to pursue profits, the process of uh, globalization will not stop. A the most important part of the discussion was uh, competition between China and the uh, U.S., whether it would lead to confrontation because the U.S. Uh, kept uh, raising new slogans. They do not uh, uh, mention uh, decoupling. Instead, they replace it with uh, de-risking and uh, uh, reducing dependence. The, for example, the uh, the mentioning uh, of uh, French shoring and small yard high fences that were raised by a few um, ministers and secretaries that uh, recently paid to visit to China. This uh, risks um, dividing the world into small smaller camps. But uh, so long as China continues uh, multilateralism, so long as China continues to pay attention and pay interest to uh, the uh, the interest of uh, all parties in the world with our efforts after some um, time of uh, cons consolidation uh, globalization is going to ushering a new era especially uh, we need to link uh, globalization with uh, climate change and other global issues so there is a there is possibility and opportunity for the formation of new uh, industrial chains and supply chains, and we should see opportunities in this risk. The second um, topic for discussion was uh, China's economy, whether it was uh, it was heading for better, or whether it is in in decline. Uh, we agreed that there is a downward pressure. And uh, the pressure was uh, great in some areas, but uh, but uh, uh, but we agreed that uh, the recovery 
will be achieved in a, in a couple of years' time. The, the timeline will be stretched. I used to work in coastal areas, uh, so uh, they were uh, ec economically developed areas. For example, at the uh, mouth of the Yangtze River, Uh, there were three forces. There were there was the, uh, there was the Yangtze River. There was uh, typhoon. All of these um, uh, these uh, events, natural events, would coincide and create a um, rather huge uh, natural disaster. But uh, so long as these uh, but these uh, natural events will pass, and once they pass, it will be sunny days again. So this is much like uh, the, the situation that Chinese economy is in now. We have uh, economic uh, downturn. We, we are facing uh, pressure and sanctions posed by the U.S. For example, the, the 301 tariff on more than uh, 360 billion U.S. dollars worth of uh, goods. And the U.S. sanctions more than 1,300 uh, enterprises, of which uh, 600 came from uh, the, uh, the Department of Commerce, and uh, 400 come from the Treasury, and there, were, uh, there are bound to be more. And the third is uh, the problems, uh, uh, the inherent problems in, in China's economy, uh, sluggish consumption and uh, a negative growth in, in, in trade, the impending recovery of uh, the uh, real estate sector, and then debt. debt ratio is climbing, so, so the China, the, the problems, uh, the crisis in the global, global arena, the China-US um, problems and also China's own problems, these three forces are now converging, but uh, we are hoping that uh, China's economy would bottom out uh, in the third or the fourth um, quarter of this year and start to rebound uh, next year. And since uh, July this year, I, uh, according to my uh, calculation, there have been more than 20 uh, policies and documents uh, aiming to, to, to redress the, the, the economy issued by uh, State Council or State Council Ministries. Of course, uh, the detailed plans are yet to be seen, but uh, we should see that uh, these documents are, uh, are have a positive effect on increasing confidence of households and, uh, and enterprises. The third question we discussed was that uh, um, whether it is possible to use uh, more uh, cooperation to 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 mitigate the risks of uh, confrontation, I believe that uh, the ambassadors and uh, Chinese friends uh, present today are aware that uh, there have been multiple uh, um, uh, visits by senior U.S. officials, and we have uh, kept uh, contact and, and dialogue in, on multiple occasions. So the general picture is good, but uh, we are seeing. Uh, the uh, the pan-securitization of, of issues across the world. There's no clear definition of um, uh, many issues. So these are going to create uh, some problems. In dialogue, China-US dialogue, uh, China has taken uh, positive measures, for example, on multilateral fronts. We have uh, been coordinating rather well. Like, like the MC12 on the fishery subsidies, on the um, uh, IP for, for vaccines. Um, China, the stating, uh, those stating that it is still a developing country, nevertheless forego uh, wavered these rates. And also, uh, Ambassador Xie Zhenhua kept in good uh, touch with uh, Ambassador Kerry. We are also expecting to see more cooperation in aeronautics and in, in medicine, etc. 
the WC recent uh, the, the WTO recently passed a, an agreement on investment facilitation. More than 110 countries particip uh, uh, members participated, including in the EU, Japan, and uh, Canada, and uh, Korea. But it was uh, it was sad that uh, the U.S. has not yet joined this agreement. We are still working on it because the the uh, the investment nowadays uh, in the world is governed by more than three thousand six hundred agreement different agreements. If we can have one single consolidated agreement that every party adheres to, that I'm sure that it will be springtime for. For, uh, for all of us. Um, Secretary Gina Raimondo visited China recently, um, having established a new uh, mechanism with the Ministry of Commerce of China. So we are we. And so we're looking forward to have been meetings with um, President uh, Biden, although we are going to approach the uh, years of election in the United States. But still, we believe that we have uh, paid the way for the uh, communications, and uh, we have the conditions to further enhance our relations. It is our high expectation that the sanction is um, something that doesn't work so well. And uh, we have to join our hands together to make better of uh, our civilizations and also do better about our own systems. And uh, then we can, uh, based on these uh, conditions, to communicate well uh, with each other. And this is a reversible trend. I know uh, that is uh, some highlights and some viewpoints that I summarized from the Singapore um, meeting for your reference and uh, for your inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chen, and many thanks to all of the guests for your support to the opening ceremony, and my thanks to the friends attending this um, opening ceremony. So let's uh, kick off this um, um, forum that we are expecting jointly. Yes, support for event. Let us embark on this highly appreciated forum together, exploring the future of globalization and contributing our efforts towards the peace and the prosperity of China and the world. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent speeches in the opening ceremony. So we will move to the Ambassador Roundtable 1, and the topic for this roundtable is um, the China, U.S., EU, and Global Climate Dialogue for a Sustainable 21st Century. So I'd like to invite the Chair for this um, roundtable, CCG President and the former Councillor to the State Council, Mr. Wang. Roundtable at the 9th China and Globalization Forum, entitled China, U.S., EU, and Global Climate Dialogue for a Sustainable 21st Century. To chair this dialogue, let's warmly welcome President of CCG, Dr. Wang Huiyao. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Minister Chen, for your excellent uh, uh, opening remarks. So we are now getting to this uh, very uh, uh, highly expected uh, uh, Ambassador Roundtable, CCG Ambassador Roundtable. Uh, we've been having this Ambassador Roundtable for a number of years and has been uh, actually, uh, uh, already uh, many ambassadors in Beijing knows, uh, knows our roundtable. So, so today we are very uh, fortunate. We had uh, His Excellency Minister Xie Zhenghua, the special envoy on climate change of China. His Excellency Ambassador Nick Burns from the U.S. Embassy. His Excellency, His Ambassador George Toledo from EU delegation. And of course, also we have uh, the uh, former Deputy Foreign Minister, Mr. Liu Zhenghua. Of course, we have many ambassadors at table today who will, will, will participate in this uh, dialogue. So again, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, very important ambassador dialogue. Actually, the topic we're going to discuss today is about uh, global issue of climate change of this uh, crucial moment. So this 
roundtable we bring together, particularly ambassador from US, EU, and, and, China, and also representative from China, the three country, a three economic, the three largest economy in the world actually, account for more than 60% of global GDP and over 50% of global greenhouse gas emission in 2022. So we actually, we have to, the three largest economies have to work together to put efforts, no matter in renewable energy or in clean technology. So if the US, China, and the EU can work together in the field of climate change, they can make great contribution to our objective in fighting climate change. So I think that China, United States, and Europe can work together on climate change, including uh, investment financing and also development initiative. So by working together, they can ensure that all countries have access to resources and technology and also needed to address this global challenge. So collaboration in this area can also create new opportunities for economic growth and job creation as well as enhance the global community's ability to respond to the impacts of the climate change, which is urgently needed to be addressed. So this is really a great occasion, and uh, I would like to really start with uh, Minister Xie Zhenghua. Minister Xie Zhenghua actually has a long career in the climate change, climate change you know, cooperation leadership in China. He has been actually the, uh, since 1990, he was the uh, vice administrator of the uh, National Environment Protection Agency, and of course also become the administrator 1993. He was the minister of the State Environment Protection Administration, and also he was, uh, of course, Chinese government special representative on climate change. So, without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Minister Xie Zhenghua to give your excellent <laughs> uh, views to, to share with uh, our Ambassador Roundtable. Minister Xie, Xie Bu Zhang. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. And our Excellency Honorary Chair, Chen Leming and um, Excellency Nicholas Burns and uh, Jorge Toledo, and uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very happy to attend today's um, Ambassador Roundtable. And I'm here to describe some events and some status and conditions of uh, China's positions and also the current uh, cooperation between China and uh, other countries. So right now, less than 100 days away from the COP28 in Dubai, the major missions for this COP is to promote the achievements and the success of COP28. And to this, as per implementing the requirements of President Xi Jinping, we conducted a very intensive cooperation and consultations dialogue with uh, the different stakeholders in EU and US to find out the solutions to some divergences. And uh, this July, US Climate Special Envoy John Kerry visited China. Premier Li Qian, Vice President Han Zheng, and Minister Wang Yi received the visit from Kerry. And I, together with the Kerry, spent three days conducting 30 hours of consultation, and uh, Nicholas Burns, Your Excellency, also attend this event. And uh, regarding the uh, science, nature, the actions of climate change, respectively, in the respective countries, and pragmatic corporations bilaterally and multilateral progresses, China and U.S. conducted in-depth communications and exchanges. And uh, we made commitments that we are going to keep communications and uh, to reach consensus between the state uh, leaders of both countries and uh, to contribute to the solutions to the success of the Dubai COP meeting. And in recent two months, I, together with Special Envoy Curry, would conduct a one video conference per two weeks discussing on the major issues regarding how to promote the Climate Action Task Force 
as well as um, the uh, corporations to push forward the uh, 2020s work for climate change. And actually, I propose to Mr. Kerry, if um, required and necessary, we can have um, in a third party, or even I myself uh, would be willing to visit the United States to have face-to-face -face discussion with uh, Mr. Kerry so that we can achieve positive results and contribute to the well-being of uh, both countries and the people of the world. And in this uh, July, Vice Premier Ding Xuexiang, Vice Chairman uh, Friends and Timmersman have attended the China-EU high-level dialogue on environment and climate. And this is actually the first offline meeting after the dialogue mechanism initiated, and both has um, issued the joint newsletter deciding to continue implementing the uh, leaders' consensus, consensus between both sides and uh, to intensify the communication dialogue and join hands to achieve the achievements and the success of COP28 in Dubai. And uh, we have acknowledged the uh, realms of cooperation regarding circular economy, biodiversity, chemicals management, plastics, pollutions, and the state carbon market development, climate adaptations, and the main thing, discharge control and the clean energy transition. Preparing for the high-level dialogue, I, together with the Vice Chairman France, Tim Mins, conducting the dialogues respectfully, and it was a very successful dialogue, but uh, he came back to his mother t uh, motherland uh, and uh, joined the election, and I hope that his successor can keep this dialogue, as always, contributing to the success of Dubai COP28. Apart from that, we together with uh, UAE, which is the presidency state, and other stakeholders, international organizations, institutions, and uh, also Chairman Sultan and Executive uh, Secretary General. We conducted a dialogue with all of them. And um, Chairman Sultan repeatedly told me that the this year is the year of negotiations. We faced with a lot of challenges. And recently, I also conducted exchange with um, Chairman Sultan. And uh, we uh, committed to support the success of Dubai Conference. So everyone is um, sparing attention to the uh, uh, relevant uh, key issues in uh, COP28 as follows. The first one is um, emission reduction and energy transition. So climate actions, first of all, has to prioritize the uh, energy transition. We have to respect the different national conditions, and we have to make some foundations before disruptions to guarantee fair transition, first of all. We have to make a global renewable energy development goals which can be acceptable by all, considering the different national conditions. And we have to combine the quantitative and qualitative um, conditions and methods together. And also, in the uh, climate um, ministerial meetings, we proposed uh, some solutions as well. And we hope that this uh, conference not only talk about the goals, but also to talk about whether these goals can be reached or what kind of conditions need to be food, uh, fully uh, exerted. Second, considering the intermittence of uh, renewable energies in terms of the large-scale energy storage, power transmission, and smart grid and uh, microgrid, which are yet to be sophisticated technically, we also need to roll being still played by the fossil fuel as the basis and as the support, so as to support the stability of the grid power operation and the security of uh, the energy supply and economic society development. And uh, during this transition process, every country would encounter this stage of um, stringency. Faced with these um, imperatives, we have to understand each other and uh, we have to communicate and uh, also coordinate with each other to set tackle these problems. And uh, thirdly, phase out all of uh, the fossil fuels energies are not realistic. Therefore, Glasgow meetings decided to phase down the facilities on installed with emission reduction equipment so we can uh, develop CCUS technology to tackle the uh, emissions from the fossil fuel energy utilization. 
So the large-scale storage could also tackle part of the problem as a technology tool. And at last, I hope that the Dubai conference would not only talk about the uh, emission reduction for the emission reduction, or would not talk about the empty promises, but to consider the uh, balances between the development of security and uh, carbon reduction, and based on the best practices and the communications and the challenges that we have to tackle to talk about how to cooperate with each other and to tackle the challenges which are faced during the process of uh, handling the technologies, trade and industry chain. Second, adaptation, loss and damage. First of all, we support the uh, goals reached on the Dubai conference about the global adaptation. We need to make sure that uh, there is a balance between mitigation and adaptation. At present, mitigation has uh, penetrated into fields such as energy, industry, transportation, and carbon sinks, etc. Discussions on adaptation should make reference to. Uh, should we, we should refer to mitigation, and should, uh, we should not uh, be uh, stick to uh, technical details, but rather uh, discuss specific fields such as uh, warning, forecasting, disaster prevention, mitigation, resilient cities, farmland, etc. The uh, event, things that are close to the heart of every country. And secondly, the World Meteorological Organization has proposed that by investing one billion US dollars, we can help all vulnerable developing countries to set up an early warning and forecasting system, which not only solves the problem of adaptation, but also effectively prevents loss and damage. We can also support the uh, early warning initiative proposed by Secretary, Secretary General of the United Nations has an important early harvest. That's um, a small amount of money with a huge effect. And finally, the Dubai Conference should make follow-up arrangements for the um, implementation of the, uh, the commitment to double the funding with a clear timetable and roadmap so that uh, developing countries can be hopeful and third, financial, technological, and capacity building support uh, is necessary. First of all, the uh, uh, annual funding target of 100 billion US dollars pledged by developed countries at the Copenhagen conference in 2009 must be met this year. This is a matter of mutual trust between North and the South. OECD report assesses the figure for 2021 to be 83.3 billion US dollars, which is still 17 billion short of the target. Uh, de developed countries uh, do not uh, agree with this uh, figure. For Ambassador Kerry and Vice President Timmermans, along with many uh, colleagues, uh, assured me that uh, this goal will be realized. I mean, uh, although it is 14 years late, it's better than nothing. And secondly, the discussion on the flow of funds must uh, not deviate from the original intention of uh, developed countries to fulfill their funding obligations to help developing countries. A comprehensive assessment by international agencies shows that by 2030, the cumulative financial needs for realizing the autonomous um, contributions will, be, will reach 5.8 to 5.9 trillion US dollars a total of uh, about a hundred trillion US dollars will be needed to reach the goals of agreement, this agreement, and at least four to six trillion US dollars will be needed annually for the transformation to a, a low carbon economy. The 100 billion dollars may be uh, a drop in the bucket, but it's a small uh, amount of money with a huge uh, leverage effect. Only when public funds are in place can we send a positive uh, posi policy signals and convey a stable expectation, uh, stable signal to the market and mobilize uh, funding from multilateral development banks, international financial institutions, the private sector and social funds to 
um, the areas of uh, glo uh, global green, low carbon and ca climate resilient development. And thirdly, the key to mitigation effects and transformation lies in technology. According to the re, uh, report of the International IEA, half of the technologies needed to achieve net zero emissions have not yet uh, been commercialized. Or uh, the uh, Dubai conference should make further agreements, arrangements on how to implement the vision of technological cooperation in Article 10 of the agreement to make further arrangement to, uh, to reach the goals. Fourthly, insufficient capacity is the biggest obstacle in meeting the goals. So we need to uh, implement the uh, uh, Article 11 of the Paris Agreement on information reporting and uh, cooperation for capacity building. And uh, we need a work plan for enhancing the capacity of developing countries and fourth, the global stock taking and uh, the Paris Agreement and the strengthening of international cooperation is necessary. First, the uh, st stock taking should convey a positive energy. Comprehensive assessment should be taken into consideration. If the Paris Agreement is not reached or not fully implemented, and if uh, parties do not take action, the, uh, the global temperature rise may reach 3.5 degrees Celsius or even higher. Uh, we should uh, make every effort to avoid such a scenario. If uh, the actions uh, taken by uh, countries uh, under the Paris Agreement taken together uh, with these, uh, the global temperature rise may be contained to about 2.6 to 2.8 degrees which indicates that uh, there is progress under the Paris Agreement. Uh, we need to um, uh, appreciate these, this positive agreement, but we still need to work harder. If all the targets committed to under the Paris Agreement have been met, we should be able to uh, contain the uh, temperature rise to under 1.7 degrees. That means that if uh, that is uh, if all the NDCs are are met, so we will be able to uh, reach the goal of uh, temperature rise less than two degrees in. So this requires all parties to first of all meet their uh, their commitment, and then strive to do better. And secondly, the stock taking should be anchored in international cooperation progress in all uh, aspects of mitigation, adaptation and support should be assessed in a fair and comprehensive manner. Closing the gap ultimately depends on strengthening international cooperation so, that, so as to accelerate transform and innovation. The results of the stock taking should be centered on Pract uh, proposing practical solutions to the barriers affecting global climate action and cooperation. And this, is, uh, this will be uh, crucial to starting a new journey uh, of the Paris Agreement in the, in the critical decade, so as to prepare for a, sub a submission of new NDCs uh, by all parties in 2025. We stand ready to work with the United States and Europe to help other developing countries to develop renewable energy, increase climate resilience and enhance capacity. In addition, all parties should create a favorable diplomatic environment for international cooperation, build an open economic and trading system, adhere to multilateralism and globalization, and oppose trade protectionism and unilateral measures. Studies show that if trade protectionism uh, continues, PV module prices are expected to be 20 to 25 percent higher in 2030 than uh, in the globalization scenario. So this would be very detrimental to realizing this year's G20 summit's goal of stri striving for global renewable energy in 2030 to be three times that of 2020. We hope that. Uh, Countries concerned will refrain from politicizing technical cooperation in the uh, new energy industry 
and stick to fair, open and non-discriminatory trading po uh, trade policies, treat domestic and foreign enterprises and products equally, and eliminate trade barriers for better um, global and domestic renewable energy deployment. We hope that uh, countries uh, will not resort to unilateral measures such as carbon border adjustment mechanisms. And we hope that uh, all parties would uh, work together to address issues of uh, environmental integrity, carbon leakage under the multilateral mechanism for carbon pricing in the carbon market under uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. So given time constraints, these I'll uh, share these uh, thoughts first. And I look forward to uh, discussing these more in depth with you. Next week, I'll be co-hosting with my colleague, a French colleague, the Friends of the Paris Agreement High Level Dialogue in Beijing, where I will invite old friends and new who have uh, contributed to the achievement of the Paris Agreement to, d to discuss how we could contribute to the success of the Dubai Conference. Chair of the Dubai Conference, Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC will participate, uh, and the uh, Secretary General of the uh, Representative of the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations will send, will be uh, participating, and uh, I will bring uh, the results of uh, this meeting to to, the, uh, to our meeting next next week. I hope that we can bring uh, the wisdom of all parties together to promote the success of the Dubai Conference and continue to tackle climate change for the sake of all humanity, uh, humankind, for the sake of our future generations, and for the Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Special Envoy Ambassador Xie Zhenghua. I was impressed by what you said. You have been dedicated to climate change, dealing with climate change for, for more than for many years and you have made huge contributions in this regard and in some areas you, are, you have been leading global discussion. Recently you have been uh, ke uh, you have kept close contact with uh, European and uh, American colleagues. There have been many visits from the US senior officials of the United States and you expressed uh, your wish to, to go to US and uh, the EU for further uh, discussions. We appreciate that. And also you mentioned uh, we should uh, step up uh, cooperation with developing countries. And we need uh, a friendly diplomatic environment for, for, for the progress. So I think that's very important that we uh, safeguard multilateralism. Once again, thank you very much for sharing us with us your insights and, uh, and the latest development. We were very happy happy to be updated. Right, uh, our next uh, opening key uh, remark from uh, His Excellency Nicholas Burns, uh, Ambassador of the United States uh, to People's Republic of China. I, I know uh, Ambassador Burns for many years and he, since he was at Harvard. He was actually uh, a Harvard professor uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government where he was a Goldman professor of practice of diplomacy uh, since uh, until 2021, when he was appointed ambassador of China. But of course, before that, he was also uh, served as a member of the Foreign Policy Advisory Board of the Secretary of, of State John Kerry. And of course, before that, he was ambassador to NATO. And also before that, I know he has that and to take the uh, Under Secretary of the State Department. So have many years of experience. And also we would really like to hear, you know, uh, the U.S. perspective on the climate change, where I think we have heard a lot from, from China, but we would like to hear from you. So Your, your Excellency, Nick, Nick, your turn, please. Beijing. And I'm a struggling student of Mandarin, Mr. President, so please excuse my grammatical mistakes. But it's a pleasure to be here this morning with so many colleagues. Thank you, President Wang, for making this possible. My thanks to Minister Chen and the Center for China and Globalization for this opportunity to speak with all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here with uh, Special Envoy Xia. He is someone who has dedicated his entire life to the environment and to climate change. We have great respect for him. 
It's a great pleasure to be with my great friend, Ambassador Jorge Toledo, Ambassador Leo, uh, to our UN resident coordinator, Mr. Chatterjee, and we have the ambassadors from the United Arab Emirates, from Spain, from Slovenia, from Indonesia, and many of our fellow ambassadors from European countries and allied countries are here this morning. It's a very good turnout, so I welcome them all. We're here today because there's no greater challenge for China, for the United States, for the world, than the challenge of climate change. And we've seen the impact just this past summer. Unprecedented heat waves, wildfires, flooding, droughts across the globe, all of them linked, we believe, to the climate crisis. In fact, 2023 was the hottest summer on record. The three-month period from June through August surpassing previous records by a quite substantial margin. Last two weeks, we saw an unusually strong Mediterranean storm cause an extraordinary, a catastrophic human tragedy in Libya where thousands of people have died. And unfortunately for all of us, predictions for the future are even more serious than what we've seen. The United States, China, the European Union, all countries. We're vulnerable to these changes, we're victims of the changes, but we're also authors of our present world and therefore have to take responsibility together for the climate crisis. We know the data, we know the Intergovernmental uh, governmental Panel on Climate Change findings highlight that to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we need rapid, deep, and in most cases, immediate reductions in greenhouse gases, and we need them in this decade. My friend, the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, our former Secretary of State John Kerry, pointed out in Nairobi at the Africa Summit, uh, Climate Summit just earlier this month that it is our hope that our two countries, the United States and China, as the two largest economies in the world and the two largest carbon emitters can now come together and recognize climate change for what it is. It's an existential threat to all of us. At the United Nations General Assembly just two days ago in New York City, my president, President Joe Biden, said that the United States stands ready to work together with China on issues where progress hinge on our common efforts. And nowhere, President Biden said, is that more critical, critical than the accelerating climate crisis. So our two countries need to come together. We have come together successfully in the past, and we, can, we believe that we can do so again. We did so in the U.S.-China Joint Glasgow Declaration on Enhancing Climate Action that was achieved in November 2021. We agreed that our two countries would commit to pursue efforts to hold the global average temperature increase to well below 2 degrees Celsius and to pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Last November, when President Biden and President Xi Jinping met in Bali in Indonesia, they underscored that our two countries must work together to address all the important transnational challenges, but most notably climate change. And they said at that meeting that they were going to empower the key senior officials, not just to maintain communication, but to deepen our constructed, uh, constructive efforts. And in that vein, as Minister Shia said, Secretary Kerry was here in Beijing in the middle part of July. Uh, he and Minister Shia, I think, had very good constructive meetings. They were marathon meetings, as Minister Shia has said, over 30 hours of them. And during that visit, our two countries committed again that we need to continue our efforts on a productive basis to reach the goals that we've set for each other. This has been an unusual four months in the U.S.-China relationship, and I must say as the American ambassador here, I've been very pleased that Secretary Blinken visited here uh, and met with President Xi Jinping, as well as his counterparts uh, in June. Secretary of the Treasury Janet Yellen was here in July. Secretary Kerry was here in mid-July for those very important conversations. Secretary Gina Raimondo was here at the end of August to meet with Premier Li Chung 
and Commerce Minister Wang Wen Tao and Vice Premier Hurley Fung. And just this past weekend, I was very pleased to join our National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, for um, two days of conversations in Malta with Foreign Minister and Director Wang Yi. So you can see that our two countries are making a great effort together to communicate, to deepen our channels, our senior level channels, to try to stabilize, and I think we're making progress on that, a very important relationship for both of our countries and for the world. And at the center of the climate work between us are two individuals, Minister Shia, Special Envoy Shia, and John Kerry. I can tell you that they're actively engaged with each other. They have met in person or virtually, or on the phone, more than 50 times, 5-0, and I have, great, um, I have great anticipation that they'll be very active working together in the next month or two. In New York this week, Secretary Kerry also met with Vice President Hong Zhen. They discussed this issue of climate change. They discussed the imperative of a successful COP28 in the United Arab Emirates. Speaking for the United States, I'm pleased to say that our President Joe Biden has been working very hard to make sure that the United States does what we need to do for our country and to meet our global responsibilities on this issue. The President said this week in New York, this is an existential threat, and it's been an existential threat from the moment that he took office in January of 2021. President Biden has set a 2030 national determined contribution target of reducing America's net greenhouse gas emissions by 50 to 52 percent from 25 le 2005 levels, and we've pledged to reach net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. So we hope that all countries will include these economy-wide targets covering all greenhouse gases in their upcoming nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement, as called for by the leaders of the G20 summit earlier this month. In addition, President Biden created the first ever National Climate Task Force in our country with more than 25 senior U.S. government leaders and called for putting the climate crisis at the center of United States foreign policy and national security. I've been involved with American diplomacy for 44 years since the Jimmy Carter administration. And I can tell you at no point in the last four decades has the United States been more committed and done more in our own country to try to live up to our own ambitions and to our responsibilities to every other country. President Biden has led in passing transformative laws in our country, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. They're positioning us to cut our emissions in half in the next seven years, by 2030. The Inflation Reduction Act is actually America's largest ever investment in clean energy and climate action, $369 billion. It's projected to deliver 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas reductions by 2030. That's 10 times the climate impact than any other single piece of legislation in my country has ever enacted. And this act is actually codified in legislation passed by our Congress with dedicated funding and incentives to our private sector in the form of tax credits. Meanwhile, the United States is deploying an all-out effort to partner with nations around the world to reduce global emissions sufficiently, again, to reach that 1.5 degrees Celsius target. For example, we're working together, and I'm proud to be sitting with my good friend Jorge Toledo. The European Union and United States have led the Global Methane Pledge, a coalition of 150 countries launched at COP26 and dedicated to cutting methane emissions at least 30% from 2020 levels by 2030. Reducing all greenhouse gases behind, beyond carbon dioxide alone, of course, is essential because non-CO2 greenhouse gases are responsible for half of today's global warming. And so together with Norway, we've co-launched the Green Shipping Challenge at COP27, 
That seeks to reduce global emissions from the shipping sector, a massive source of greenhouse gases. And we're also working with many of the countries around the table in, this, in the International Civil Aviation Organization along similar lines. But the bottom line is this, and the stark fact is that because China is the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, it will be impossible for the world to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius without enhanced ambition from China. Secretary Kerry has recently pointed out International Energy Agency statistics that imply that if China sticks with its current plan and does not peak emissions until 2030, then the entire rest of the world must go to zero by 2040 or even 2035, and that would be an impossible goal for all, all of us to meet. And I say this very respectfully because all of us are mindful of the extraordinary efforts, and we commend China for this, that China has made in renewables, in solar energy, in wind energy, where it's leading the world. And we hope to do some of that ourselves in increasing our own renewable commitment to renewables. But this does mean that we are asking, we hope that China will follow through and build upon the US-China mutual commitments in the joint Glasgow Declaration to phase down coal consumption, to develop an ambitious national methane action plan, and to address illegal deforestation. China can help lead the world to success by peaking and starting to reduce emissions during this critical decade. The other thing that Secretary Kerry has on his mind, and he's in New York this week, he wrote an op-ed uh, with Fatih Birol, the IEA executive director, warning that the proliferation of, of unabated coal, or coal used to produce energy without steps to, to eliminate emissions, threatens to negate any progress on climate change, such as the recent momentum for the deployment of renewable energy resources. Even if not a single new coal plant were built anywhere in the future, the IEA has said that the emissions from the world's existing coal fleet, if left unchecked, would be the death blow to the goal of limited global warming to the critical threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So addressing the climate crisis is important for all of us. It's important for all of us to meet our responsibilities. But I would suggest it's not just about the United States and China. The world needs and expects every nation to take actions aligned with the 1.5 degree goal. And we are here today, I'm here representing my country today, not to lecture, certainly not to dictate any climate action to any nation, uh, but to hope that we can all work together because the science demands that we work together for a better global future. And we all must do more because time is passing as we think about 2030. I do want to credit the organizers of this conference for bringing us together. I want to credit Minister Shia, the Special Envoy, for the extraordinary efforts he is making on behalf of his country. Thank the countries around the world who are working with the United States and China. We look forward to COP28, to working productively with China, with the EU, and all the other countries represented at this conference. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Burns. And uh, uh, it's very good to he hear all your uh, very uh, encouraging speech. And uh, so we actually, you mentioned about uh, in the last several months, we had uh, several US uh, senior officials, uh, Secretary Blinken, Secretary Yellen, <laughs> Uh, John Kerry, uh, Environment Henry, and also Secretary Raimondo all visit China, but particularly uh, last weekend you participated in this uh, MARTA uh, meeting between uh, Jack Sullivan and of course China's uh, top diplomat Wang Yi. That is very encouraging. But on top of that we had a, a special envoy, Minister Xi, had many <laughs> countless, <laughs> numerous meetings between uh, his counterpart John Kerry uh, in the US and China. So all those are very encouraging news. We hope that, uh, as you said, we're creating a good environment and good cooperation spirit, and China, US, and, and of course, EU, and also, you know, many other countries together, we can really fight in this common threat, and uh, which is imminent, and uh, we have to really work together. So, 
uh, this is really a great uh, discussion that we're having on the, uh, around this table for how we can work together, cooperate together, and uh, you know, meeting the challenges of the 21st century. So thank you again. Now, I'd like to uh, invite uh, uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador, you know, uh, uh, George Tenedo. I mean, actually, uh, today is his birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday, Ambassador Toledo, you know. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Ambassador Toledo is, uh, is, uh, is also another uh, very senior diplomat. He has actually served uh, in the, as the uh, as Spanish Secretary of State for EU and European Affairs. And of course, in Asia, he has been the uh, ambassador of EU uh, in Japan, and before he taking on his uh, spin, uh, but also uh, European Union uh, uh, into India and Japan before arriving to China. But of course, uh, he, he's from Spain, and uh, he has, uh, uh, you know, in China, very active. I mean, uh, also leading the European delegation uh, on this initiative with uh, 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 discussing on the climate change, and uh, so. Uh, we were very pleased to hear from our European uh, EU delegation. <laughs> Ambassador Toledo, your perspective, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Henry, a very good friend of mine and of the EU delegation. I must say it is a bit challenging for me to speak today, not only because it's my birthday, 59th birthday, uh, but because I have to speak after course, my good friend Ambassador Burns and my good friend Special Envoy uh, Xie, meaning special en speaking about, about climate change after Special Envoy Xie, who is uh, one of the leading authorities in climate change, if not the leading authority in climate change, is very challenging. Um, I'm not going to repeat facts that have been very well described by Ambassador Burns about what's happening and about why it's happening. I'm going to, I, I have them here, but I'm not going to repeat uh, these facts. I'm, I'm going to try and, and read some somehow obvious conclusions from these facts. First of all, climate change is getting worse every year. It, is, it has been worse this summer than last summer, and I'm afraid it will be worse next summer than this summer, and this is very bad. Second fact, and we have heard from Ambassador Burns what the sixth assessment report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is saying. Second fact is we are not doing enough. We are doing things, but we are not doing enough. It's not close enough with what we have to do. And the bottom line of all this is that climate change is not waiting for us. It's happening under our watch. And why is this happening? Maybe one of the first things we have to address is that although we have a kind of informal governance system or informal governance structure under the Paris Agreement, we need to reinforce this structure. We need to reinforce not only, as uh, Special Envoy Xie emphasized, the implementation and the accountability, but we have to augment our ambition, because with what we agreed and the implementation of it, we are not doing enough. Um, I'm representing the European Union here, and they're the close watch of some of my important member states. And I must say that, unfortunately, the European Union is one of the three largest emitters of greenhouse gases, climate effect, uh, cl climate change uh, is caused by these, 
but the European Union, the United States of America, and China are the three largest emitters of greenhouse gases. We know that. I'm not going to name names and the order in which we emit gases. Let me say that per capita emissions, um, in per capita emissions, the European Union is now already at the global average, which I'm afraid is not the case with China and the US. But we are all struggling to reduce. The European Union will be below the global average per capita emission in 2030. And this is a law in the European Union. In the European Union, we have been reducing our emissions since before the Kyoto Protocol was signed. But with increasing speed since 2005, and I must say with increasing speed with some of the most uh, important and um, serious challenges to the fight against climate change, which is the Russian aggression to Ukraine, which has caused, as you know, an energy crisis. Well, again, although Mr. Putin wanted us to freeze in uh, Europe, we have not frozen. And not only have we not frozen, but we have increased our ambition to move from fossil fuels to renewable energy. In the European Union, we remained committed to the objectives of the Paris Agreement, and we want to increase, we are increasing, we have increased our ambition. We have agreed that by 2030, we would have reduced our emissions, but at least 55% compared to 1990 levels. That will be, that will put us leading the global effort. So what can we do apart from strengthening the, govern, the governance of uh, the fight against climate change? Is to be exemplary in everything, including implementation, but also ambition. One thing we have done in the European Union, which is working extremely well, and the example of which we would like to be to, to see spread around the world, is something a bit controversial here and somewhere else, which is called carbon pricing. Our experience in carbon pricing shows that it has been the most cost-effective policy to cut greenhouse gas emissions and carbon, uh, robust carbon markets have been implemented where they have been implemented. They have delivered emission reductions through behavioral and technological change and they have accelerated innovation, all of them ambitious targets of the Paris Agreement. It has also raised revenue for the green transition. For instance, as an example of the success of carbon prices, uh, industries responsible for about 40% of our greenhouses emissions that are subject to carbon pricing have drastically reduced their emissions. We have established a cap, and under this cap, the emissions can be traded. Cap and trade is the name of the game. And since 2005, emissions of the industries covered by the cap and trade have come down already around 35%. This cap, by the way, is decreasing by 4.3% every year. Besides, the EU emission trading system has raised already more than 140 billion euros in revenues. As you know, China is developing a similar system. 
and we are trying to help and cooperate with China to establish and widen this system. We strongly believe it is the way to go. And let me say one thing about something which is more controversial, which is the carbon adjustment, the carbon, uh, carbon border adjustment me mechanism, or CBAM. And let me be very clear. CBAM is a fact, it will come in 2027, it will be effective. We're going to try to, to start very soon putting it in practice uh, as a trial. But me, let me be very clear. CBAM is not at all about protectionism. CBAM is only exclusively about reducing greenhouse emissions. Because there is no way we can do anything useful by having our industries pay a high price for the carbon emissions if they can avoid it going somewhere else where they can avoid this uh, carbon pricing. It is called carbon leakage. So by establishing the CBAM system, we are contributing, and this is the exclusive target of this system, we are contributing to the fight against climate change. So you see in the EU, although we are the, among the three uh, blocks here represented, we are the lowest per capita emitter, we are not proud of it because we want to reduce it further. And we are convinced, and we are going to do it, that we need to do more and faster than others. And we will become the world first net zero continent by 2050. So, as I said before, implementation, and I agree with Special Envoy Shea, is important, is essential. But as we saw, it's not enough. We need more ambition. And we need exemplarity. That's why Vice President Timmermans, a good friend, of uh, Special Envoy Xie, insisted in our recent high-level dialogue and, um, on, on environment and climate change that China raises its ambition. We know that when it comes to the deployment of renewables, China will be far ahead their commitments in renewables. We encourage China to say it because it would set an example and they have a very good opportunity now in COP28. We also, and Vice President Timmermans also raised uh, his concern to um, Special Envoy Xie and in the high-level dialogue, we have concerns about China opening recently and having plans to open new coal-fired power plants because it will have a bad impact over the long term on its decarbonization pathway. I must say in this respect that we were faced with a grave, serious crisis because of the Russian attack on Ukraine. Our supply of natural gas was cut and one of the options would have been to build more coal-powered plants. We took a deliberate decision not to do that. And I must say, that we have not built a single coal power plant in the last 10 years in the European Union. We are closing them down. Methane, as Ambassador Burns said, is a huge challenge. And the US, along with the EU and others, have signed the methane pledge. I would only repeat Ambassador Burns, uh, words by encouraging China to join us because this is of extraordinary importance. Cooperation. Cooperation with China, cooperation with the US. As you know, we describe our relation with China as one of partnership, competition, and systemic rivalry. Well, the best example of partnership is the fight against climate change. 
as Premier Lee Chang said when President von der Leyen was here in April, green is the color of our cooperation. So what do we do about the COP that's coming? Indeed, the EU, China, and the US can play a role of deal makers for governance. This is not about creating a G3 that would decide instead of the others. But this is about creating a G3 as an example, as being exemplary, as driving the ambition, as showing that we are the most committed. The EU, the uh, United Arab Emirates presidency has given us already a clear sense of direction and an injection of political momentum with the global stock take, which should become a key milestone for enhancing ambitious climate action in the coming years. It is essential that governments, and the three of us in particular, respond with concrete, ambitious commitments to this challenge. The global stock stock take needs to be able to inform and shape the next round of nationally determined contributions by 2025. COP28 needs action. It should reflect our call for action and stress that in order to keep the 1.5 goal within reach, we must peak global greenhouse gases emissions before 2025 at the latest and reduce them at least by 43% by 2030, 60% by 2035, and 84% by 2040 versus 2019 levels. As you, as you have already heard from me, we are going to lead this ambition. But along increased ambition, we need to demonstrate progress in implementing mitigation action. And uh, Special Envoy Xie uh, talked to us about that. We need all parties, and particularly major economies as ours, to implement our nationally determined contribution, but also to strive to include all greenhouse gas, gases, uh, gases and sectors in them. On loss and damage, finally. The EU and its member states are engaging in this process constructively to ensure an outcome that comprises all key elements outlined in the Sharm el Sheikh decision. In particular, we see the need for recommendation to explicitly target countries and its communities that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change, such as least developed countries and small island development states, while also play, paying attention to building long-term resilience against the adverse effects of climate change. And let me also be very clear. We need everybody, including China, to contribute to mitigation, especially for least developed and developing countries. Thank you very much for your attention. Also, very uh, stimulating remarks. Uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, of course, the climate change is really a great uh, uh, imminent threat for all of us. And uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, you know, G3. I mean, actually, <laughs> US, EU, and China being the three largest economy in the world, we have uh, uh, facing the common change, and we could work really together to show the world how this can be uh, contained. So, so this is really encouraging that. Uh, we all explore the possibilities and the mechanism uh, to work together. And uh, I, I think that China, of course, we are now ha still have the UN meetings going on. And, uh, and I remember a few years ago, President Xi uh, declared at the UN summit that uh, China will achieve a carbon peak before, uh, not by, before uh, 2030, and also carbon neutral before 2060. So, so we're all working towards that. And uh, I mean, the dialogue like this is very, very important. Uh, so now we have finished our set the scene remark by three representatives of the three largest economies in the world. Uh, now we're getting into the uh, 
discussing phase of our round table and we still have uh, six ambassadors <laughs> to discuss and we will leave a little bit time for uh, uh, a special envoy share and uh, Ambassador Burns and Ambassador Toledo to also uh, to say a few words at the end. So I hope that maybe we'll each have a three to five minute uh, remarks and uh, uh, so we can uh, start the uh, discussion. First, I would like to invite uh, uh, Minister, uh, Vice Minister Liu, Zhen, uh, Liu Zhenmin. He was actually appointed uh, uh, decade, uh, de uh, you know, uh, the, uh, as the uh, Under Secretary General, uh, by the Secretary General of Antares Gutierrez. Uh, that in the UN, but, but before that he served as a Vice Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs in China and also uh, a representative to the uh, international organizations in New York and Geneva, so uh, from China as well. So, Ambassador Liu, your, your turn, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Honorable participants, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm, I'd like to thank the CCCG for the kind invitation to me for this uh, ninth China Globalization Forum. Uh, and I'm also honored to join this August panel in a round table in discussion on climate change. So returning back to China from the United Nations for uh, 30 months, progressively I'm, I'm forgotten my English, so I have prepared my remarks intervention today in Chinese, it's very brief. So let me start to, to, to share you with something uh, in, in Chinese. Um, just now, um, Special Envoy Mr. Xie Zhenhua, Ambassador Burns, Ambassador Toledo made uh, keynote speeches. There's a lot of information contained within, raising uh, many focus points to us. Their speeches laid bare the fact to us that uh, the task is still very harsh ahead of us. I feel this very strongly because I have participated um, in person for many years in climate change negotiations from COP5. Since COP5, I have uh, participated in these uh, negotiations, including negotiations for the Kyoto Protocol. So when I was uh, Assistant Minister and uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, I participated in uh, six COPs together with uh, Special Envoy Xie Zhenghua, including the negotiations for the uh, Paris Agreement. In 2017, after becoming UN, uh, UN UDG, I... Um, have been thinking how we could better combine uh, climate change responses to sustainable development. So, I uh, leading UNDESA and my uh, my colleagues and I have been and discuss, uh, we have been exploring how to combine these uh, two aspects. In 2019, uh, we organized the first high-level negotiations. In 2021, uh, we organized the uh, uh, sustainable transport negotiations. In 2022, we organized the uh, sustainable M maritime convention. We also um, organized a few um, forest forums of the United Nations and. Uh, conventions on use of water resources through these dialogues and uh, forms. We have um, uh, combined climate change with other uh, aspects such as energy transformation, sustainable transport, sustainable use of uh, merit, uh, the sea, uh, protection of forests and uh, the sustainable use of water resources. Through these activities we have been able to raise the awareness that uh, uh, sustainable development is inseparable from uh, as response to climate change and uh, also I think we all of us should uh, be aware that uh, climate change responses is the responsibility of all co all governments it is also the uh, the obligations of each and every citizen so I've been 
I'm back to Beijing for more than a year, and uh, every year, uh, uh, every day, I pay attention to climate change. It's um, with the pain that I've noted that uh, 2023 has been a year with uh, the most extreme weather uh, incidents. 2023 might have been the hottest year in human history. Uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres alarmed, uh, warned us in September that. Uh, uh, climate collapse is starting. I agree with uh, him that uh, humans can still prevent the worst from happening, but uh, we need to take imminent actions. So I'd like to share a few thoughts and uh, uh, views on that. So first, we need to speed up implementing the Paris Agreement. More than a, uh, uh, 148 countries have raised uh, carbon neutrality goals. If we could speed up implementing the NDCs. This will still have positive effects on reaching the uh, goals of uh, Paris Agreement for containing climate uh, uh, temperature rise. I agree with uh, Special Envoy Sear. Uh, we, s we need to be confident and we still need to take actions. S we should uh, use uh, active uh, green transformation and low carbon economic development efforts uh, for further mitigation efforts. And second, we need to pay more attention to adaptation. Uh, we, it can be seen that uh, climate change is not is irreversible trend. The only thing that we can do uh, by mitigation is to is to contain the uh, adverse effects and prevent the worst from happening. In fact, in uh, the uh, Framework Convention in 1992, there, as, there was design for mitigation and uh, uh, adaptation. Given the uh, adverse effect is unfolding rapidly, we also need to speed up our uh, adaptation actions. I agree with uh, what uh, Mr. Shear said and COP28 should reach some kind of resolution regarding uh, adaptation. And thirdly, we need to um, assist the uh, developing countries, especially LDCs and uh, small island developing countries and African countries. Developed countries should uh, fulfill their commitment at the Copenhagen Agreement, uh, Copenhagen meeting, their commitment of 100 uh, billion US dollars every year. Uh, it is, uh, we are still short of that, uh, of that goal. Capable developing countries, including China, should also uh, should continue to uh, provide assistance to developing countries through the uh, South, South Cooperation Channel. And fourth, we need to uh, pay attention not only to uh, go intergovernmental cooperation, but also the important role of uh, markets. Uh, countries should uh, prevent, avoid taking uh, res actions such as uh, restrict uh, restrictions on uh, exports. Uh, so regarding the uh, history, uh, uh, if we uh, review the history of 31 years since the uh, signing of the convention, uh, framework of convention, there have been serious lessons. So to be frank, if we s had started technical cooperation and low carbon developing cooperation since the 1990s, then we would have seen better effects nowadays in our response to climate change. So we need to learn from these lessons and try to avoid disruptions of international cooperation in climate change because of a geopolitical um, differences. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the effect of our response to climate change bears on the future of humanity. China, uh, China, US, the EU, the three largest economies in the world, they, we have uh, different uh, conditions, we, have, we are in different uh, stages of development, and therefore we have uh, different historical responsibilities to climate change. But as the three largest economies with a total GDP of more than 60%, we should cooperate together to seek convergence, to continue to strengthen cooperation for more progress in international cooperation on response to climate change. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Ambassador Liu Chen Ming. We, uh, I agree with you that uh, uh, we should be confident and to take so concrete actions that, that uh, climate change is irreversible and that we should uh, push the co uh, COP28 to, to for more realistic and uh, pragmatic results. Now, as we are on uh, COP28, I'd like to give the floor to His Excellency Hussein bin Ibrahim Al Hamadi, Ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to China. In the minister position at his cabinet that, uh, for eight years as a Minister of Education. So we are very happy to have you as a discussion uh, to talk about uh, the, this theme because you're going to the country to host the COP28 uh, that very soon. So I'd like to hear from you. And uh, we, given the time, we will we, we all be more, uh, the, uh, you know, maybe three, five minutes. We'll, uh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, turn, please. I'll try to be very precise. Uh, I'd like to thank to all the speaker and all the attendants here today. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, it's, 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 it's truly an honor to be here uh, today in this ambassador round uh, table. Uh, representing the United Arab Emirates, uh, I would like to share with you uh, some uh, critical update uh, regarding the COP28, uh, which will soon be held uh, in Dubai, Expo City, and discuss the significant uh, role it's please uh, addressing the global climate uh, crisis. Uh, we are uh, in the August 2022. We were like 100 days away from uh, the COP28 countdown. And it's going to be the world's uh, largest annual uh, climate summit that will shape a global uh, climate action. Uh, COP28 uh, will be the UAE first ever global stock uh, taker, as was mentioned by the ambassador. Uh, a comprehensive uh, evaluation of the progress against the goal and the ambition set out in the Paris uh, Agreement at COP21. COP28 is set to welcome over 70,000 representatives, including world leaders, NGO, private sectors, representatives, indigenous people, and uh, young people. Uh, to guide uh, our effort, the COVID-28 uh, presidency has set out uh, four key pillars. Uh, first of all is the fast-tracking the energy transition. Uh, COVID-28 aims to facilitate an orderly, just, and educate energy transition that empower climate uh, positive development, uh, particularly uh, in the global south. The second is to Fixing uh, climate finance. Finance play a pivotal role in enabling effective climate action. Uh, the third pillar is focusing on people, life, and livelihood. COP28 is recognized the urgent need of investing in people and nature to address the impact of climate change and will focus on it, enhance adaptation, build resilience and support sustainable development, including addressing loss and damage. Last but not least is the underpinning everything with full inclusivity. Inclusivity is the core of COP28. We will collaborate with diverse groups, including youth, indigenous people, and local community, ensuring their contribution are integrated into all aspects of COP28 with a commitment to a safe and harassment-free environment for all delegates. COP28 is not just another conference. It is a crucial moment to unite, act, and deliver to shape our shared future. In 2023, the UAE has declared the year of sustainability, today for tomorrow. Showcasing UAE deep-rooted value of sustainability and emphasizing responsible consumption, conservation, and joint effort against climate change and other pressing issues 
related to sustainability. This nationwide initiative call for everyone action today, aiming for a greener tomorrow, and underscore the importance of collective action. In addition, efforts are being made to bridge the generational gap between youth and seniors, citizens, through a series of intergenerational dialogue during COP28 on key climate issues. The goal is to empower youth in the UAE and beyond by providing them a platform to voice their perspective on climate change and action. In this regard, the upcoming 18th edition of the Conference of Youth in November, ahead of the COP28, once again recognized the potential of youth to drive positive change in climate action. Moreover, we recognize China has played an indispensable role in building resilience in some of the world's most revised country. As a prominent logistic hub for China Build and Road Initiative, the UAE understands the importance of international development and infrastructure modernization in mitigating the effect of climate change. Lastly, I would like to highlight an initiative led by the Environmental Agency of Abu Dhabi, Ghars al-Imarat. The UAE is planning initiative will see 10 mangrove trees planted for each conference visitor of COP28. This initiative not only supports climate action, but also highlight the importance of preserving our natural ecosystem. In conclusion, COP28 UAE is a unique opportunity for the world to come together, unite, and act. We invite you all to join us in this historical endeavor. And together, we can share a greener, healthier, and more resilient world. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. So, so we hope that uh, COP28 will be a success uh, in UAE coming up. Uh, now, next, I'd like to invite uh, His Excellency Rafael Dicla, uh, the Ambassador uh, of Spain. I mean, he's, you know, we know that Spain is also the uh, rotating chair of European Council uh, for this half of year. So, uh, you have many knowledge and you have, you've been in China since 2018. And, uh, and of course, you have been also uh, ambassador to Germany and to Ethiopia and uh, had a lot of experience. So, Ambassador, uh, uh, declare your please. Thank you very much, uh, Henry, and thank you very much for the invitation. The fight against climate change is one of Spain's top priorities as President of the European Union Council. For us in Europe, uh, this is not only a necessity, the fight against climate change, but also a huge opportunity if we execute it well. The green transition will allow us to drastically reduce our dependency on energy and raw materials, lower our electricity bill, make our companies more competitive and create many million of jobs in this decade alone. The same, of course, applies to China, as it has already shown in the development of renewable energies and to many other countries. The Spanish presidency will promote a reform of the electricity market aimed at accelerating the deployment of renewable energies, the reduction of electricity prices and the improvement of the system's stability. We will also work to accelerate the legislative files related to Fit for 55, such as the gas and hydrogen package and the energy efficiency regulations. Furthermore, we will promote measures for the reduction of waste and microplastics, the design of sustainable products and the generation of green fuels. In 2022, 42% of the electricity consumed in Spain came from renewable sources. We expect to raise it over 50% in 2023 and reach 81% in 2030. Spain is the eighth country in the world in total renewable energy capacity, being among the first in solar, photovoltaic and wind energy. Our companies are developing solar and wind facilities all over the world, including offshore wind facilities. Here in China, the Spanish presidency will organize two events on environmental issues in close cooperation with the European Union delegation and the UN in Beijing. The first will be a seminar on COP28 on October 24th 
in order to examine the European and Chinese positions on the central issues that will be discussed at the conference and with, for, for which we have, of course, invited special envoy Xie. Another seminar will deal with the International Drought Resilience Alliance, IDRA. IDRA is an initiative which Global Scope promoted by Spain and Senegal within the United Nations to fight against drought in full alignment with the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. Drought is a problem that affects many of us, including China, which is herself a member, member of a group of friends together with the European Union, the US, and many other countries. The event will also try to find common grounds for cooperation uh, on this subject uh, on which the Chinese experience is very important. I would like to finish by saying that I totally subscribe Ambassador Toledo's remarks about the current positions in the fight against climate change and the need to cooperate with China and, of course, with the U.S. too. This is important not only for the three of us, but for the whole world, and especially, very especially for the developing countries. For the developing countries, some of which have their own survival at stake as a result of climate change, the reduction of emissions by the main emitters is an essential interest. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ambassador uh, Declare. You know, uh, also Spain is a very important country for also fighting climate change in the European Union. So, so we are also pleased to see Ambassador Floor uh, from Germany is here also. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, so now I would like to have uh, uh, another representative from EU, uh, Her Excellency Alanka uh, Shahadoling. Uh, we know that uh, there's a serious flood in Slovenia this, this recent summer. You know, we can see the climate change is happening everywhere. It's real. So we would like to hear your perspective, please. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And once again, uh, congratulations on 15 years of the amazing work of CCG. Uh, CCG. Um, excellencies, distinguished guests, I would like to start my intervention discussing the first question that was su suggested in the discussion paper for this round table. The question ha uh, is, looking back in history, what are fundamental power realities, patterns of interaction, and rules and institutions that can be used to harness collective resources for climate governance today? We actually do not have to look very, uh, very, uh, very far back in history to answer the question on harnessing collective resources for climate governance. The Kunming Montreal Global Diversity Framework, accepted last December, is an excellent example of connecting the implications of climate change uh, with the biodiversity system. As the chair of COP15, China put biodiversity on the agenda and ensured a successful and ambitious meeting together with the Canada as a host country. Kunming Montreal a Global Diversity Framework will protect at least 30% of the degraded terrestrial and water ecosystems through a clear timeline and measurable goals. It shows that nature is our best ally in fighting climate change. Major powers, major players were able to find an agreement which gives us an outstanding example for finding common grounds on the climate framework as well. The ties between the climate change and the biodiversity agenda should be strengthened as well with the goal to promote actions that provide core benefits for the two agendas. However, while the Kunming Montreal framework addressed 30% of degraded ecosystems, the urgency of the crisis instructs us to go further. Cities occupied just 3% of the Earth's land, hold 60 to 70% of global population, but account for 60 to 80% of energy consumption. Overall, 70% of all human-induced environment impact is produced in cities. Cities are responsible for addressing the impacts of climate change, uh, inequalities, health risks, demographic changes, for instance. And they actually engage in remarkably effective global networks, yet they remain 
largely sidelined in the formal mechanisms of global governance as emphasized in the UN high level uh, panel on effective multilateralism report. Cities are global hubs for, of innovation that can produce and need to produce also new solutions to address climate change. The question is how to include cities into the COP28 process. When it comes to uh, mitigation of climate change, we need all parties, in particular major economies, uh, where special responsibility obviously lies with uh, EU, US, and China, to present updated uh, and ambitious NDCs and long-term strategies. However, voluntary commitment will not suffice. We need to reach the agreement on emission phase-out. Scientists are concerned as the climate changes are happening according to their forecasted scenario, but the process is faster and more intensive than they predicted. The EU will continue to ask for the structured phasing out of fossil fuels as well as fossil fuel subsidies. We know it will be a challenge given the experience from the last COP. This topic should be addressed together and not to be distracted by a possible target for investment into renewables and energy sufficiency. Slovenia and EU is very supportive of these targets, but it is clear that this can only come hand in hand with the structured phasing out of fossil fuels. Globally, it is clear that the greenhouse emissions continue to rise. Investment in renewables is actually offsetting the new developments, but is not yet capping uh, uh, the rise in temperature. Only a phase out together with a major investment in renewables that is already happening could help the climate. Uh, an important emphasis, I think it's also that uh, the eyes of the world are on COP28, in particular the eyes of youth, which is getting, rightly so, impatient, anxious and frustrated, especially in the face of extreme weather events happening across the globe, the public perception of the COP process is to say the, la uh, the last wary. <laughs> Allow me also to introduce a bit uh, the Slovenia stance. Uh, climate security is one of the Slovenian priorities during our uh, UN Security Council mandate in 2024-2025. Uh, our position is that while it is important to respect different U UN bodies responsibilities and mandates. However, the question of climate is so important that can be or has to be put, on to, uh, put on to, uh, also onto the UN Security Council agenda. The climate crisis is a survival crisis and as such a major and global security question. Slovenia will pay special attention to water and water management questions in close partnership with all UN members and in particular with all the UN Security Council members. Slovenia will continue to advocate uh, uh, the right to clean, healthy and sustainable environment. We were one of the five core countries uh, um, that proposed and work on that new human rights for the last 10 years. And we are really pleased that the General, General Assembly uh, adopted uh, uh, the resolution last year. However, the resolution, as it goes always, needs the implementation. Slovenia is also um, a founding member of the Green Group addressing the climate crisis through the lenses of smaller states. Green Group was launched in 2009. In 2009, when the climate question 
uh, um, climate change was not so much at the front of the global agenda. And uh, uh, the green group that consists of uh, Cabo Verde, Costa Rica, Iceland, Singapore, uh, Slovenia, and United Arab Emirates uh, looks at the global problems, looks at the problems of climate change through the lenses of smaller states. Uh, my country is also part of the group of friends on climate security, developing uh, cooperative solutions on or the impact of climate change on security policy, policy. And allow me to conclude with the following. Since this year is the 10th anniversary of Belt and Road Initiative, and the EU Commission has announced the scaling up of the Global Gateway to narrow the investment gap worldwide. It is probably also the right time to start to think about nature as infrastructure and invest in it properly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, Your Excellency, I, I particularly like the idea that uh, you talk about this, uh, this is a 10th anniversary of uh, Belt and Road and we could really uh, promote uh, Belt and Road and in collaboration with B3W and of course EU Global Gateway that we focus more on the infrastructure, on the green infrastructure. So this is really excellent point. Uh, now uh, we're having, uh, we're running out of time, but, uh, we, but we still want to hear uh, Ambassador uh, Di Jahari Otomangon, Ambassador from Indonesia to China. and. Uh, we remember G20 was in Indonesia last year, and we had an excellent G20. So, uh, also climate is a big subject. Uh, Ambassador from Indonesia, please. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in these discussions or roundtable. Uh, thank you very much as well for Minister Chen Deming, Minister Xi Shenhua. Ambassador Nicholas, Ambassador Jorge, my dear friend, Ambassador Lucien Min as well for setting up the tone. I would be very brief. <clears throat> uh, three or four points. Number one, I love the words coming from Ambassador Nicholas and Jorge about the come and work together because this is the thing that we need to do urgently. And the second, word coming from, I think, uh, Minister C is the speed up the implementation of the commitments. Much has been said, much has been negotiated, a pile of documents has been produced for the last 20 years. So this is the time for the implementations. So let me start by saying that for Indonesia, Climate change does not only affect our ecosystem, but it also has the potential to become a threat to our economy. In many years, such as marine and coastal, water, agriculture, and health. For Indonesia, the climate change could cause economic losses as much as 1 to 3.45% of our national GDP by 2030, and 2030 only seven years from now, not that long. So in order to prevent this, Indonesia already set up the new nationally determined contribution, NDC we call it. We aim to reduce greenhouse gas emission by almost 32% with our own efforts and 44% with the international help by 2030, so seven years from now. So therefore, in order to sustain this energy transition plan during the presidency of G20 last year in Bali, uh, Indonesia announced the establishment of the energy transition mechanism, we call it ETM. This platform was supported by the Asian Development Bank to achieve the just and affordable energy transition. And this year, Indonesia assumed the chairmanship of ASEAN. We also underlined the important importance to implement the decision of the COP27. We urge the developed countries to fulfill their commitment for climate change, in particular the quote-unquote G3, G3, as already mentioned by uh, uh, one of the speakers here. 
and establish a new collective and quantified goal to, mobil to mobilize more climate finance for the needs of developing countries. So, as Indonesia is also of the view that having business ecosystem can support as well the transition to green energy is essential. I look some of the business people are participating at this forum as well. So, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, ambassador, in closing, from the pandemic of COVID-19 and the multidimensional crisis we are facing today, we learn an important lesson that to collaborate, to grow, and to prosper together is our only option. No country can be free from climate change problems if others are still struggling behind. To conclude, I will quote what my president said during the G20 last year. We have no other option. Collaboration is badly needed to save the world. We all have responsibility, not only for our people, but also for the people of the world. And being responsible here means creating win-win and not zero-sum situation. Terima kasih. Thank you, Xie Xie. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. As uh, Indonesia is the biggest, one of the biggest Global South countries, of course, you have represented a, a very strong initiative also that uh, Global South would like to work together on this climate change as well. So this is great that we all have to work together. And now, finally, last, not, last but not least, uh, we have the uh, uh, UN <laughs> coordinator in China, uh, His Excellency uh, Chatterjee. And uh, as UN is currently having this uh, meeting going on, so you have a few words at the end uh, to, to capture the, the what we've been discussing. So, Sid, please. Your Excellency Xie, Ambassador Burns, Ambassador Toledo, Ambassadors present, my colleagues from the UN family, ladies and gentlemen. To face the challenges of constructing a more sustainable 21st century, the urgent need for global dialogue on climate action between China, the United States, and countries of the European Union is abundantly clear. This roundtable initiated by the Center for China and Globalization at the 9th China and Globalization Forum is therefore most welcome. Climate change's repercussions are becoming increasingly obvious. In his recent address to the 78th session of the General Assembly, the United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, put it bluntly, and he said, and I quote, we have just survived the hottest days, the hottest months, the hottest summer on the books. Behind every broken record are broken economies, broken lives, and whole nations at breaking point. Every continent, every region, every country is feeling the heat. But I'm not sure all leaders are feeling that heat. Actions are falling abysmally short." End of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached tipping point. The US, the EU, China, and the world are experiencing the malevolent side of nature testing the very limits of human survival. From Hawaii to Greece to Xi'an, extreme weather has appended lives and livelihoods. One only needs to look at the inequity and loss caused by the recent unprecedented floods in Libya, where the skies unleashed 100 times of more the monthly rainfall in just 24 hours, resulting in the deaths of thousands of already vulnerable people. As the first movers assemble at today's Climate Ambition Summit in New York, we recognize that sustained cooperation on climate change between China, the US, and the EU is essential due to its size, economies, and significant contributions to global carbon emissions. By fostering continued communications, cooperation, and collaboration amongst them, we have the potential to make further headway in tackling climate change. However, this call for cooperation goes beyond sharing responsibilities. It is recognizing that each of these global powers possess unique expertise, resources, and technological breakthroughs. By maintaining conversations, 
we can share best practices, information, and innovations to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and net zero. I'd like to make the case that now, more than ever, we need to resurrect and revitalize the spirit of multilateralism with the United Nations at the central pillar. The UN has long served as a forum for such a conversation, global cooperation, and consensus building. In the midst of the climate crisis, it is vital to ensure that every nation has a voice and that is inclusive when decisions are made. Furthermore, facilitating dialogue on climate action may foster trust and collaboration amongst major powers who frequently find themselves at odds in rising geopolitical tensions to instead focus on the common and existentialist threat of climate change. We do see good news, however, and signs of progress from all three parties. In the United States, the landmark Inflation Reduction Act included US dollars 369 billions in climate provisions estimated to reduce its emissions by 40% on 2005 levels by 2030. The European Green Deal, agreed by EU member states, offers similar opportunities for innovation and reduction of its emissions by at least 55% on 1990 levels by 2030. Last year, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> China spent $546 billion on clean energy while manufacturing and deploying more renewables than any other part of the world. I recently visited the Kubuchi Desert and have seen firsthand how an entire desert ecosystem has been turned into a place rich with agriculture, livestock, and a people's lives and livelihoods completely transformed. Therefore, here in China, we as the United Nations family continue to encourage the scaling up of best practices, the acceleration of its transition to renewables and carbon neutrality, and its engagement in bilateral and multilateral channels to push forward the global agenda on climate actions. Ladies and gentlemen, but the whole will always be greater than the sum of its parts. That is why the time has come to accelerate and look at issues that can make us overcome the current challenges. If you recall, back during the height of the Cold War, countries, scientists collaborated to come up with a vaccine that ended smallpox throughout the world. It is such kind of collaboration that is even more necessary now, particularly between China, US, and the EU as we approach COP28 in the United Arab Emirates, which will provide us with an opportunity and the world to announce greater ambitions than they have previously planned, as well as larger commitments, increased joint investments in renewable energy, increased academic and scientific exchange, increased policy collaboration, increased work on agriculture and food system, and greater commitments to the global south. Ladies and gentlemen, we need a Paris moment in Dubai but we must go above and beyond. We must deliver solutions that will meet the ambition with real credibility and means of implementation. Thank you very much, Shesha. Thank, thank you, thank you, Seed, for, for your also excellent uh, uh, remarks, and uh, particularly from UN point of view, because we know that UN is, uh, is uh, also champion this uh, sustainable development, product, particularly the climate change. That we're having uh, UN COP28 coming up, and uh, so your remark has really add great value. Uh, okay, now it's uh, very special because um, the uh, ambassador's roundtable is very critical and very important, so we are kind of uh, behind the schedule. And I'd like to invite the um, keynote speakers to respond to some of the questions as well as um, the topics proposed by our ambassadors and um, Special Envoy Ambassador Xie. In terms of uh, environment protection and climate change, he is uh, the most influential figure. And uh, he is right now is the Special Envoy on Climate Issues of China and communicating a lot with uh, the uh, VIPs from EU and US. And uh, right now, we are showcasing more aggressive and uh, dynamic momentum from China. So at last, I'd like to invite Special Envoy Ambassador Xie to feedback or respond to some of these proposals and questions from the uh, previous presentation made by these ambassadors. Thank you. 
Yes, um, the presentations made by ambassadors enlightened me a lot, and uh, there are some questions raised by ambassadors. I'd like to make some uh, response to these questions. The first one is um, the uh, current status or the progress of uh, the climate congress, uh, the climate uh, governance on the uh, COP, and uh, yes. UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement, the principles, the structures of uh, the regulations, which are the framework under which we have to implement the missions of uh, Paris Agreement. So you can rest assured that China, EU, and the US, the leaders of uh, three sides, made promises to guarantee the success of this COP28. So with the um, ch uh, German diplomats and uh, Kerry, we all agree that on this uh, meeting we have to show the uh, maximized flexibility as well as uh, the maximized uh, progress. As for the challenges, we have to find out the way out and we have to find the bridge connecting each other. Different countries have different conditions, so the different countries would have a different requirements. So it is a hope that we can strike the balance among the different conditions and requirements of different countries and parties so that that would be the nature to reach the goals of multilateralism. And after the uh, global um, stock take, we can uh, take actions pragmatically. And in the process of taking actions, of course, we'll face a lot of challenges and uh, numerous problems that requires us even more uh, cooperate, even more closer with each other. Right now, we already uh, had proposed some uh, realms of cooperation. China, EU, for example, in nine fields would conduct a cooperation on which in terms of climate change, it involves um, energy transition, adaptation, maintain control management, and uh, large-scale uh, storage, and this is the U.S. and the carbon market, we are going to conduct collaboration with each other. And the China and U.S. also have agreed that in terms of the energy transition and uh, the low-carbon smart city development and a circular economy and amazing control and management, both sides would uh, set up a task force to conduct cooperation in these fields. And then we're going to guarantee that this COP28 will be a successful one. So after so many rounds of the consultation, and this is the common uh, agreement uh, reached upon by these uh, three parties. And a major purpose is uh, to push forward the global stock take. The purpose of this is uh, to clarify the uh, progresses and developments and the uh, difficulties of the different countries honoring their uh, uh, missions and uh, contributions. Only in clarifying these um, problems can we tackle the problems and uh, reach the goal. Yes, we know the goal of the Paris Agreement requires transformation and innovations. But in the process of innovation and transformation, China, EU, and uh, US, and many other countries, when I'm looking around at all of them, normally their primary plans are sharing a lot of commonalities, and they are doing the same thing in many areas, and their aims are very clear. Objectively speaking, they are competing with each other. Yes, we need this competition, but not for the sake of uh, decoupling or de-risking, but the competition in the virtuous environment. And uh, this is also the uh, consensus that we have reached. In this uh, area, we have to build up a um, virtuous competition environment. And we have identified the scope of uh, cooperation already. And uh, it is our hope that to cope with uh, the climate crisis and uh, taking actions to that end, China and US have to cooperate more closely with each other. And the second is about uh, the strength of cooperation or the strength of uh, global stock take. Finding out the gap, we have to intensify the efforts. The NDC of uh, different countries, especially the NDCs of uh, the respective uh, signature states, if all of them can be met, then the goals actually could met and by two degrees of uh, temperature control. But if not, it uh, would be between 2.5 to 3.7 degree. And yes, two 
is um, the uh, the primary goal uh, above us and trying to control 1.5 degrees Celsius by making more strenuous and aggressive efforts. And uh, different countries, based on their respective conditions, made their respective condi uh, efforts. As for China, we have clarified that before 2030, not on the year of 2030, but before 2030, carbon peaking will be reached. And before 2060, carbon neutral neutrality will be reached in China. So the uh, challenges are daunting to China, EU, from uh, carbon peaking to carbon neutrality requiring 65 years and the US 45 years. But for China, as a developing country, we are still in the developing stage. We have to tackle a lot of uh, development problems, but the goal for us is um, 30 years between 2030 and 2060, between the peaking and the neutrality. So transformation or the transition has uh, to be boiled down to uh, energy transition. So renewable energies would be in the per first place. And in China, historically, for the first time, the renewables installed capacity surpassed the coal. Renewables installed capacity has reached the installed capacity of uh, coal. And, but of course, in terms of the output of the power, we cannot uh, make them equivalent to that because we have to, the problem like the smart grid and uh, micro grid and, um, but in this regard, US and U Europe, they have a lot to offer exactly in this area where we uh, have a lot of gap and we can sit down and communicate with each other to intensify the efforts on cooperation in this regard on renewable energies. And also we are going to give hands to those developing countries if we can scale up the development of the uh, renewable energies, the net zero and carbon neutralization will be something that we can expect on time. And uh, facing out the coal, as you have alluded to, scientifically speaking, fossil fuels, it is impossible to phase them out once for all, immediately, like overnight. And you must be clear of that. Fossil fuels you actually um, RE is um, accounting for more chunk in terms of the installed capacity versus coal, but as for the security and the stability and, and the safety of uh, the grid, we have to tackle a lot of uh, technical problems, and then, only then, can we face out the coal. But we have to guarantee the stability of the grid. We still need the fossil fuel to fill in and to support. So what can we do about it? This US would come in. So. Uh, when the uh, carbon could be recycled and uh, realized, finally we can come to the end point of uh, neutrality or net zero. So facing out the coal immediately is uh, unrealistic and not scientific. So Glasgow Summit rewrote the uh, lines of uh, facing out all of uh, the coal facilities into facing out them step by step because um, that would be more reasonable and China's um, coal power percentage, previously 72% and now is 46%, and this uh, number is going to be decreased further, and that is uh, actually the um, basic operation that uh, we're doing. And we have to guarantee the overall stability of the energy. Right now, we are suffering the uh, Ukraine crisis, and uh, Europe, they uh, resume some of their coal facilities and tackle their security of the energy issues. And according to IEA, from 2021 to 2021, only EU and US realized uh, the reduction of carbon dioxide by 38%. To us, it's 0.2%. For the rest of the countries, are increasing. Why? Because RE played a lot of roles in here in Europe. So in terms of the um, strength of the efforts, yes, we have to strengthen our efforts, but still we have to respect our basic conditions. Innovations of the technology uh, is one issue, and another issue is um, the systematic or mechanism uh, innovations. Talking about the financing or climate financing, yes, I think money is the basis for the trust to build up between each other so as to um, honor our promises like the uh, 100 million US, USDs promise. 
and uh, the Secretary General of UN required to double that commitment and that yet to be realized. And now we have uh, the loss and the damage funding, but yet to be realized in concrete manner. So in this regard, we need all the countries to honor their promises. If you cannot honor your promise, how can you build up the trust with other countries? So the uh, promise has to be honored. And second, the, uh, the government has something to do, means that the government has to set up a doable long-term goal, and so the society, by looking at this goal, would have uh, the clear direction of the development of themselves in the future, under which, through the market driving forces, I believe that the guidance and the leverage and attraction to more private sectors, multilateral banks, and international financial institutions, and developed banks would follow the suits. Because the market is like huge, and with the numerous splendid uh, technologies, and the enterprises are very dynamic, as long as the goals are set forth by the government, which is very clear, I believe the funds will come and flow very naturally. So efforts shall be shared by all. And the last, today we've been talking about a lot of issues. And um, I will, of course, feedback these uh, issues and questions to the Friends of Paris Agreement next week, because the uh, former ministers and a former negotiator, as well as um, the executive uh, president of uh, the uh, COP, they are going to meet with me next week on this uh, summit, and I will feedback your um, ideas to them as well. I believe not only us, uh, the countries around the whole world has to make joint efforts all together to push for this um, progress. The efforts shared by all will realize the goal shared by all, the Paris Agreement, so we have to be confident. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Xi, for your excellent speech your summary and your conclusion. Yeah. We've heard um, a lot of uh, sparkling of ideas between China, EU, and the US to reach a lot of consensus. This is really good uh, climate for cooperation and a very positive direction of cooperation in the future. And uh, that would definitely tripartite cooperation. As you mentioned, our goal is to re reach carbon peak between 2030 and carbon neutrality before 2060, so we still have a lot of uh, um, job to do. This is an, a very good point that you've raised. <laughs> you are concluding remarks, and also I have uh, Ambassador Toledo to say a few words before I end this excellent panel discussion. Shu 社区并没有在达到2030年目标上做到成绩 美国会做到我们的承诺，拜登总统两天前在联合国演说的时候，把他说的非常的清楚。我们会把三千六百九十亿的美元会放在清净能源上面，会做到我们的碳减排的这个目标，在二零二三零年是达到目标。我们美国总
of course, the two presidents talked about the many issues where we disagree. And then they outlined five areas that we need, we should work together on narcotics, on food security, on agriculture, on global health, and on climate. And I think we've done the most together, I know we have, on climate. The relationship between our special envoy, John Kerry, and the Chinese special envoy with us today, uh, Minister Xia, has been a very productive one, and it's very respectful. We have our disagreements on methane and on coal, for instance. We've talked about them this morning. And we will push each other. But I do think that the United States and China can rise to the occasion here. We have to rise to the occasion here. And I want to thank Special Envoy Xia for his remarks. Thank you, Mr. President, for convening us and thank this audience this morning. Thank you, Ambassador Burns, uh, for your great uh, concluding <laughs> remark. Uh, absolutely, we need to all work together, uh, China, U.S., and EU, and, uh, and this is the biggest area that we can all have a common consensus uh, to how to work together. So we have the last uh, but not the least, uh, Ambassador Toledo from European Union. Thank you very much, Henry. Extremely interesting session, and congratulations to CCG for organizing it. Uh, very, very briefly, because we are behind schedule, I will make a point I made briefly in my uh, intervention. It's that here uh, we are, the three largest polluters in the world. Um, we have the special responsibility. So we, we don't want to govern uh, the fight against climate change together. We want to govern it with everybody. But we must give an example together. So let's do a G3 in exemplary conduct. And how can we do that? Apart from implementing our commitments, and I must say the European Union is implementing its commitments, increasing our commitments, and I must say the European Union, in spite of the energy crisis caused by the Russian aggression on Ukraine, has increased its commitments and is leading the world in commitments but also by increasing our ambitions, enlarging our ambitions to areas where we need, again, global action and where the three of us can make a difference. And I'm, I'm talking about, yes, phasing out coal production, at least not increasing coal capacity, we have done it in Europe, in fact, of very dire situation in the energy market. Curbing methane, together we can lead the world in curbing methane. Increasing climate finance, the three of us are the richest, or the, 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 yeah, the richest three blocks in the world. And we want to lead in the European Union as with the example of this establishing a carbon price. This has worked in the European Union. We want it to work everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ambassador Toledo, for your also very encouraging and very positive uh, uh, conclusion remarks. I, I think today we had a, probably one of the best uh, CCG Ambassador Roundtable. We, have, we are actually conduct this roundtable in the spirit of cooperation collaboration, and of course also we are facing the unprecedented challenge of climate change, which is very bad, very bad, very devastating. But we can turn the bad thing into a good thing, is that we can bring us together, to cooperate together. You know, this is really the, the, it, it, our existence is threatened. The human being has threatened, so we have to work together. So China, US, and EU being the three largest economy, I think the G3 should work with all the world countries to work together to fight the climate change. We can set examples, we can really do good things together. So really on behalf of uh, Center for China Globalization, I would really like to thank uh, Minister Xie Zhenghua and of course um, Ambassador Nick Burns, Ambassador Toledo, and all the ambassadors here present this morning and also our Honorary Chair, uh, Minister Cheng Deming, for giving this uh, old uh, opening and also this uh, accent uh, round table that they're going to set a new narrative, new direction, new corporate spirit, that are going to inject a very positive uh, you know, spirit into our uh, bilateral, trilateral, and multilateral relations also during this UN summit time. So once again, thank you all very much and appreciate. We hope to 
uh, continue. We will have a 10 minutes break and we'll come back. Thank you. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I will now proceed to the second ambassador's round table themed on China-Europe cooperation in uncertain times, risks and prospects. Mr. Wang Huiya, Harry Wang will be the chair of this round table. Cooperation in uncertain times, risks and prospects. Let's warmly welcome Dr. Wang Huiyao, President of Center for China and Globalization, to share uh, to chair this panel. Thank you. So we will continue the second round table. We just uh, conclude that the first one, the second one is no less uh, interesting. So please join us soon. I will be uh, a bit late, but uh, we'll still have time for lunch. Uh, no. So this, the th topic for this roundtable is uh, China-Europe cooperation in uh, uncertain times. Of, of Chinese government of European affairs. Uh, I know that uh, His Excellency Wu Hongbo has been shuttling between China and the EU. We also have uh, Spain, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ambassador de Calari. Declare uh, he's also the Spain is the rotating chair for the European Council. Of course, we have many other ambassadors uh, participating in the discussion. But let's first start with the three uh, said the same remark by uh, uh, three representatives. Uh, we we'll first we have uh, Ambassador Wu Hongbo, uh, and of course Ambassador Wu Hongbo has been appointed China's first special representative for the European affairs. Uh, since November 2019, and he's a senior diplomat with the European Affairs and serves as the Deputy Director of Western Europe Department of Foreign Ministry, and of course also Ambassador to the Philippines, and he was also the Assistant Foreign Minister in charge of European Affairs, and he also served, uh, he was Ambassador to Germany as well, and he served as a United Nations Undersecretary General for Economic and Social Affairs for five years, so very impressive. Perhaps we can start now with Ambassador Wu Hongbo said the same remark. Ambassador Wu, please. Thank you very much, President Wang. Since many of my European friends are sitting here, so I switch from Chinese to English. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership between China and the European Union. It is really a good time for us to sit down and review the past and the way forward. As we all understand that we have been troubled over the past three years by COVID-19. Our exchanges, visits, and business corporations has been virtually stopped or semi-stopped. Happily, we restarted our contacts. Since last year, the leaders from Germany, European Union, Spain, and France visited China. And the Chinese new Prime Minister, Mr. Li Qiang, after took his office, visited both Germany and the France. And many European countries' foreign ministers and deputy foreign ministers and delegations at different levels come to China. And number of visits are increasing 
daily. In the first seven months, the Chinese delegation at the deputy minister level visited European countries, reached over 200. My, myself had uh, visited Europe three times this year, attending two important international seminars. As far as the trade is concerned, last year the trade volume between China and the European Union reached 847.3 billion dollars US, hitting all-time high. This year we have been told in the first five months the bilateral trade between us increased by 3.6%. The world economic recovery and the green transition will give more opportunities and new momentums to the economic and trade cooperation and the relations between our two sides. On top of that, we see increased exchange of personnel. We have more visitors go to Europe with increased air services. These exchanges, including business operation, do increase the mutual understanding and further enhance our practical cooperation. Personally, I have a very positive and optimistic view of the future of relations between China and the European Union. When we talk about progress achievements, we should not forget the challenges. These are two sides of one coin. As far as the challenges we face in our bilateral relations, number one, I will single out the three positioning of EU-China policy. I shared with you my view last night. I will not repeat myself. I just want to make one point. China is the key partner for cooperation in areas of maintaining financial stability, dealing with energy crisis, control inflation, improve com competitiveness, and to realize EU's green and digital transition. China would play the role as a key partner for cooperation. But at the same time, such key partner is considered as systemic rival, is neither reasonable nor logical. Second point is de-risking. The word before that was decoupling. That was so unpopular. Even the country which invented this expression has decided to drop it to use de-risking. European friends have explained to us on many occasions the specific meaning of de-risking. Thank you very much for that. However, in the past few months, the reality is the European Union, in addition to reduce the reliance dependence on China in the areas of manufacture chain, production chain, and in the area of critical minerals, 
it has also produced a number of tools and regulations that restrict China's investment in Europe, even have restricted measures on European enterprises to invest in China. According to our information, last year, 2021, China's direct investment in European Union dropped by 20%, hitting all-time low. On the 13th of September, your president of European Commission announced the decision to launch anti-subsidy investigation into Chinese EVs. This has aroused a widespread concern of China and the international community. I understand it was also posed by people from automobile industry in European Union. Thirdly, is the political correctness. As we see it, the ideology and the values are prevailing over normal business operations. Sometimes the business operations are politicized or even weaponized. Some country, unfortunately, for the sake of being politically correct, bowed to the pressure of a superpower at the cost of the prosperity and the stability of Europe and the interests of its people. For instance, it should be a European country, a European company, to decide what to sell to China. It should not be a decision made by someone else across the Atlantic Ocean. The block confrontation with it, the Cold War mentality is hurting the relations between us. I feel very sorry for that. Now, the way forward. As I said, I am optimistic and positive about our relations. So I would like to share with you uh, some points that may improve our relations. Number one, increasing our mutual understanding. The world has more than 220 countries and regions. Each has a different language, culture, religion, and the way of life. If all the countries or regions are requested to have the same belief, the same religion, or the same social system, is neither realistic nor democratic. Three years of COVID-19 have blocked us from seeing each other and talking to each other. There, as a result, there are quite few misunderstandings or worries on both sides. So the very first point is that the two sides will sit down and have more exchange of views and see eye to eye to have sincere discussions in order to understand each other better. Second, to deepen our cooperation. 
And we see it, this important value of exchanges at the highest level. And we all understand there will be China-EU leaders meeting before the end of this year. In order to prepare this meeting, there would be high-level dialogues on strategic policies, uh, digit or trade and economic relations. So we do hope that these high-level dialogues would prepare the ground for the final high-level meeting which will lay down the areas and the policies for us to work together in the future. And second, we should tap the potentials for our cooperation. There are quite a few new areas as already identified by the both sides, like a green economy, green transition, digit, uh, in, uh, artificial intellectual, and advanced manufacturing industry. European Union has been strong supporter of open economy and the green development. So fair international competition should be the European green transitions catalyst should not be a reason to close its doors. On that note, I sincerely hope that European Union and their countries be masters of their own house. Decide what should be decided by European Union or European countries, not be decided across the vast ocean on the other side. Third, to safeguard peace. China and the European Union are strong supporters of multilateralism and we're firmly against unilateralism. We are also supporting the international system with the United Nations at its core. And in the past, we worked together in the constructive way in dealing with issues like nuclear, uh, nu uh, Iran nuclear issue and Korean Peninsula nuclear issue and the Middle East. We also coordinated and cooperated quite well on issues of climate change, public health, and the food. So on that note, I have no doubt that China and the European Union will continue our coordination and cooperation within the United Nations and G20 and other international organizations. We do hope together we are against the new Cold War and the bloc confrontation. And we do hope with our joint efforts and efforts of the rest of the world we could find political solution as early as possible to Ukraine crisis. Number four, to promote development. We have been discussing about the implementation of SDGs for many years. Just two days ago, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Gutierrez, warned international community that of the 17 sustainable development goals, 
and 169 specific targets, only, only 15 targets are on track. And many other targets are going in reverse. This is a very bad news, alarming news to all of us. Without development, there will be no lasting peace in the world. Therefore, both China and European Union should take the lead in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. And secondly, we may work together to, form, to formulate the rules and regulations in such areas as cross-border data flows, internet things, Internet of Things, 6G, artificial intelligence, and so on. As we both are not in favor of decoupling, the two sides should work together to avoid the scenario that the world we have two parallel silos. In each silo, people, countries produce roughly the same thing, with a different cost, different quality, and different price. Last but not least, we do hope that both China and the European Union could dovetail Belt and Road Initiative and Global Gateway. We have been urged, both the European Union and China, to help the developing countries, the poorest, the least developed countries in particular. By dovetailing the two initiatives, we will be in the better position to develop the ways and the means to help the developing countries and to narrow the gap between the global south and the global north. Last word, the trust is very important. As we see it, Many international commitments, high sounding words, are not met. This is very disappointing. As Secretary General of the United Nations said, that the distrust between global north and the global south is increasing. So with that, my last word is, let's work together to avoid misunderstandings, to build our mutual trust, work together for both the European Union, for China, for the rest of the world. Thank you. Th thank you, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Amb Ambassador. Uh, for your very impressive and very uh, uh, stimulating uh, speech, I think, opening remarks. I think this is really great that you mentioned uh, we have so many, uh, you know, challenges we have to face together, you know, challenges and the problem we need to solve, but you highlight several, you know, very forward-looking and also the way to how we can strengthen the bilateral relation between China and the EU, such as increased understanding, exchanges, deepening the cooperation, and, and also so many areas can collaborate, green economy, digital AI, internet, and of course, uh, even EU Global Gateway and the BRI, as, uh, as, as that Joseph Borrell, the EU uh, uh, Vice President, has actually mentioned that to Minister Wang Yim, that we could probably attach that. So a lot of areas, multilateralism, I think China, EU, ha, uh, really long civilizations and rich culture and we have so much in common to collaborate 
and that's why we would really go into please to again to, to invite uh, Ambassador His Excellency Toledo, Ambassador of EU delegation. I mean, we make him working hard. Today is his birthday. He's <laughs> doing a second uh, speech now, uh, opening remark, and we really hope that uh, we're not uh, we're making it too hard. You know, Ambassador Toledo, please. Thank you, Henry. You are making me work very hard. Yes, in my 59th birthday, but uh, I like my job. So, uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I can only start by saying that I I, I can only agree with uh, Ambassador Hu Mo uh, with his last words. Uh, let's work together. Let's have a dialogue. Let's engage, and that's what we're doing. In fact. Uh, I said it before, we, I've said it many times, and that's not the important thing. The important thing is that the European Council, in, his, uh, in, in uh, the last meeting in June, uh, confirmed, ratified, uh, that the European Union and China have a three-faceted relation. We are partners, we are competitors, and we are systemic rivals. This is not in, this does not intend to be a strategy. It is a description. Whether you like it or not, that's how we feel our relation with China is. And it is a description. It's not an aim. We would love to be partners in everything, but I, I, as, as you will hear from me very briefly, there are issues in which we disagree, there are issues in which we compete, and there are issues in which we disagree from a systemic point of view. That's why we call ourselves systemic rivals. But we are, there are issues, and we just spent the whole morning talking about them, uh, to, to, of, about one of the most important uh, fight against climate change, uh, and there we are strong and constructive partners. Um, in any case, and that, that's where I agree with uh, Ambassador Hu Mbo, dialogue to work together is the method to address all these issues, even where we have a systemic rivalry. Because our aim is to have a constructive and stable relation with China, which is the largest country in the world the largest market in the world. So we need to have a constructive and stable relation with China. And we want it to be based in the respect for international public law, sometimes called rules-based international order, balanced engagement, transparency, and reciprocity. So I already spoke, we, we spent the whole morning talking about our partnership in climate change. It is a partnership that extends to protection of biodiversity, uh, which extends to um, anti-pollution measures, but it want, we wanted to extend it to global health, uh, fight against pandemics, and many other global issues uh, where without a good cooperation and partnership with China, nothing useful can be done. We are also competitors, and, and, and uh, we, when we say com we, when we talk about competition, we, do, we don't mean the same as our good friends, the Americans. We, don't, we, we are allies of the Americans. We are, we, are, we are not necessarily aligned in everything, and in fact, the, the, um, the Americans call the relationship with China one of competition. We say competition is one of the three facets of our relation with China. And when we win competition, it's fair competition. We want it to be a level playing field competition, a fair competition. And when we, the, the main areas of this competition are, are of course, trade and investment. Uh, very recently, the European Union Chamber of Commerce uh, presented very recently, as recently as yesterday, I think, uh, the European Union Chamber of Commerce presented uh, its uh, new uh, survey on China, where it identified 
over a thousand market access barriers, up from the 967 they identified last year. So we, and the President of the European Commission said it when she came here in, in April, we want a level playing field. China's uh, trade surplus with the European Union last year was the highest in the history of mankind. So we know that China produces very good quality at very good prices, no doubt about that. But it doesn't make sense that there are one more over a thousand market access barriers which don't create a level playing field. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse. So that's why we are holding very soon, in a few days, a high-level dialogue on economy and trade, where we are going to, we need to address this. And we need progress, because I'm afraid we haven't made much progress in the last three or four years. We need progress in that. It doesn't make sense to have this kind of trade balance, which is not only caused by good quality and good prices, but by market access barriers. Um, we, in the European Union, Ambassador, uh, we, we have never talked about decoupling. We have not replaced decoupling by the risking. We invented the risking. In fact, it was adopted very recently by the US. We have always talked about the risking, but now it's official. The President von der Leyen coined the term in her speech before she came to, to China. And what do we mean? And we always meant that. We meant that there were two important events which made us decide that we need to de-risk. One was the pandemic. We learned that we were too dependent on essential items to fight the pandemic, not only from China, but from other parts of the world. So we need to do something about that in case a new pandemic happens. And unfortunately, because of the Russian aggression on Ukraine, we had an energy crisis because we learned that we were too dependent on Russia. So we need to learn those lessons, extract consequences. And the consequence that we extracted is that we need to the risk, not necessarily and only from China, from anywhere where we have an excessive dependency on critical products and materials. So it has never been about decoupling. It has been about reducing dependencies and vulnerabilities, including in our supply chains. The risking, I'm afraid, will only, it will never lead to decoupling. But the risking doesn't need now that the European Union talks about it. A measures like the very recent inclusion of two very critical materials that are produced in, in uh, their majority in China, uh, germanium and gallium, that has have been put in the uh, uh, Chinese export restriction list, is leading to the risking. But not because the European governments are doing anything. I'm talking to um, European big industries, they are all revising their supply chains to see where they have an excessive dependency from China because they, they were shocked by the inclusion of these two elements. So the risking is happening, not because we have coined it as the risking, but there is a real issue about the risking. Uh, by the way, we have no important or relevant restrictions in the European Union about investment in China or investment from China. There is a debate about the need for screening investment uh, or not, but we, we are not there yet. And uh, as it was mentioned by uh, Ambassador Hu Gombo, when we talk about the 
anti-subsidy investigation on EV cars, the only thing I can say is first, it has been announced, it has not yet started, it will be fact-based, it will be WTO compliant, we cannot presume what the result will be. And as the rule of law is one of the founding principles of the European Union, the courts will be there for anyone to appeal if and when there is a result, they, they, uh, uh, some companies or some, even some countries find is not fair. So going to uh, systemic rivalry, let me say two examples. We have a different conception and a diverging conception about human rights. We have a different narrative about human rights. We consider that human rights cannot be divided and priori priori or given priority one from the other. And this, and we think, that it is also because we are both signatories of the same international treaties. So we have the, the uh, human rights, all of them that are listed in the Human Rights Charter are universal and must be enforceable. So we have a difference. We have different system and this is a diverging difference. Um, and second one, the Russian aggression on Ukraine. We don't blame China for the Russian aggression on UK, but we think very strongly so that China as a permanent member of the UN Security Council has to call and to press Russia like we do, like we have condemned uh, the aggression and the annexation of somebody else's territory, which goes against the most basic tenets of uh, the UN Charter, so China, we believe, has to call on Russia to stop its war of aggression and immediately, completely and unconditionally withdraw its troops from Ukraine. This is a fact. We have a very good example of systemic rivalry. We are talking to our Chinese friends to make them understand that this for Europe, for the European Union, is existential. We cannot live with that. And this, I'm afraid, is tainting our relation with China. But anyway, in all three aspects, dialogue is the way forward. Only this week, and we are re-engaging and, and, and holding intensive dialogues with China. Only this week, Vice President of the Commission, Jurova, successfully held the high-level digital dialogue. Tomorrow, we will welcome uh, Executive Vice President Dombrovskis, the day after tomorrow, in fact. And, uh, no, tomorrow, Friday, I'm, I'm traveling to Shanghai to welcome him. And we will hold a high-level uh, dialogue, extremely important dialogue where we need progress with China. At the same time, we will welcome Commissioner Sinkovicius to hold a large number of dialogues like environment, water, sea, etc., with China. And we hope very soon in October, High Representative Vice President Borrell will visit China to hold a very important strategic dialogue with his friend and colleague, uh, Minister uh, uh, and Director Wang Yi, coinciding with another commissioner, Commissioner Simpson, to talk about energy with his Chinese colleague. We even expect some more visits before we expect to hold the EU summit, EU-China summit in Beijing before the end of the year, for the first time in person. This is, will, this is and will be good news. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Toledo, for your also very uh, uh, quite uh, uh, explaining, uh, very uh, uh, stimulating speech, actually. I found that you talk about also uh, uh, EU-China uh, is a very constructive and stable you know, uh, relation that we need to really strive for, and that is probably the, 
uh, you know, the fundamental, uh, uh, you know, stability that of the bilateral relations is so key for our prosperity and for our development. And of course, I think this is probably the biggest, uh, if we jeopardize the cooperation, jeopardize the uh, prosperity and development, that's probably the biggest risk uh, uh, that we have to face. So, so you, I agree, I am totally agree that the more dialogue, particularly the high level uh, exchanges, and we really expect a China-EU summit will be another fruitful one uh, that in person, as you mentioned, uh, since the pandemic. So really appreciate your, your uh, uh, intervention. Uh, now, I'm having another uh, set of scene remarks by uh, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Rafael uh, de Clare. Uh, he's the, of course, we know he's the ambassador of Spain, but we know Spain is the also rotating chair of European Council. So, we'd love to hear from you as well, Ambassador uh, uh, de Clare, please. Thank you very much <clears throat> again, uh, Henry. Um, the EU and China are the two major trading powers in the world. They represent two of the most important world civilizations. Their political and economic presence is significant in every corner of the world, including, of course, the global south. This is why their relations are very important. This is also why the coupling between Europe and China is not an option. In fact, we need to work together on many issues like the fight against climate change, of course, cyberspace, global health, the pursuit of the sustainable development goals, or the solution of crisis situations in different parts of the world, like Afghanistan or the Middle East. In all those issues, we must look for common ground and try to develop a positive agenda between the EU and China. If we make progress, the benefits will also be felt in many other countries. At the same time, if we really want to improve our relations, we must try to understand the reasons why those relations have deteriorated in the last few years. Only by identifying those problems can we build a more solid foundation for the future. I will mention four of them. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is a breach of fundamental principles of the UN Charter, such as sovereignty and territorial integrity, which are at the core of China's foreign policy. Some aspects of the Chinese position regarding the war in Ukraine have not helped China's image in Europe. Faced with this aggression, the European Union had to react. Remaining passive was not an option. It would have only invited new aggressions in the future. Even countries with a long history of neutrality, like Finland and, or Sweden, have felt threatened and decided to join NATO. That shows, by the way, that in the past, NATO had no expansion agenda. It never pushed Sweden or Finland to join it. It was the member countries themselves who decided to join it for their own reasons. NATO itself and the political and security relationship between Europe and the United States have been much strengthened by Russia's invasion. All these changes send a strong message about what is happening today in Europe. It is a message which, unfortunately, the Chinese media do not seem to have understood yet. But if China cares about its relations with Europe, which I believe she does, it is important that she tries to understand it properly. China is not just any country. It is a permanent member of the Security Council and has a special relationship with Russia. This proximity can now be used for a good purpose. It is vital to put an end to Russia's invasion as soon as possible, ending civilians' deaths and stopping a war which is threatening the security of us all, including China. China is in a privileged position to help achieve this goal. We expect that she will make its influence felt in order to advance towards peace. This could certainly affect our relations very positively. Even if we do not agree with all the 12 points put forward by China, we welcome the fact that China has presented them. It is important that point one refers to territorial integrity and that they also include a clear position against the use of nuclear weapons. It is also important that China sent a special envoy to talk to different parties and that it participated in the talks in Jeddah. As part of that effort, it would be equally important that she increases her contacts with Ukraine. That includes, of course, the Ukrainian embassy in Beijing, which needs to have proper access to the Chinese authorities. Another problematic issue 
in our relations is the Chinese desire to reform the international system to adapt it to Chinese values and Chinese interests, as shown in a document published last week by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. China's position on the war in Ukraine, or some of, of or issues concerning the South China Sea, may suggest some of the ideas that are behind this vision. Her position concerning human rights is also a key aspect of it. Human rights are important, and not only for Europe. They are important because they defend human dignity, the dignity of each one of us against possible abuses. The value of human rights cannot change depending on local conditions. They are universal, not only because the 1948 Declaration proclaims it, but because human dignity is an universal value. It is, of course, necessary to consider the socio-political and cultural realities of the different countries where human rights must be defended. However, those differences may not become a pretext not to defend them. Neither should they relativize their value nor render them void of meaning. That would mean render also human dignity void of meaning. Human rights are also indivisible. Social, economic, and cultural rights cannot prevail to the detriment of civil and political rights, nor the other way around. With her important advances in the eradication of poverty, China has an important experience to share in the defense of many of these uh, human rights. For all these reasons, human rights should be regarded as a normal element in our relations. We should be able to discuss them without letting them become an apparently unsurmountable obstacle, like it has been the case in uh, Xinjiang. It is positive that the EU and China have resumed their human rights dialogue. We must strive to give it a more useful and meaningful content. A third source of trouble in our relations is the chronic imbalance in our trade relations, as explained by Ambassador Toledo. In the case of Spain, we have an even balance of trade globally, but a very unbalanced trade with China. And we are not at all an isolated case. That means that the problem is not that our companies are not competitive. The problem is the existence of access barriers to our exports and our investments in China. We need to establish a level playing field in which our companies in China can operate in the same way as Chinese companies operate in Spain. In the last Boao Forum, the Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez asked for opening up the East so that the West doesn't have to close in on itself. If that does not happen, our trade relations will not be sustainable as they are today. As a big power, China should take responsibility for working to create global trade and investment relations which are beneficial for all parties involved. The 24 opinions published last August 13th by the State Council to optimize the business environment are very welcomed, but they have to be followed by concrete actions. Facts, and not only words, is what we need now. We must work to create a more balanced relations, balanced in terms of market access, balanced in terms of national treatment so that all companies work under a common set of rules, and balanced in terms of value chain distribution so that diversification allows us to reduce dependency on one single country. A stronger presence of Spanish and European companies in the Chinese market could also benefit China. They could be of great help in the growth of the service sector and the expansion of domestic con consumption. Both are important goals of the Chinese authorities who want to increase internal demand and deepen the internal market. A word about the risking. While the coupling between the EU and China is not an option, many voices in Europe have suggested that the risking may be necessary. This idea has been criticized in China. In fact, what does the risking mean? It means eliminating excessive dependency in supply chains of strategic goods. It means taking into consideration security concerns at the time of making decisions on trade and investment. All this is something which, in fact, China has been doing for decades. I find it difficult to understand why should we be criticized for doing the same thing that China has been doing for so long. Let me finally say that the full normalization of people-to-people -people contacts could help improve our relations significantly. Three years of COVID-19 restrictions have created 
a psychological distance between China and Europe, and not only with Europe, that need, did not exist before. We must strive to overcome that distance, such as Ambassador Buhongbo also proposed. We must resume the normal flow of businessmen, students, teachers, artists, academics, think tanks, journalists, and tourists. People-to-people -people contacts are essential to know each other better, to understand each other better, and therefore to work together better. This seminar, in fact, is a very good example of what should start existing in a much larger scale and with the presence of people coming from outside China. If we want to improve our relations, we must tackle these issues. They are not easy, but they are fundamental. Together with the development of a positive agenda on the issues in which we can cooperate with China, they may allow us to put our relations on a much sounder foundation. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Ambassador Raffro and uh, Declare. And uh, yeah, you have outlined also many uh, points, but uh, I, I totally agree with your last point that people-to-people uh, -people exchanges uh, are really important and uh, we need to strengthen that. And also we need to strengthen the cooperation on the, on the trade and economics. And also I, I, I think that uh, China's uh, uh, position on the, on, the, on the Ukraine has been quite uh, strong, actually, you know, uh, MFA has mentioned many times, you know, China really respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity, and, and also President Xi, even during his meeting with uh, uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, mentioned that uh, we don't, you know, want to see the nuclear war happen uh, in this war. So, so there's a, there's a lot of things that China has been doing. We have also a special envoy, Ambassador Li Hui, been traveling around. So, of course, we can collaborate with the EU uh, on this issue as well. Uh, now, I'd like to. Uh, uh, Starting the discussing uh, 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 panel that we are having, uh, we have uh, uh, quite a few ambassadors from EU with us today. And uh, uh, since we have a bit uh, tight schedule, so I, I would hope that we will have a three to uh, five minutes uh, uh, com comments and, and discussion. But first, I'd like to invite uh, Her Excellency Dr. Patricia <laughs> Flo, I mean, ambassador from Germany. I know. You've been here for quite some time. I remember you attended our, your first uh, ambassador roundtable was at a CCG event uh, last year at uh, CFIS uh, Expo. So, uh, but I know you've been very, uh, you have been uh, ambassador to, uh, to uh, uh, Japan and of course you have uh, uh, also served in the multilateral system. So have a lot of experience. We'd like to hear from ambassador, uh, Dr. Floor, please. Uh, thank you, Henry, and um, first of all, let me congratulate um, uh, CCG for 15 years um, of activities, and it's um, a pleasure to be here again um, this year together with you. Um, I would like to share a few core messages which um, might also help to illustrate um, to what was said by the EU ambassador and the Spanish ambassador, because of course um, Germany could subscribe to all of their uh, points um, as, as they were presented to you. So I'll give you a few core messages um, uh, which illustrate how Germany deals with this situation. First, we don't live in the same world um, uh, which we knew in 10 or 20 years ago. And so geopolitical shifts and a changing world force actually all countries to adjust our policies. And while the EU and Germany and China enjoyed um, a very fruitful and mutually beneficial cooperation in the past based on very stable relations, the question that we have to answer today is how we can preserve that strong foundation while acknowledging and managing our differences. My second um, point is that um, in uncertain times, it is natural for any country and for every government to identify and manage the risks which exist to our national security, including our economic security. In the German case, this is why the government adopted the first ever China strategy, which aims at um, presenting the means and the instruments by which the federal government can actually work with China while not endangering our way of life, our sovereignty and prosperity, 
our security and partnerships with others. And let me emphasize here that we do all of this together with our European partners for the sake of Germany and Europe and not because any third party from wherever across a big ocean uh, actually uh, asks us to. So, as the Chancellor Olaf Scholz um, has um, emphasized many times, the basic rationale of our China strategy is certainly not decoupling, which is neither desirable nor realistic, because our economies are strongly intertwined and business interests um, uh, continue, of course, um, to also ask for economic cooperation. But what we, what we do need to do is address the lessons learned, and here uh, I quote, it's the interruption of supply chains, is the closing down of uh, travel by the, the um, pandemic restrictions, uh, and it is the lessons learned from the energy crisis which followed upon Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. So uh, it is inevitable that this will need to be factored in into our policies. And that means we need to reduce critical dependencies globally, but including with um, uh, China. And this is also why you see that there's a joint approach of Germany, the European Union and others to strengthen our resilience to not put all our eggs in one basket, but to make sure that we can um, survive you know, any future crisis when it comes. And I would agree with um, my friend Raphael that um, I can watch and observe here in China that China is doing the same. Localization, dual circulation, uh, of course having the objective of um, technological self-reliance, all very understandable and following the same logic that we have for our own policies. So the question that follows and, um, is how do we create the space and maintain the space for cooperation? Because, and this is my uh, third um, uh, key message, global challenges need global solutions through cooperation by all and among those all obviously the big blocks, the big major powers. And so here I do see a lot of opportunity, SDGs as mentioned by um, Ambassador Wu Hongbo, climate was discussed this morning, environment, food security, energy security, peace and stability. And on all of these topics, China is for Germany an indispensable partner. And it also has a special responsibility as a member, a permanent member of the UN um, Security Council, but also, of course, as um, uh, the biggest CO2 emitter at this point in time. And so, while we need strong dialogue, for instance, on human rights, on issues where we disagree, where we have different um, uh, you know, views, uh, we also need uh, to manage um, these areas well. And let me uh, talk here about one very sensitive area, which is peace and stability. Uh, it is very sensitive and essential for any you know, country. And therefore, we uh, actually would um, look for working with China on peace and stability in the sense of disarmament talks, in the sense of looking for risk reduction mechanisms which work both between China and Europe but also between China and the US. Also, um, we would support engagement in order to avoid any unintended escalation and we would certainly also want to engage deeper in a discussion about um, the law of the seas and what it means in different regions of the world uh, in regard, with regard to unresolved conflicts there. On Ukraine, let me echo what was said. So we welcome Chinese engagement for peace. But as the Chancellor just said in the at the United Nations in New York, uh, for Germany, and I'm sure for all of us in Europe, we cannot accept a fake peace. We need a just and sustainable peace in Ukraine, and that means restoring sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine in its internationally recognized borders, which 
China actually also guaranteed in the 1994 Budapest um, Memorandum. Now going from a difficult sphere to um, climate, um, Germany and China have already agreed. So we have already actually gone to action from talking. So at our intergovernmental consultations um, in summer, the German Chancellor and Prime Minister Li Qiang agreed on a climate and transformation uh, dialogue um, in order to come to concrete cooperation on the ground, on hydrogen, on you know, uh, renewable energy, and on many other um, issues. My final point is, um, it's not only countries that need to adjust, but it's also the global framework. It needs to be adjusted to this changing world, and I would agree again with um, Ambassador Wu Hongbo, under the umbrella of the United Nations and the system uh, which falls under that. So we would look towards um, discussing with China, working with China on, for instance, um, um, common rules, multilateral efforts to develop high and binding standards for responsible use of emerging and disruptive technologies, well, including AI or other areas in this respect. We would look for discussion with you on digitalization and data transfers. How do we create data security while ensuring data transfer? And we would also look forward to work with you in the area of health, for instance, on a pandemic treaty, which hopefully would empower all of us, all countries around the world, to do better together with the World Health Organization in fending off um, the next um, pandemic. And I would absolutely agree that we need more contact, more engagement, also between the people, so civil society engagement across borders is equally important as well as, and I'm not going into uh, deep depth into this, is a level playing field and free and fair trade in a globally free and fair um, economy. Thank you very much. And let me say in closing, open transparent dialogue, fair competition cooperation is key to master the geopolitical, economic, and climate risks of our times. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Floor, and uh, for your, uh, you know, also comments and, and uh, talks. And uh, so the, I, I get the word peace and the stability is very important, and we need to maintain that. Uh, so thank you for your speech. And now I'd like to have uh, a Ambassador from uh, Estonia, His Excellency Hannes uh, Hansel. You know, he's also uh, been in China for, for quite some time, and. Uh, very active, and also I know that you have studied in Chengdu, uh, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago as a student, the first time come to China. So, Ambassador Hansen, please. Um, thank you uh, very much for this opportunity. Uh, before I uh, go to the content of my, my uh, thoughts, uh, let me really express my sincerest and great appreciation to the CCG uh, team for bringing this uh, event uh, together. Uh, Henry and Mabel and the team, I hope we continue this good uh, cooperation and it's been always been a pleasure to attend uh, other events organized uh, by your think tank. Um, the title of the session is um, China-EU Cooper Cooperation in Uncertain Times. Uh, before coming here, I was trying to figure out for myself what that term, uncertain times, mean. So, let me define it for myself and hopefully for you. Uh, for me, it is uh, dangerous unpredictability in uh, international relations, which also, of course, have an effect on EU-China uh, relations. Um, from my country's point of view, and I believe many of my European colleagues and other uh, people attending here concur, the biggest risk and unpredictability affecting global peace and stability, and this also, as I said already, affects EU-China relationship, is a Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. Uh, this illegal and unprovoked aggression will continue to cause great international turbulence 
severely and very, very negatively affecting development prospects uh, in a wider world, not only in our region, uh, especially in more vulnerable uh, countries, including, of course, global south. Um, it affects adversely energy prices, food security, nuclear security, environmental uh, cooperation that was focused on uh, this morning, technology transfer, trade and investment climate. The only area that is not suffering in current uh, war uh, infested environment is of course defense spending as we all feel insecure and have to invest more. Uh, I question the, this is a question for everyone, everyone is this uh, right path to follow uh, internationally. But um, therefore, our EU Russian illegal land grab simply cannot be allowed to succeed. Also, China, luckily, and I'm very pleased, does not recognize these imperially inspired uh, actions. International order, respect for UN Charter, must be respected by all, especially by P5 nations and nuclear nations. If we do allow, however, Russia to succeed, as unfortunately we have allowed a number of times in the past, uh, it will open a global Pandora's box. Other states could be encouraged to settle uh, historic grievances, disagreements also by the use of uh, force. Uh, as a personal example, uh, I come from a very small island uh, in the Baltic Sea. Um, within the last five or six hundred years, this island, which is now of course Estonia, has been ruled by Germans, Danes, Swedes, Russians, not only not uh, by my good neighbor on the right, uh, Finns. Uh, just imagine if they all started laying claim again on the territory. What would happen? I think I challenge all of you to think about the places where they come from, who have these territories, these countries, these cities, these towns, these islands, these deserts been, have been ruled by. If we open it, where, do, where is the end? We will all live in a permanent state of war on the planet. That's why it's essentially, existentially important for the whole world. Also for China, also for Europe, for any country in the world. So, I think it is not an option, it is our duty to assist Ukraine in this uh, war effort, in the effort to li liberate the sovereign country that was internationally recognized and support this country, Ukraine, with every possible way. We're very in united in Europe by, uh, by doing this. By helping Ukraine, we fight against uncertainty, we fight against unpredictability. Some people also uh, in this country uh, challenge this and I say, uh, our neighbor's house is on fire. What is a decent thing to do in a village? You have buckets, you have water, you have fire engines. You go and help and we continue to do so. Uh, as many of you know, the EU has suffered greatly as a result of this war. Energy ties, a dependency had to be severed very quickly. Business relation, re relationships that were established for a long time and were really mutually beneficial had to be cut. People to people relations uh, have been all but cut. We regret this, but this is a right thing to do. There are regrettably a number of uh, countries in the world which continue to increase the trade with the aggressor thereby, of course, uh, financing the war effort. Um, I do hope that this thorn in the side of the EU-China relations can be removed. Um, we can then, when we now talk about the prospects, focus on more on a positive uh, agenda that is mutually beneficial relationship, cooperation in trade, in environment, development, development <coughs> issues uh, globally. 
So this is my uh, input for today. I thank you very much for uh, listening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Hansen, yes, uh, for your remarks. Uh, since we are quite a bit behind schedule, I, I uh, you know, appreciate that we maybe we'll do a three-minute intervention uh, uh, for our, uh, our remaining participant. Uh, so next, I'd like to have the His Excellency Ambassador uh, from Iceland, uh, Thero uh, Ibsen, to give your re remarks, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Wang. Thank you very much, Henry and, uh, and CCG for, for hosting and organizing this important event. Uh, and uh, I'm a partly, particularly as, as the only non-EU European country in the panel, I'm in particularly appreciative that you have the title China-Europe uh, relations. Uh, and I thank you very much for that. Uh, at the beginning, I want to, to stress that, that Iceland, has, Iceland and China have very good uh, bilateral relations, and they have had that for a very long time. And, uh, and as we were speaking about climate change, uh, climate action, and renewable energy earlier this morning, I would like to, to note in that context the unique and the successful cooperation of Iceland and China in bringing the use of geothermal energy to China. This has taken 40 years. Uh, of cooperation has been very successful. Today, uh, an Icelandic entity in cooperation with a Chinese entity uh, has developed and built the largest uh, geothermal district heating service in the world in China, servicing 70 cities and counties. Now, why is this important? That's because uh, 40 to 50 percent of carbon uh, emissions come from house heating and house cooling. This, was, uh, uh, this, this cooperation is now being extended to uh, cooling activities. Uh, we've also been training uh, Chinese experts uh, in using geothermal energy, and, and they are now the backbone of the geothermal industry in China. And now we are bringing in the new technology of CCUS uh, on an industrial basis and working with the Chinese industries. Uh, I was very pleased to see how much China appreciated this, this cooperation last weekend at the 2023 Geothermal, World Geothermal Congress that was held here in, in Beijing. Now, considering that we have been having this very good cooperation, we of course want to continue good cooperation with China into the future. And we, we welcome the very positive outrage of China and Europe it helps uh, rebuilding connections and, and the dialogue. And uh, Iceland is, of course, of the general view, along with my European colleagues, that we do indeed want to cooperate with China within the existing international legal and institutional framework. But as always, when it comes to, to, to uh, 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 good cooperation and good relationships, we also have to address uh, what are the difficult issues. We can not only talk about what is good, we also have to address what's difficult and how we can resolve these issues and move forward. And I'd like to, to, to raise two important issues uh, that are related to issues also related by, uh, raised by my colleagues from the European Union. And evidently the first issue is the Russian aggressive war in Ukraine. Uh, as my colleagues have said, uh, this is, of course, uh, an uh, uh, existential threat to all of us in Europe and has a major impact on the global economy. And Russia has to be stopped. And China, as a P5 country, has the responsibility to uphold the UN Charter and condemn Russia for the war of aggression and deny it of any assistance. There is no notion in international law of legitimate security interest that can justify military intervention in another country. Now China shares with Europe and shares with us the commitment to uh, unconditional respect of sovereignty and territorial integrity of independent states as a fundamental rule of, of international law. 
And I would like to mention in this respect that last spring in March, Iceland hosted uh, all the leaders of the European Council and 44 leaders of 44 countries of Europe agreed there to establish a register of damage caused by the Russian Federation's aggression as a first step towards an international compensation mechanism. Moving to the other concern uh, or issue that we need to address uh, is our trade relations. Now, they have been somewhat paradoxical over the past few years. Iceland is fortunate to have a bilateral free trade agreement with China that we are celebrating the 10 years of the signature this year. And that has been a very good, good relationship that has developed from that, that, that free trade agreement and to the mutual benefit of both. Over the past uh, two to three years, in 21, 22, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, during the COVID time, we had a record years in terms of exports to, to China and in terms of trade uh, value between the two countries. And it looks like that we're going to go in the same direction in the, this year, 2023. We've also have very benefited very much from, from tourists from China that, can, that, that flocked to Iceland before COVID. And uh, the, the numbers are up to the same level now uh, uh, after uh, Chinese tourists started to leave the country in the beginning of the year. But at the same time, uh, our companies, and probably this applies to all European countries, if not all international companies uh, dealing with the Chinese economy, during the past two, two to three years, we have never experienced as many complexities and difficulties and losses in our trade with China. And this is something that, that uh, we hope that China will address and move on to resolve. Because companies, they rely on predictable rules and there's nothing that business dislikes more than uncertainty. It is important that China continues to ensure stable and predictable market conditions. Fully respect WTO rules, ensure transparent and predictable regulatory framework, and simplify customs registrations and procedures. Ambassador, the time is uh, pressed. With this, I will conclude my intervention. Thank you very much, everyone. Good, thank you. Yeah, we're really uh, pressed by time, so thank you, Ambassador Ibsen. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, His Excellency uh, Ambassador Darrow Mihilin, Ambassador from uh, Croatia, which is a very beautiful country. <laughs> I've just been recently been there. So, uh, Ambassador, uh, please. Thank you, Henry. I have to start by congratulating you, Mabel, and the whole team at CCG on this wonderful anniversary and yet another very interesting forum that just started. I think it will be even more interesting in the afternoon when you touch the real thing, and that's the money. Uh, I'm truly happy to observe yesterday and today, compared to the last forum and echoing what I said last year, that all of my colleagues present here and I are no longer ambassadors to Chaoyang. Uh, and that the dynamics of delegations that we mentioned is increasing daily. Uh, we still to have to recover a lot of lost ground in past years. But this is, it is precisely through more communication in person, more listening to each other, really hearing each other's sensitivities, that we gain better understanding and find space for cooperation, so necessary in today's turbulent world. And in that way, the only way, uh, we can rebuild mutual trust, as Ambassador Wu Hongbo mentioned in his remarks. Our world has changed dramatically indeed. And in these new circumstances, there is no alternative but to increase international cooperation based in the established tenets of the rules-based international order, buttressed by the global institutions centered in the United Nations system and the corpus of international law. 
Unjustified Russian aggression against Ukraine reminds us of the importance of preserving this order and demands a responsible response from everyone in the international community, particularly from the permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations, calling for the respect of sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine and bringing about a just and sustainable peace with all the atrocities condemned and perpetrators brought to justice. Might cannot be allowed to be a right, and obsolete concepts of sphere of influence should be banished to history. True, and sadly so, as Sid reminded and counted that yesterday, this is not the only conflict in the world today. There are many hotspots around the world we should focus all together on more, with existential consequences for affected regions. But no other conflict brings more rampant challenges to the international community than this horrendous act by Russia. For Croatia as an EU member state, enhanced cooperation between the European Union and China on global issues, such as global peace and security, climate change and environment, development assistance and energy issues are of the utmost importance, as this is the younger high segment week dedicated to the sustainable development goals this year, EU-China cooperation on their implementation should be stressed in particular. We are all aware that the world today is facing a polycrisis mode. Very serious crisis in food, energy, finance, climate, environmental pollution, biodiversity. And such a combination of global crisis has not happened in a long time. Global consensus is growing that green and digital transition emerges as the only solution for sustainable development. EU, as a champion in these fields, is fostering strong cooperation with China, demonstrated by high-level dialogues taking place this month, working on the deliverables in the run-up to a summit later this year. China and EU bear heavy global responsibility here as two strong pillars of our increasingly multipolar world. The development of renewables, investments in energy efficiency and introduction of circular economy along with the measures to abate the greenhouse gas emissions still have to be, will have to be implemented anytime soon if we are to prevent the continued harmful effects of global warming witnessed this summer all around the world. Digital and green are twin transitions. The higher level of digitalization with the introduction of new technological solutions such as the one offered by the artificial intelligence also helps reducing greenhouse gas emissions and negative impact on environment. It is crucial that we conduct digital transition in a way that protects universally established values and norms. In that sense, human rights, rule of law and democracy must be held also in the digital sphere. Cybersecurity is another, not less, important feature. The Russian aggression against Ukraine has confirmed that green and digital transition is even more important to increase our overall resilience, valuable lesson not only for Europe. By further accelerating development of renewables and increasing green investments, diversifying energy sources, putting more emphasis on energy savings and green transition, we believe we can turn the current situation into a new chance for our economies. Nevertheless, this change has to be given in a fair environment with level playing field or a sort of economic business reciprocity. Exploitation of freedoms in other markets while fencing off your own is not a path to win-win outcomes. Win-win cannot be allowed to become a double win for some. Not surprisingly, security features this day as a prominent factor in various economic calculi. There is not a state in the world, China and EU member states included, that is not trying to minimize risks and identify threats to its population and development. The risking is basically universal, however you call it or not. Uh, and let me close by a great example of China and EU cooperation. Last year, we marked the 30th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relations between Croatia and China. Our relations are truly friendly and solid. 
And that anniversary was marked with the opening of the famous Pedersen's Bridge, connecting two parts of Croatia, connecting two parts of the European Union in that matter. And this bridge was built by a renowned Chinese company, China Road and Bridge Corporation. And here, I would really like to, let's say, categorize this project where it truly and correctly belongs, not to some other categories that is sometimes mentioned. This is a unique example of China, EU member state, European Union cooperation, as this project was fully financed by the European Union and the member state, Croatia, and executed by a Chinese company. Croatia is open to business with China. We have just decided to award another contract to a Chinese company. But what I would really like to see, a level playing field in China, that Croatian companies can have such stories of success here. And this is something what we should all work on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Ambassador uh, Mihelin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was quite impressed by the example you said about uh, this bridge, actually. Uh, China has uh, built uh, in in uh, Croatia. That is, uh, I heard a lot in the Dublin uh, uh, the form. Actually, they mentioned about this bridge building, and uh, we hope that uh, more bridge building will between China and the EU and European countries. Uh, now, uh, we hope that really we're going to have a tight schedule. We, we're going to really, uh, you know, maybe three minutes of each, and uh, let's say uh, invite uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Nalina uh, Mikola, uh, the Finnish ambassador uh, to China. As a matter of fact, we just had a formal uh, Finnish Prime Minister uh, Aho visiting our office last Friday. So we, you know, he said you just got back. So we'd like to hear from you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, I salute uh, CCG of organizing this event and also of the previous events during COVID pandemic when actually you were the ones giving us great opportunity for exchange of views. So thanks for that. And as I'm a Finn, I try to be very short and I put my wristwatch here uh, to obey the time limits. And many things have been said by our European colleagues, so I do not want to repeat them. But just to say that the, all these important topics have been tackled here, when it, what we need to do together, climate change, biodiversity, new, te new technology issues, um, tra open trade, open economy. And I would then also want to emphasize what uh, Ambassador Wu Hongbu said about uh, peace and security, multilateralism. I couldn't agree more with him. And I think the EU is very eager to work together uh, with China on issues of global security, peace and security. Uh, and we appreciated your comments very much. Also, I want to add, and this is the last topic, and nobody will be surprised what it is, uh, that I have appreciated very much uh, the many occasions I have had in discussing the war in Ukraine with our Chinese hosts. We also appreciate very much the important fact that China is taking part in the wider international discussions on Ukraine, like in Jeddah. But the truth remains that after more than a year and a half, we use a very different vocabulary and we talk about very different things when discussing Ukraine, which means that we see the situation differently. We define Russia's actions in Ukraine as, as war. For us, it's hard to see how else to describe it, with all the human suffering, lost lives, lost infrastructure, uh, occupation, annexation, and the fact that there is a clear military aggressor in all this. China still prefers to call it crisis. There are also deep differences when it comes to the root cause of the war. China's recently published proposal on the reform and development of global governance, there is an important chapter also on Ukraine. Many things we agree. However, we beg to differ when it comes to some of the conclusions, perhaps in particular, the root cause of the crisis lies in the problem of security governance in Europe. So this was the quote of, of this uh, newly a published proposal. For us Europeans, as we have often explained here, the aggression by Russia broke the existing structures and existing trust. And my case, Finland, is a case and point in this. So for us, the reason for this aggression is more uh, Russia's ambition to shrink, if not to deny, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. 
In China, we all often hear the talk about the irresponsibility of adding fuel to fire that my Estonian friend also mentioned. This is also added in the new proposal on the global governance reform and development. Uh, but for us in Europe, this formulation and vocabulary is kind of hard to accept, while we know that what you mean by not adding fuel to fire would in effect deny Ukraine the aid and support that they need to defend themselves. My president yesterday in the UN speech, he underlined that bringing the war to a just end is essential for Ukraine, but might also lower, help to lower tensions on a wider scale. This would benefit the whole world, but to succeed in this, the end must be just. So we Europeans and, and our good friends here, we see the root causes, the form and the reality of this issue slash crisis slash conflict slash war and the, probably also the concept of self-defense differently from you here in China. Yet we sincerely want to engage with China on, on, on Ukraine. I've heard many times here that war, you Europeans are so emotional when it comes to Ukraine. Well, war is something to be emotional about. But at the same time, I think we are very clear-eyed on what's going on. For us, it is existential, as many colleagues here have mentioned. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, also, Mikhola, uh, for your comments. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Thomas uh, Muller, uh, the Danish Ambassador to China, to make a few remarks also. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And, and thank you so much to uh, CCG for convening us here today. It's, uh, it's really uh, useful. Uh, the problem, of course, of being so uh, at the end of the speaker's list is that uh, I, uh, Mr. Regan and Mr. Zun, are the only ones who are behind between you and the buffet. So I will try to be uh, speed up. Um, um, China and the European Union uh, are among uh, the world's great powers, and uh, that goes for in terms of economy, in terms of politics, and, and this, of course, this comes with uh, great responsibility. And, and right now we are facing uh, many global challenges, biodiversity, water resources, global health, uh, poverty, pollution, and environment on land and in the oceans, waste, recycling, I could go on. Uh, international cooperation on these issues are absolutely necessary. Climate change, of course, is uh, at the very top uh, of the agenda, and it should be um, all over the world, including in China and in Europe. Uh, the extreme weather situation, conditions of, the, of, of this year uh, is a troubling reminder uh, to all of us that climate change is real and requires action uh, right now, not tomorrow, but today. There's so much more China and Europe can and need to do together on, on climate. But we also need to work uh, in the same direction uh, when it comes to our economic and trade relations. Our economies, business, supply chains are closely interlinked. And we benefit greatly from this, but being so heavily interlinked will also give rise to some frictions. Denmark is a small, open economy. Uh, we are a large uh, proponent of free trade and globalization. It has brought wealth to Denmark, to the EU, to China. But the world of today is entering into what we might call globalization 2.0, an updated kind of globalization that hopefully uh, will uh, contain fewer flaws. The term economic security is gaining ground uh, across the globe these days. Uh, resilience or de-risking could be other words labeled on this situation. In China, it has been, as pointed out by my Spanish <coughs> colleague, it has been sort of manifesting itself uh, on the headlines like China 2025 
self-sufficiency and dual uh, circulation. In Europe now, there is also a growing understanding that societies should try to safeguard themselves against a certain kind of uh, market failures. And to me, there are two world events um, that is, makes it quite clear uh, why we have to uh, make these uh, deliberations and considerations. The first one is, of course, Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, which has transgressed all the basic principles we believe in in Europe, and I believe everywhere, those of us who, have, um, who are adhering to the UN Charter. The EU um, also left itself far too dependent on Russian energy, in particular natural gas. Uh, in addition, uh, grain exports are being held hostage, pushing uh, people in need to the brink of, um, of their survival. Then there's the, the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, we all experienced that critical goods or industry inputs were no longer able to be delivered, produced or shipped around the world, raising cost of putting economies and um, and societies at risk. And both events have shown the cost or pitfalls of being reliant on, on something akin to uh, supply chain monopolies. As societies, we must guard ourselves against these kind of market failures. And my point is that we must support or shape in a balanced way, of course, um, a kind of Globalization 2.0, we should accept the fact that there are unacceptable risks to our societies, and such risks should, of course, be addressed. So we need to shape our economy and trade relationship with this in mind. But it's, of course, it should be done in a way where we do not lose the benefits of Globalization 1.0. I'm thinking division of labor innovation, productivity, and the like. Um, and to do so, I, I certainly agree uh, uh, with, with, um, with the points made by Special Representative Bohambo. We need a continuous, honest, and focused dialogue where we maybe we put aside uh, the political slogans because that's where I believe uh, uh, trust starts to grow dramatically. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Muller. Yes. <laughs> so we, we are rushing the time. And uh, now I'd like to invite um, His Excellency Ambassador Andrews uh, Ricken I mean, from Austria. You know, we just had also former Australian, uh, Austrian uh, Prime Minister Wolfgang Schusseler visiting CCG office last Friday. So good to, to see you. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you very much, Henry. Uh, thank you to you, to Mabel, to uh, CCG for all your efforts. Uh, it has uh, been said many times uh, today that uh, China-EU cooperation is desirable wherever it is possible. Having said that, it is undeniable that the framework conditions for cooperation have become more and more challenging in recent years. EU-China relations do not exist in a vacuum. They cannot be separated from other global developments. And they are subject to public scrutiny in the EU member states, a fact that seems to be often underestimated by China. Against the backdrop of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, the fact that China has not clearly condemned this act of war has done significant harm to China's reputation among EU citizens. And also the consequences of the corona pandemic have, have not helped, uh, for example. In a recent publicly available Eurobarometer survey, a majority of European citizens stated, it, stated that in their view, China was moving in the wrong direction. Only a relatively small number thought that China was moving in a positive direction. In a nutshell, unfortunately, public opinion, which has great influence on government policies in the European Union, has turned fairly critical towards China and clearly demonstrates the need for more exchange and dialogue uh, like uh, today. 
This does not make EU-China EU, uh, cooperation any easier. Yet, cooperation remains indispensable if we want to tackle numerous challenges that uh, we have at the global stage. What we should do at this point to focus on fields where we can cooperate and where global leadership is required, and they have been mentioned uh, many times uh, today, I'm not going to repeat them. And we must refrain from making our cooperation in these areas, and especially in climate change, dependent on other political differences. This is not a question of political wisdom or diplomacy, but a question of the very survival of mankind. If the United States, the European Union, and China do not live up to their global responsibility, there will be neither an American, nor a Chinese, nor a European dream in the future that could become true. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Yeah. So, so we are coming to the last but not least, uh, the, uh, uh, the CCG Senior Fellow, uh, the former Director General of the European Department of uh, MOFCOM. Minister of, of you know foreign co Minister of Commerce actually uh, so so I know uh, Mr. Sun uh, for over almost 40 years since we entered the MOFCOM together <laughs> uh, in the 1980s but he's really a top dip top expert on, on the European trade and investment and also heavily involved in China European uh, investment uh, comprehensive uh, agreement investment so I'd like to hear uh, uh, CCG expert uh, our senior fellow uh, Mr. Sun so you first comment, please. Thank you very much, Hui Yao. I, I, want, I don't want to delay too much of our uh, lunch. Uh, well, we have uh, covered a lot of issues uh, from political issues, security, you know, uh, human rights and uh, uh, Russian-Ukraine uh, conflict. Uh, I would like to use in a few minutes uh, only discussing the economic and trade issues. And uh, I was the director general for European Department of uh, MOFCOM for a little bit more than 12 years. Fortunately, uh, it was my time, it was the golden years of our bilateral economic and trade relations. <clears throat> but unfortunately, especially this year's figure are not that rosy. Yet. I, I can provide a, a few data which is not uh, really in line or in that uh, rosy pictures as uh, our Ambassador Wu mentioned. From the first month uh, to uh, August of this year, the bilateral trade between our two, I mean China and the EU, is according to the Chinese statistics, uh, 529 billion US dollars was decreased of 9.8% in US dollars. And that I haven't seen for at least 30 years. And our export to the EU is 340 billion, decreased by 10.5%. And our increase, uh, uh, our import uh, from EU to China is 188 a billion US dollars decrease 2.5 percent. So that was not, you know, uh, bad if you compare our export to the EU. Our export to EU uh, is decreased much more than what we imported from the EU. So we are changing the so-called unfair trade. We are trying very much, as mentioned repeatedly by our President Xi and also by Li, uh, Li Qiang, and uh, our door will be open wider and wider. But on the contrary, a few days ago, the leaders of the EU announced the anti-subsidies investigation on the Chinese electronic vehicles. And I, want, I don't want to repeat uh, the, uh, the announcement by our spokesperson of the Minister of Commerce, but I do want to say it makes a lot of noise to those uh, companies which in line with the electronic 
vehicle sectors, those industries. And the response I heard from those, especially the German industries, uh, Maxeters, for example, and they are not you know, support this idea of, uh, of this anti subsidies investigation, which EU is going to, to, to have, uh, I don't know when, but uh, they have announced it. Uh, I, I personally don't think it's a very healthy uh, signal to the, uh, you know, I, I think the HED, which is going to happen next Monday, the High Level Economic and Trade Dialogue. And uh, because personally, I involved uh, at the very beginning the setup of this HED, and we discussed at that time, uh, my personally and uh, uh, Mr. Li Ri, at that time he was the DG of the uh, uh, European Department from the Minister of uh, 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 Diplomacy, uh, uh, Foreign Trade, uh, uh, for Foreign Affairs, and we had a discussion with Ambassador Abu. At that time, he was the, the EU ambassador and also the rotating presidency of the, of the EU. Uh, at the time, it was uh, the, uh, I, uh, Portuguese. So there are three principles of setting up this HED, which is not weaken and not replace and not repeat the existing dialogue uh, between our you know, two very important partners, because we have more than quite a few dozens of different uh, platform or dialogue channels at the different level, minister level, vice minister level, DG level. And so the principle of HED is not to repeat, second, not to replace, and thirdly, not to uh, duplicate, you know, those existing uh, uh, dialogues. What I'm worrying about is that very often from the EU side they put every single, uh, you know, uh, problems, especially the very technical uh, problems, to the HED, which is aiming at to solve the strategic partnership and discussing the big issues between China and the EU. So personally, I think for the economic and trade issues, using that existing platform to discuss those issues, including this anti-subsidies investigation issues, including perhaps the human rights issues, because we have that dialogue. We have the, uh, you know, uh, the, the dialogue uh, in between, I mean, uh, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs with the EU, you know, concerning the human rights issues. So I, I personally don't want to see that the political issues have the very bad influence of our trade-related, uh, uh, you know, corporations. And decoupling is not the way, uh, as uh, mentioned by the EU had, uh, leaders, uh, that uh, they, they, they'd like to see, but de-risk is something quite important. But a person, I think, I, I think de-risk doesn't mean decorporation. So we need to find further ways and more areas of cooperation, but not to, you know, concentrate on those which is called this, uh, systematic rival itself. It's mentioned again and again uh, too much, you know. We would like to see more uh, in the field of trade, in the field of investment, in the field of uh, digital economy, and definitely a green economy, low carbon economy, a new and renewable energy uh, sectors, uh, including the wind and solar power. So we, we, we try to explore and uh, uh, the, those new areas of cooperation, but not concentrate on the conflict itself. Uh, this is what I, I'd like to, to mention from the trade point of view. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senior Fellow uh, Sun, for, for injecting this uh, trade and economic perspective into this uh, dialogue uh, of uh, our Ambassador Roundtable. So very, very, very important and appreciate your, your comments.
uh, now because of the time we will, we will almost come to the end but but uh, I think that we had uh, nine European ambassadors we have one ambassador from China uh, but we have heard many questions from uh, our different European ambassadors so uh, I'd like to also because of uh, uh, we heard so much uh, comments from our European ambassador colleagues I'd like to give uh, 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 some final comment from Ambassador Wu is the uh, special representative of Chinese government on European affairs. So I think you have heard so many uh, comments and here what your final uh, summary. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Wang. Uh, it's the first time in China I'm seriously outnumbered at home ground. Uh, you can never see this uh, in China because so many Chinese here. But I, I've been outnumbered by the ambassadors from the European Union, my friends. And secondly, I would like to respond briefly to some of the points raised by the ambassadors. Otherwise, I would not do the justice to the panel and the ambassadors. Um, first, the three positioning of whatever you call it, descriptions or strategy, that depends which way you look at it. I heard you loud and clear. I understand your points, but unfortunately I'm not very convinced. So that's great to disagree. Let me ask you one question. Do you know the differences between a lawyer and engineer? I'm saying this uh, not having intention to offend anyone. This is a question asked by somebody else to me when I was ambassador. The answer is the lawyer making simple things more complicated then charge their clients. Engineers are trained to make complex issues simple and solve it. So on this point, I do hope our European ambassadors and EU headquarters will make complex issues simple so that we can move forward uh, with our cooperation. Secondly, I heard the frequent phrases used by many people, rule-based international order. In the United Nations, in English language, we always use abbreviations like SDGs, uh, MDGs, and so on. I have no objection, but I need further clar clarification. By rules, you mean the United Nations Charter, or the international laws enshrined in the international conventions passed by the General Assembly. If that is the answer, I fully agree with this and I support it. My worry is there are some homemade rules which have only binding force on other countries, not themselves. If that is the case, I'm sorry, I will not accept that. Now, dear King, maybe I did not make myself clear. I'm sorry for that. Decoupling is the baby of USA. De risking was invented in Europe. Now, we have been talking about de risking We have different views. But going along with the risking there's one thing is worrying the concept of national security is being overstretched. Take the famous case Huawei, for example. So far, there's no single country coming out with hard facts that this company is threatening their national security. Even then, they, they were not given level playground. Let's talk about Elsmile in Netherlands. We were having normal business, buying 
DUV machines from ELSMA. And all of a sudden, they change it for reasons you all know. So this is not normal business, has been politicized. So we're both against this politicized business and deal. We both want play ground that is level and treat everybody as equals. That's work for that um, purpose. Human rights were mentioned almost by each and every ambassador. The human rights derives from Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations. I, I don't know whether the ambassadors sitting here know why, instead of a two governance, instead of one governance, we came out of two. One is civil and the political, the other is economic and culture. Why you got, got two instead of one? I can tell you, ambassadors, at the very beginning, the developed countries and developing countries have a differing views. The developed countries saying, if you have your political rights, civil rights right, then the social wealth, the culture will come with these rights. But actually not. And so the United Nations cannot have the two groups brought together. So the General Assembly decided to have two covenants, one on civil and the political rights, one on economic and so cultural rights. So to emphasize one right or one covenant is not right. We in China, we support both governance. We support all the human rights. It's hard to imagine that the country spent four decades to pull out as many as 800 million people out of extreme poverty is the same time a series of violators of human rights. Now, the Ukraine issue has been mentioned by almost all ambassadors. And the China-Russia relations are also involved. I heard you very carefully, and your arguments were repeated to me during my visits to European countries. Let me first to say China-Russia relations. We are big neighbors. The neighbors cannot be relocated. Russia is also the European country's neighbors, and that can also not be relocated. The relations between China and Russia are of no allies, no confrontation. China and Russian relations are not directed against any third parties, nor subject to any third parties. About the Ukraine issue, we have very deep sympathy for the Ukraine people. The Chinese were last group, the engineer students were last group of people to be pulled out from that country. We supplied with some humanitarian goods to Ukraine. And we appointed a special representative, my colleague, the former vice minister, to deal with this issue. And he traveled to countries including Ukraine and also participate in international um, conventions or meetings. Well, I think ambassadors, by uh, listening to you, um, we are not doing enough. We should do more. Let me say this. Have you ever considered 
many countries in the world refuse to take sides. Not because they have no principles, they do not know anything. I think one of the European Prime Minister, after visiting some countries, trying to convince other countries' leaders, he said they are not against our principles. They are against our double standards. So we have been reminded the miserable lives of Ukraine people. Yes, we show sympathy. And do we forget the miserable life of Iraqi people when they were invaded by a permanent member of the city council without approval of the United Nations authority? and how that country was let away easily. So that's people, they have a much longer memory. They remember that. Having said all that, China is in its own way to push the possibility of a peaceful settlement through diplomatic negotiations. At the very beginning, as mentioned, China made four points. Number one, the sovereignty and territory integrity of a sovereign country must be respected. The United Nations Charter and rules and regulations must be abided by. Legitimate concerns of a sovereign state must be taken given the due regards and efforts must be encouraged to de-escalate the tension. And later on we published our position paper on Ukraine situation. This is ongoing process. China is ready to work with the United Nations, with the European Union and other countries to find a solution. At this moment, I think you know better than me, is not the time for the two parties to sit down for negotiations. That does not mean there will be no opportunity in the future so that's not gave up our efforts. China will continue to contribute to the possible solution to the crisis in our own way. In doing so, we are ready to listen to you and to others to see if we can do more. Having said all that, I just want to say I like this uh, panel very much. Uh, to, to have a face-to-face -face discussions and debates sometimes uh, uh, as really sharp words, but we do understand each other much better. So thank you very much, ambassadors. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ambassador Wu. I, I think you have made a very good, uh, uh, excellent concluding remarks. Yeah, uh, and uh, as you said at the beginning, you know, let's agree to disagree, and uh, we he we hear also all our European ambassadors' uh, uh, opinions as well. So because uh, because of the time, I think it's really uh, running out. So so we probably uh, we will conclude now. And but I'm glad that uh, uh, you know you made uh, uh, also answered quite a lot of concerns that our European colleagues are having. But I remember I was, I was in uh, uh, you know, Munich this February attending the Munich Security Conference. Uh, and at that time, uh, you know, the, uh, we ho CCG hold a, hold a round table there. And I remember Graham Allison, the, uh, the Harvard professor said, uh, we have talking too much about uh, competition and less about the cooperation. We should talk about cooperation as many, as much or even more than competition. 
So I think she, he made a good point. And, uh, but also, I was also in, uh, uh, in Berlin uh, last May, where German Chancellor Ola Schultz mentioned, uh, we are entering into multipolar world, and the unipolar world is gone. So I think, how can we really adjust to this multipolar world uh, where we need a lot of discussion, and EU, China, US, and many other countries, we all really need to talk, to talk together. So I think, you know, CCG is very pleased to provide this kind of platform. As Ambassador Wu mentioned, have a more face-to-face uh, -face discussion and uh, mutual understanding increase and in enhance. So because I think we are really heavily behind schedule, I apologize for <laughs> not control the time well, but uh, we will have to conclude there. But please uh, join me in thank, uh, you know, Ambassador Wu and nine European ambassadors for joining this discussion. Also our senior fellow, Mr. Sun, okay. Thank you all for uh, coming for this uh, excellent panel discussion. Thank you. So we, we'll start at 2.30. Let's have a lunch now. Thank you very much. Now we're back for our third panel today, Trade and Economics Roundtable, China and the Sustainable Global Economy, Where to Now? Let's warmly welcome our chair for today's third roundtable, Mr. Victor Gao, Senior Vice President of the Center for China and Globalization. Thank you very much. Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with our roundtable. We will talk about trade and economic roundtable, China and the sustainable global economy. Where to now? Uh, I think this morning's session is really exhilarating. Uh, the fact that CCG brought Ambassador Burns of the United States and Mr. Xie of China together on the same table and in front of all of us to share their views, talk about the importance of cooperation between China, the United States, and EU, and many other countries in dealing with climate change impact is truly very, very impressive. It means that so long as China and the United States talk with each other, we need to be more optimistic. And the other round table is also very successful. And now we talk about where is the beef? Uh, how the economic development can be promoted, how the uh, sustainability of the global economic development can really be achieved, despite of all the difficulties. We have about 75 minutes altogether for this afternoon. There are 10 distinguished participants. We will more or less just follow this alphabetical order, and each panelist will speak for about five or uh, three or four minutes and then we may have more time for robust, dynamic discussions and exchanges of views. Um, allow me to give the floor first to His Excellency uh, George Burry, Ambassador of Switzerland to China, because I understand he has some other engagements to uh, go to uh, after his uh, presentation. And without further ado, let us give the ambassador from Switzerland to China, warm welcome, and let's listen to what he has to say about how to promote the sustainable development in the global economy and what China can contribute to that. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for giving me the floor. Um, this is a very uh, challenging topic that you're addressing and I think uh, we have to mention that um, when it comes to this uh, bilateral cooperation on economy, the ties of uh, Switzerland and China have been proven to very, be very fruitful and they come from a long time ago, uh, diplomatic relations in, uh, in 1950. Um, we have had a strong focus on economy uh, for uh, quite a long time. Um, in 1980, uh, for example, Switzerland was uh, one of the first countries to have a joint venture with a Chinese entity. And um, then also among the Westerners, we were first to have uh, an FTA in 2013 and uh, very good trade figures up to 2020. Uh, two, and I also hope uh, for the future, uh, on, after, uh, this year and uh, onwards. Um, Switzerland has a strong stance in defending its interests and values, 
um, interests that may be trade, values that may be uh, other issues, and uh, we believe in an open dialogue as a tool, and we offer China cooperation on trade issues, on bilateral issues, on multilateral issues. These uh, dialogues, of course, have been um, negatively affected due to limited travel, um, but we hope that they will now fully uh, resume and gain further substance. And uh, we have started with uh, political dialogue, with uh, human rights dialogue, uh, labor dialogue in summer uh, 23, and uh, we have marked the trail. On political issues, we will always strive to remain a credible advocate for multilateralism, peace, stability, and hum uh, respect for human rights, universal rights, free trade. And uh, the challenges that lay ahead of us are uh, reactivating other forms of people-to-people -people cooperation. The coming years will bring landmark events. Uh, we will have uh, anniversaries of our, uh, of our trade agreements, and um, we will have uh, opportunity to further address the challenges that you mentioned. And I think uh, in that, on that page, I should uh, foremost mention that there are new prospects, new topics that have moved from more the periphery of our bilateral relation to almost the center of our bilateral relations. Um, one of these examples is our cooperation in the field of uh, finance, exchanges in the field of finance, uh, which today have a rather uh, high profile, while as at the beginning of uh, diplomatic relations, they were not a uh, topic yet. And another topic is the one that you uh, mentioned in the title, and that is uh, sustain sustainability. We had a quite uh, wide program on project cooperation, and what has remained is the sustainability field. So also this, a topic which has moved from the periphery, which has come up, moved to the periphery, to the center. And I think these are um, two nice examples that uh, diplomatic relations evolve, that diplomatic relations are a mirror picture of the times, and that um, with uh, diplomatic measures, we can actually help achieve the goals that you mentioned in your introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, allow me to mention that Switzerland was the first country I ever visited outside of China back in 1982. And uh, I was in uh, Kyiv, uh, Ukraine in July. And uh, combining all these decades of time, if I have a personal wish, I hope Switzerland will always remain a neutral country. Uh, neutrality of Switzerland will definitely be a global public good for all the countries in the world. Eventually, it's a decision for Switzerland themselves to decide. But I think uh, neutrality of Switzerland in the turbulent world will be a great asset. And the fact that Switzerland and China signed the first free trade zone between China and any European country is truly remarkable. And both China and Switzerland really are strong advocates of free trade, tearing down barriers between, uh, against trade of all kinds across national boundary. So thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. and. Uh, uh, you decide the appropriate time where you need to uh, leave for your other important um, engagement. Now, I would like to give the floor next to uh, Mr. Zhang Wenchai, who is the Vice uh, President of China Exim Bank. Uh, he also mentioned that he has another engagement later, so uh, he will uh, be uh, speaking a little bit out of the order, out of the alphabetic order. Uh, Mr. Zhang, Governor Zhang, is very well experienced uh, dealing with MOF, MOF uh, Minister of Finance, World Bank, ADB, etc., and used to serve with Agricultural Bank of China. I think uh, Exim Bank in China actually played a very important role in facilitating Chinese exports and imports uh, throughout the world. And wherever you go, you see some presence of China Exim Bank 
And I think uh, it has established a very extensive working relationship with many countries in the world. And I truly believe that for Exim Bank and countries like Switzerland, for example, emphasis on financial cooperation uh, will be the key. So I give the floor to uh, Mr. Zhang Wenzai, the Vice President of China Exim Bank. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It gives me a great pleasure to attend uh, today's forum. Our world has entered a new stage of uh, turbulence and uh, transformation. As we speak, uh, growing stabilizing factors and uncertainties are posing huge challenges to global uh, sustainable development. The first are challenges facing global economy and trade uh, recovery. At the present, world economy is characterized by the high inflation interest rate and debt levels, where geopolitical disruption and protectionism and unilateral uh, lease are again are back, a global recovery remains sluggish and great. Uh, second, industrial and supply chains are confronted with uh, stability challenges. Uh, in the face of COVID-19 pandemic and the geopolitical conflicts, global industrial and the supply chains uh, have shown signs of uh, localization, regionalization, and uh, fragmentation. Third, developing financing face challenges. UNCTAD's re report uh, published in July this year shows that uh, annual investment gap for achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 has increased from $2.5 trillion in 2015 to more than $4 trillion. The fourth challenges involve debt sustainability. Mr. Gao mentioned about that. You know, uh, challenges right, we are facing. You know, not only for the trade, but I should also say that we are facing a lot of debt issues, right, uh, in, in a different part of the world. And uh, in recent, you know, uh, uh, some developing countries, especially low and middle income countries, are, uh, are facing great debt vulnerability and soaring default risk in the backdrop of capital outflows, mm. currency devaluation, and beauty imbalance. At the BRICS Africa outreach and BRICS Plus dialogue in late August, President Xi Jinping pointed out that the delivery of the most sustainable developing goals remain low, slow, which is the cause for the concern. The development and the development, uh, global development endeavors face formidable challenges. In face of the severe crisis and challenges, uh, international communities, including the financial institutions like us, should play a more active role in promoting global development. First, we should stick to the multilateralism and reform the global governance system. President Xi Jinping proposed to build a global community of a shared future and put forward a bare road initiative, um, the global development initiative, the global security initiative, and the global uh, civilization initiative, providing humanity with more Chinese input and insight to help solve the challenges in the global sustainable development. We should improve the global governance system and enhance representation and the voice of the developing country. Recently, the BRICS uh, cooperation mechanism has been expanded, and the African Union has formally joined the G20, injecting a new vitality into the global governance, where the G20 summit has responded to call for adjusting the voting rights of the you know, World Bank and the IMF. Second, we should uphold openness and cooperation by promoting the liberalization and the facilitation of trade and investment in the face of the current situation, we should reduce barriers in you know, trade and investment and create a sound economic trade environment, which is open, fair, and good for the development. We should oppose the politicization and the pan-securitization of economic cooperation. Joint efforts should be made to create an open, fair, and development-friendly economic and trade environment. China steadily expands the institutional opening arm and is working toward joining the CP, CPTPP and the DEPA, what we call DEPA, and uh, enhance and enhance the regional, which will enhance the regional economic integration and industrial supply chains resilience. Third, we should adopt a package of measures to fill in the development financing gap. We should have international financial institutions, policy banks, and development banks play a big role in this regard, and at the same time mobilize more social and private sector capitals. Fourth, we should enhance the capacity policy coordination and minimize the adverse impact of the monetary policies of major economies on the developing countries. 
we need to adopt appropriate macroeconomic policies and uh, uh, strengthen international regulatory cooperation in areas such as cross-border capital flows and economic stability. We should establish and improve the financial safety net and work together to address risk and challenges. Fifth, we should take an objective standpoint and promote the debt treatment of relevant countries. On the one hand, with the fundamental principle of joint actions and equitable burden sharing, we should strive to reform and enhance the existing international roles for the debt treatment. We are encouraging greater involvement from the multilateral institutions and private creditors in the debt treatment. On the one hand, by taking, by taking both debt treatment and economic development into consideration, we should focus on the implementing project and improve the people's livelihoods and contribute to strengthening the economic and industrial foundation. This will require us to promote transfer of the advanced technology, knowledge, and ideas. We must enhance the internal driving force for developing the relevant uh, countries, thus in ensuring the stability of debt with sustainable development. Over the years, China Exim Bank has been actively supporting global sustainable development. O going forward, uh, we will, as always, work with each side to strengthen uh, communications, deepen cooperation, and uh, contribute more to realizing the global development featuring more inclusive and more resilient. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Governor Zhang. Uh, we know for sure that Exim Bank of China has served as a lubricant, an accelerator, and a facilitator in China's trade with many countries in the world. China by now is already the largest trading partner with more than 140 countries. That's the latest number. And I think uh, the role played by China's Exim Bank is crucial in making this happening over the past decades. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. And uh, now I give the floor to uh, Mr. Stephen Allen Barnett, who is senior resident representative in China of the International Monetary Fund. We know for sure that IMF and the World Bank are the important pillars of the international financial order established uh, in the ashes of the Second World War. And China is a very important participant in IMF and in the World Bank activities. And I still remember very clearly the important role played by the World Bank in particular and by IMF in terms of the regulatory reform, financial reform in China over the decades. So, uh, Mr. Barnett, you have the floor, please. Well, uh, thank you very much. And my heartfelt thanks to the Center for China and Globalization for inviting me to this roundtable. You know, the organizers posed a, a great list of questions, and I was really tempted to try to address them all, and I can speak really fast. But maybe rather than saying a little bit about each one, let me say a bit more about one. And I think my job is made easier because uh, my friend at the Exim Bank, Zhang Wenzai, already covered a lot of the points <laughs> I was going to say. So I want to focus on trade, and in particular, how can we again make trade an engine of growth? And the bottom line is the global economy could certainly use another engine of growth right now. now our most recent forecasts, which were published in July, had global growth falling from 3.4% last year to 3% this year. 3% global growth is too low. It's well below average. For the two decades before the pandemic, global growth averaged 3.8%, to give some perspective. It comes on top of a global pandemic that sharply reduced activity. So rather than making up for this lost activity, we're actually falling further behind. You know, we estimate by the end of next year, the world economy would have lost around 4.5% of output compared to what we thought before the pandemic. And if I don't have enough good news here, third and finally is that even over the medium term, we forecast global growth to be only 3%. This is our lowest medium term forecast in decades. So let me get to trade. We know that trade integration has been a key ingredient of strong growth for many decades. We also know, however, that globalization's benefits, for which there are many, have not been shared equally across countries or people. That's why at the IMF and our discussions with governments, we emphasize that building better 
domestic policies must also be at the core of efforts to ensure trade and technology work for all. But another key takeaway is that fragmentation is not the answer to ensuring trade works for all. Now, fragmentation could prove quite costly. Our research shows in some scenarios, trade fragmentation could cost as much as 7% of global GDP. Rather than fragmentation, we need trade to again become an engine of growth. This starts with rolling back damaging trade restrictions and distortionary subsidies imposed in recent years. And then it continues with positive steps, such as update the rules to better address long-standing issues that have been at the heart of recent trade tensions, like subsidies, tariffs, and technology transfer practices. And to reach new market opening agreements in modern areas of the global economy that have the potential to boost growth and promote inclusive trade, such as dig digitalization, services, and investment. To conclude, now, the global economy is facing considerable challenges today. The solution to those challenges lies not in fragmentation, but rather in renewing the spirit of international cooperation, including in trade. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, uh, Mr. Barnett mentioned the importance of international cooperation in the world of today. I think that's absolutely important. This is exactly what I believe China stands for. China does not want to have a fragmented world. China wants to promote a unified world, a world where countries and people can really freely trade with each other. And China believes that trade is a liberating force. It really enables everyone to participate. It's an equalizer in a sense. Countries in the more uh, less developed uh, Global South can participate if, for example, they have access to connectivity projects. That's why I believe China is so eager to promote the connectivity projects under the BRI uh, framework. And allow me also to mention, you know for this probably better than I do, that the special joint rights, SDI, SDR, I, in uh, uh, the IMF uh, framework, already has B as a constituent part. And I will believe in the coming decades or so, uh, the weighting of the B will further increase. So we can wait for another five years or 10 years to see how much will be the increase of the B in the special drawing rights uh, basket. So thank you very much. and. We truly want to promote this international cooperation across national boundaries, and I personally firmly oppose the fragmentation of the global market or international trade or setting up opposing blocks to get at each other's jugular, for example, which doesn't make any sense as far as greater efficiency and efficacy of international trade is concerned. Now, allow me to give the floor to uh, Mr. Chao Yuanzheng, who is the chief economist, chief economist at Bank of China. Uh, I've known Mr. Chao for many decades. He's well known in China. Um, he advised uh, many uh, countries or companies uh, throughout his decades of experience, and is well known in China as an uh, authority in analyzing Chinese economies. So thank you. Uh, Mr. Chao, you have the floor, please. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since time is limited and uh, many participants are Chinese, so the organizer of the meeting suggests me to use Chinese in order to save time as, as well as make myself better to understand. So China economy and uh, the world sustainable economy actually has become more and more prominent, especially in 2018. We can uh, see that uh, there are some disruptions of the uh, economy. We can see uh, the sloppage as well as uh, the decrease of the growth. And uh, Ukraine crisis take pla took place. 
and we could see the uh, intertwining of uh, the uh, spiking uh, inflation plus the uh, sluggish growth of the world economy. So right now we can see these two issues become uh, more prominent and become core issues. And the major reason is coming from the decrease of the productivity of the labor forces in the world. In the beginning of this century, be the developed countries or developed countries, we can see the slowdown, even the drop of the productivity of the labor. The core reason is that the uh, we yet to embrace the new round of the uh, technical revolutions, but uh, the um, old generation of the technologies has been somehow step by step phased out. So right now, this is um, exacerbated by a lot of other conflicts. And uh, from the technical progress perspective, there are a lot of debates and uh, discussions from three aspects mainly. The first one is that whether or not we have a new technology like t AI technology application. And the second is uh, like uh, the um, application in a larger scale of the new technologies. Third one is the low carbon economy. We compared the uh, different scenarios of uh, the uh, new technologies. And currently, we think the low carbon economy will be the most prominent scenario. And that is also the um, uh, reason why we select climate change as uh, the primary topic for this morning session discussion. And China's uh, economy right now is uh, under the downward pressure, especially due to the slowdown of the retail market. Uh, of the real estate market, and uh, we need a uh, new momentum in the demand side to generate the sustainable growth of the economy. And then our attention being spared to low carbon economy instead of uh, the other alternatives. So we have estimated, so based on the uh, uh, Paris Agreement, within two degree control, China has to invest 10 billion USD at least. Uh, within 1.5 degrees Celsius, then China has to con invest 18.3 billion. In the next um, 18 years, we have to invest uh, 3 trillion to 5 trillion continuously for at least uh, um, 30 years to push forward the Chinese economic development at the same time, generate the momentum of the world. Because China right now is the, the country, single country with the, the uh, most complete matrix of uh, these sectors in the industry, and then the market is very huge. So a lot of um, capacity are on the top uh, in the world, which means that the uh, low carbon or the decarbonization technologies of the world has to be somehow highlighted in China and prioritized in China and commercialized in China. So it is quite promising. Only uh, can it be commercialized, uh, could it say be uh, potentially um, utilizable technologies. And we can to, to collect the technologies application of uh, PV and uh, wind. And uh, right now, this uh, batch, bunch of the technologies are among the top in the world. I've been visiting the biggest solar power company in China, which is uh, in a very remote area, Qinghai province and uh, the state grid investment company. The land area of a single company is uh, way bigger than the land area of Singapore. And also, it can switch the power with the, uh, the power uh, from the solar to the, uh, to the hydropower seamlessly. And there is no single facility involving coal burning. It is 100 percent uh, clean. At the same time, in terms of the use of the clean energies, there are a lot of cases. For example, the NEV or the uh, hybrid EV, it actually changed the total way of uh, the uh, production of the vehicles. And the uh, NEV has become, especially the vehicles right now, has become the commonly owned property of uh, the residents in here in China. So when we uh, disseminate the usage of the NEV, it will contribute a lot for the low carbon development and also decarbonization. So in that end, that would be the new realm of uh, uh, trials of cooperation. And the market right now is open to the world. Hopefully, the investors of the world can join and uh, enter this uh, market and contribute to the decarbonization of uh, the human being society. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Tao. Uh, allow me to make several points about Bank of China. First, it's not the central bank of China. Lots of people abroad thought Bank of China is the central bank, like Bank of England, Bank of Japan, etc. Et it is not. Secondly, Bank of China was founded predating the founding of the People's Republic, so it has a very illustrious uh, history. Thirdly, for many, many years, up to about the middle of the 1980s, Bank of China was the exclusive bank in China dealing with foreign exchange. So it played a very important role in helping China, Chinese government entities, institutions, individuals in uh, exchanging renminbi into many other uh, currencies. Uh, now it is still the preeminent and dominant uh, bank in terms of foreign exchange dealings in China. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Tao, uh, and I think uh, we sh could uh, learn more about China and globalization and the important role of finance uh, provided by institutions like Bank of China. Uh, now I give the floor to Mr. Karim uh, Daho, who is the Deputy Director and Head of the China Unit, OECD Global Relations and Cooperation Directory. Um, OECD is a very important uh, international organization. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Taho, whether he thinks there will be a time when OECD may eventually admit China as a member, or how long that process will be. Um, among many things that Mr. Taho impressed me, the fact that he went to Paris Institute of Political Science, as well as La Sorbonne University, two of the best universities in France, are very impressive. So, I give the floor to Mr. Daho, please. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, uh, Gao. Uh, let me first thank uh, Henry and uh, the China, the Center for China and Globalization for the, the kind invitation. Uh, I won't stay too long, spend too long, too much time on the, the, the question about uh, uh, when China can join the OECD. I can only stress that for the moment there are a number of uh, developing countries that are uh, in the pipe queuing for uh, becoming potentially new members. We have several countries that are uh, on an accession track including uh, Brazil and uh, Peru at the, at the moment and Argentina and Indonesia has just requested membership. So uh, China for the moment is a key partner we are getting ever uh, closer on the range of uh, issues, uh, like Indonesia, like Brazil, like, like India. Uh, China is a key partner of the organization for uh, uh, a good 15 years. So uh, in that capacity, we are working very closely uh, with China on a very wide range of uh, public policies, including uh, economic policy and trade, which are the two topics of these uh, of this discussion. Um, trade has been uh, uh, addressed by a few uh, speakers. If there's an opportunity to engage in a second round of uh, comments, I'm very happy to touch on it. We have uh, uh, intense cooperation with China on trade-related issues, but since um, we have fresh data that regard uh, the Chinese economy, we've just released a few days ago our interim uh, economic outlook. I will focus my uh, intervention on uh, the economy. So as mentioned, uh, just a few days ago, uh, we issued our new forecast for uh, growth this year and next uh, year. Uh, we have uh, figures uh, which for China are almost on par, uh, slightly uh, lower, but almost on par with what we were uh, forecasting at the end of uh, last year. 5.1% uh, uh, of uh, growth this year in 2023 and 4.6% uh, next year. It's, uh, it's very, very fair. It's, uh, these are very good, uh, uh, including against the, the picture, the, the landscape of sluggish uh, global growth. These are good numbers. But there are a few, uh, uh, a few issues that are hinging on the, the growth prospects, at least in the short term. And I will, uh, uh, and I will uh, uh, highlight them uh, very uh, briefly before uh, uh, touching on some of the uh, reforms of, of the uh, ways forward that uh, China could consider uh, implementing with a view to uh, improving uh, the, the structural uh, uh, strength of its, uh, of its economy. So unlike in 2020, I think we need to, uh, to stop on this uh, when China's economic uh, recovery uh, 
uh, exhibited a clear uh, V-shape. Uh, what happened in uh, the first quarter when uh, China reopened of, the, uh, of 2023 was not so uh, clear cut. In fact, it was, uh, this recovery was a bit weaker than expected. And in the second trimester, uh, the picture was not that much better. The, the figures were even, uh, even weaker. Uh, this was largely uh, uh, down to the ongoing uh, uh, restructuring and deleveraging of the property sector, which, by the way, is, uh, is, a good, uh, is, is, is tackled, according to us, in a good manner by the Chinese government. Uh, too much of an accommodating or expansioning uh, uh, budgetary or uh, monetary policy would not necessarily uh, uh, produce uh, uh, the greatest effects, and I can uh, uh, get back to this issue uh, a little bit uh, later. Uh, there was another uh, factor uh, that was uh, uh, that explains these uh, uh, relatively disappointing figures. At, at least at the beginning of the, the year, it was the, slug, the sluggish uh, consumption uh, growth. And last but not least, there's the challenging picture of. Uh, the local uh, government uh, debts, which again explain why perhaps uh, uh, budgetary uh, expansionism, uh, but there are other reasons uh, why it might not be as uh, uh, warranted as uh, uh, in past, uh, uh, as when China had to, to enact policies to recover from past crises. Um, nevertheless, uh, the second uh, half of the uh, year seems to uh, hint at an improvement, uh, and uh, it seems that the economy may have already uh, bottomed out with indicators, these are important indicators for consumption and for uh, industrial uh, output picking up again uh, over the summer. Uh, but as I mentioned, there, are, there still are a few uh, uh, long-term challenges, and I would uh, uh, like to uh, uh, highlight uh, uh, three ways uh, that would help uh, China uh, perhaps to return to more dynamic growth while also ensuring that it contributes to sustainable global economy. These three factors are uh, productivity growth, uh, the shift towards a more consumption-based uh, uh, growth uh, model, and last but not least, uh, the transition towards a net zero uh, economy. So let me touch on uh, productivity growth first. This is not a challenge that uh, uh, hits only China. Uh, we are working on this at the OECD for a good decade. Uh, we focused our 2015 uh, uh, ministerial council meeting, annual ministerial council meeting on uh, uh, sluggish productivity. It's affecting a lot of OECD countries, but uh, China has been particularly hit by a decrease of productivity since the last financial crisis, since 2008. Before 2008, uh, the growth of total uh, factor productivity was a uh, two-digit growth and it was uh, nearing 20%. Since uh, after the crisis, since 2008, it's 5% on average. Uh, this reflects uh, an issue of resource allocation for the Chinese economy uh, at large. This is the main uh, factor that lies under uh, productivity uh, performance, and there are a number of issues that, uh, uh, that can improve this resource allocation. One important issue, according to us, that we uh, highlight uh, across the economic surveys that we carry out on China every two years is the need to ensure competitive neutrality. Competitive uh, neutrality uh, between state-owned enterprises and not only foreign investors but also domestic private investors. Uh, Two-thirds of the Chinese uh, GDP is still generated by the private sector. The private sector has higher productivity than the public sector, uh, higher returns on investment, and ensuring good competitive neutrality uh, between SOEs and their private competitors is important in this uh, regard. Um, second important point, uh, uh, a shift, the necessity to shift towards uh, a model which is mm, less led by uh, investment, more by uh, domestic consumption. Um, although they are concerned about uh, its pace, uh, household consumption has been the main driver of China's recovery so far this year. 
So it seems uh, we are on a good trend. For the recovery uh, to be sustainable, uh, more nevertheless must be done to reduce the, the need for people to save for old age and health. So uh, every possible effort at uh, strengthening, at widening uh, social security safety nets uh, can only uh, support uh, this uh, uh, shift towards uh, a more uh, consumption-based uh, 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 growth uh, model, which should uh, improve uh, the prospects, the long-term prospects of the Chinese economy. Third and last important point, uh, the net zero uh, transition. Uh, to achieve uh, its uh, dual uh, carbon target, peaking emissions by 2030 and uh, achieving net zero uh, by 2060, uh, the pace and scale of uh, China's decarbonization will have to be the largest of all the large economies. Uh, it's a very considerable effort that is required. It will uh, uh, need a, a truly ambitious domestic reform agenda and also uh, the need to double down on international cooperation and dialogue regarding uh, climate issues. Uh, the OECD looks forward uh, in this regard to strengthening its cooperation with China on climate and the net zero transition, including in the context of our new forum, uh, our new inclusive for forum on carbon uh, mitigation approach approaches. It's, uh, it's a flagship OECD initiative. In the context of this forum, we aim to uh, measure uh, the impact of a range of uh, policies, not only pricing policies, not only, only carbon pricing, but uh, renewables deplo deployment, emission caps, emission targets, uh, as well as environmental uh, regulation, measure the impact of, of this series of policies on uh, emissions mitigation. China has a lot to demonstrate in this uh, area. It is making tremendous efforts on all these issues. So uh, we very much encourage uh, uh, China to join the forum, which already gathers more than 60 countries. China has actively uh, participated to the, the first meetings of the, of the forum. Uh, we encourage China to become a, a full uh, member of the inclusive forum on carbon mitigation uh, approaches. So. Uh, in the interest of time, I would have liked to touch on trade, but perhaps we will have a second uh, opportunity to do it. I will stop here. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Daho. Uh, I personally do hope one day China will be a full member of OECD, because uh, uh, China is actually a typical example of how a country can successfully promote economic cooperation and development over the past 44 years. And if you believe in Elon Musk, by the middle of this century, the overall size of the Chinese economy may double that of the United States. So if China by 2050 is still not a full member of OECD, I'm afraid it will be too late. So I personally want to urge OECD and Chinese government entities to start the dialogue and negotiation for a full membership for China in OECD. Now I'll give the floor to Ms. or Madam Ma Xiaoping, who is Senior Vice President, HSBC uh, in China. Thank you very much, Ms. Ma. Thank you, Mr. President. And I enjoy a lot of the excellent discussion this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my speech will be in Chinese. So you may like to put on your uh, area. So we, know, we see that uh, the, the global economy is in a downturn. The major uh, in, um, interest increase uh, cycle is near an end. In terms of China, the, the policy makers are strengthening the structural reform aiming at uh, middle and long term, at the same time using uh, macroeconomic to, to provide a safety net uh, for the society. Uh, so in the short term, 5% uh, growth seems uh, not hard, but uh, in the long term, uh, sustainable development still requires tremendous efforts. Global uh, against the global geographic uh, ge uh, geopolitical uh, risks, 
all countries are making adjustments to their trade and economic activities. Uh, global supply chains are thus becoming more complex. Uh, Governor Chow mentioned this. We should uh, note that uh, China is still at the center of global industrial chains, but we should uh, pay attention to the new uh, challenges posed by the uh, rearrangement of uh, global supply chains. There are, however, a few highlights. For example, Asia and economy and the uh, Middle East economies in transition. We are seeing uh, more frequent um, ties. Uh, Asia and uh, Middle East economic corridor it might be a new highlight of uh, uh, trade and economic growth in going forward. At uh, present, we are seeing uh, profound changes in domestic, both domestically and internationally. So the Chinese economy is uh, more resilient. So we need to take advantage of that to increase China's um, competitiveness. We are seeing that after COVID-19, regulators have uh, stepped up communications with international financial institutions, including HSBC, trying to resolve the pain points that uh, we faced. So we are on our way for a high quality growth, thanks to uh, China's uh, financial opening. Uh, HSBC has been the largest financial uh, institution globally operating in China. So we have uh, always tried to become the bridge between China, financial bridge between, between China and uh, the world. We are seeing sp uh, more uh, developments in the f following three aspects. The first is dovetailing with uh, international rules and uh, regulations, and second is increased access to for uh, f uh, foreign inst financial institutions and uh, more pr provisions of uh, financial production products. And the third is uh, a e equal attention given to to efficiency and uh, security. So we will continue to support China's opening up policies, contribute our share to green transition, RMB inter internationalization, and the Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot to talk about HSBC and its role in financing in the Greater China area in particular, but we do not have enough time. Hopefully there will be another chance to talk about it. Uh, we need to finish everything within uh, 75 minutes, so we will push through. So now I give the floor to uh, Ms. or Madam uh, Beat Trunkma, who is the D UNDP resident representative for China. I think uh, Madam Trunkman probably knows Asia better than many of us here. She is very much involved in China, in Mongolia, in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, in Cambodia, etc. And uh, so we can really benefit from her very extensive knowledge base and experience, hands-on experience in development. And we know for sure that UNDP, while every constituent organization within the UN um, uh, umbrella is important, UNDP is particularly important. And if there is no United Nations resident office, normally UNDP resident office doubles up as the chief rep of the United Nations system in that particular country. So, uh, I give you the floor. I give you the floor, Mr. Trangman. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Thank you very much for the kind words. Uh, uh, and I, indeed, I have a, a soft spot uh, for Asia. Uh, of course, since uh, UN reform, that uh, double-headed role has uh, separated, so I represent the UN development uh, program here in China, and our resident coordinator, UN resident coordinator, represents the uh, UN uh, development uh, uh, systems. Um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to engage uh, this afternoon uh, 
uh, with you all and uh, I thought I could uh, focus my remarks uh, on uh, uh, discussing China's role in um, international development cooperation. Now, um, wearing my uh, development hat, I wanted to actually start by pointing out that China's remarkable economic growth has in fact also brought about very significant uh, development results, both uh, domestically and uh, globally. For example, the world, w uh, the world uh, without China lifting 770 million people out of poverty since the opening up and uh, reform area would have not met the Millennium Development Goal uh, number one to half extreme poverty. Uh, five years ahead of uh, the targeted uh, deadline at the time, uh, 2015. And I think China's uh, contributions uh, in or achievements in this area continue to contribute also to the sustainable development uh, uh, goal number one, zero poverty. Now, at the same time as, as China uh, has uh, uh, grown its economy to become the second largest in the world, it has of course also become the biggest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in absolute terms. And that was obviously a, a, a topic of hot uh, um, and very informative discussions uh, I thought um, this morning. So, so indeed, I think given the size of uh, uh, its economy, what happens in China indeed impacts uh, the rest of the world. And, I, and this is, I think, precisely why China's sustained and sustainable growth is critical in advancing today's global agendas, including the 2030 uh, agenda, the SDGs, and the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. Now, in addition, um, China's active participation in and contribution to international uh, development cooperation also plays an important role in advancing uh, global uh, sustainable development outcomes. And I think China has made um, important commitments uh, uh, in this regard. It has highlighted in its uh, 2021 white paper on international uh, on development cooperation, uh, the SDGs and the 2030 agenda as uh, guiding frameworks for its development cooperation, emphasizing also the role of multilateralism. It has enhanced its uh, global de development and South-South cooperation fund, adding one billion uh, US dollars to the already uh, three billion uh, dollars that were in the pool, and it has put forward uh, the 1.5 uh, billion RMB, Renminbi, uh, Kunming Biodiversity Fund uh, during its uh, COP15 presidency. And it has pledged also importantly to support the green economy and green energy uh, transformation in developing countries and stopping financing of uh, coal power plants overseas uh, during the uh, 2021 uh, General Assembly. Now, I think to, to further accelerate um, these trends and to ensure that China's international uh, development cooperation, including through uh, China-led member states' initiatives, such as the Global Development Initiative, generate, can generate optimum uh, impact, I wanted to make uh, uh, two brief suggestions for consideration. One is on the modalities of uh, uh, cooperation. And I think there we have an opportunity to scale up demand-driven South-South uh, and uh, trilateral cooperation as a mechanism that can leverage comparative advantage of players while also providing context-specific solutions two countries' unique sustainable development uh, challenges. UNDP is already working with China in this area, providing our decade-long uh, experience in development cooperation to ensure that its engagements can draw on international best practice, norms, standards, as well as our uh, global platforms to connect the demand from our global southern constituencies 
uh, into the supply of knowledge and financing from China. And we look forward to further expanding this uh, collaboration. My second point is on the areas of uh, cooperation. And again, it's a point that was touched upon um, this morning, because I believe in addition to climate mitigation and uh, uh, the green energy transformation, it is very important uh, to also focus on climate adaptation in the, uh, of, for China's development cooperation, to focus on climate adaptation in the countries most vulnerable to climate change. The adaptation gap report of uh, 2022 shows that the international uh, adaptation financing flows to developing countries are actually five to ten times below estimated uh, needs. And UND, as UNDP, we work with multiple countries uh, uh, already to advance their national adaptation uh, plans, so we stand ready to offer our platforms uh, for exchange and collaboration. Let me close uh, by saying, and we're of course just coming off the uh, SDG summit uh, um, in New York also, with only 15% of the sustainable development goals on track at uh, midpoint and many regressing and the worrisome uh, uh, signal there is that it is particularly the climate and environment goals that are uh, regressing. Uh, I think the 2030 <clears throat> agenda is hanging on by a thread. So I think decisive collective uh, action is our only hope uh, to rescue the global goals, and China can and must play uh, a key role in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Trankman. Uh, we know for sure that uh, UNDP and the World Bank and other international organizations within the UN uh, umbrella have really contributed a lot to China's economic reform over the decades. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you and uh, thank UNDP for the historically very important role it has played for China's modernization, reform, and uh, globalization. So in this connection, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Elitsa Bileva, Chief Economist for China, Mongolia, and Korea of the World Bank. Uh, she is very experienced, and when we talk about the World Bank, for people like me who really uh, started to witness and participate in China's reforms starting from the early 1980s, the World Bank is truly a rain maker in the 1980s, not only providing funding, but also, more importantly, providing knowledge base, know-how, and access to the most advanced international standards. So, uh, Ms. Mileva, we want to listen to what you have to say about this very important topic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Gao, for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, being almost the last speaker on the, on the panel, this was bound to happen, so I, my, my, the arguments I would like to propose today are very similar to the ones by uh, Mr. Cao from uh, the Bank of China, but I hope that I will provide additional evidence and some more arguments to support his uh, position. Um, so I, I chose a topic to talk about China's climate action and how that will make China a positive force for um, a sustainable global economy. So beyond the fact that if China achieves its very ambitious uh, carbon neutrality goal by 2060, um, it will be the biggest single contribution by any country to, to uh, global climate goals. But beyond this direct impact on, on GHD emissions, China can play an important global role in, in, in two other dimensions. One is uh, a strategic, its strategic importance um, to, to lead uh, global climate action. And this was dem demonstrated back in 2020 when China committed at the uh, UN General Assembly to achieve its twin 2030, 2060 carbon goals. That pledge was followed in the next few months by a string of pledges by other countries. And within a few months after September, almost half or uh, more than 40 percent, sorry, so countries that are responsible for more than 40 percent of global GHG emissions made pledges to uh, net zero. 
So China is strategically important in, in, in leading uh, global coordination uh, on uh, climate change. Now, in addition to that, of course, China being a very large uh, and important economy, it, it has a role to play through trade and investment uh, links on the import side. China is so large that if it uh, shifts its import basket from goods that are, uh, that are um, from uh, high carbon uh, sectors, including fossil fuels, to products that are low carbon in nature, of course it has, China will affect the relative prices of uh, high carbon versus low carbon uh, goods globally. And this will reduce the abatement costs for all global, uh, countries in the world, not just China. On the export side, China is already a leader in terms of um, green export competitiveness. It, back in 2019, it ranked fifth on the green competitiveness index. It was actually higher than Japan and Korea. Now, having a large domestic market and strong manufacturing capabilities helps. Many low carbon technologies are shown to, to have increasing returns to scale, for example, uh, wind and battery storage. Uh, and the increasing returns are not just to production, but also innovation and operation. And so when China scales up low carbon technologies, prices will fall globally, again, reducing the abatement cost for, for all countries. In addition, China is also rapidly building innovation capacity, and this point was already made by uh, Mr. Cao. So um, back in 2019, China accounted already for almost a quarter of the global R&D only in the energy sector. Growth in, in climate change related patents has also accelerated in uh, recent decades, particularly in low carbon ICT in buildings in uh, uh, renewable uh, power. However, China still has, um, uh, has, uh, has scope to, uh, to improve or opportunities to grow. This is in the area of high value low carbon inventions that are registered in, in two or more uh, patent offices. So in this area, China's performance is a bit more moderate. It lags some of the um, advanced countries like uh, Germany and Japan. But if China is able to shift from quantity to the quality of uh, research and patents, then it's opportunities to contribute to global climate action via trade and investment again will grow. And then finally, on the investment side, just one example, China already is a leader in, in foreign direct investment in, in low carbon sectors such as the production of electric vehicles, for example, we've seen recent data on uh, FDI into si Southeast Asia, so that's another channel um, for China to have a global impact. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your important speech. Uh, allow me to take this opportunity to thank the World Bank once again for the outstanding role it has played in the course of China's reform. And uh, uh, China is now a very important member of the World Bank. And I believe in the coming decades, China will play a more important role as far as its participation in the World Bank and IMF and other international financial institutions are concerned. Now, uh, allow me to give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Graham Fletcher, Ambassador of Australia to China. Ambassador Fletcher is well known in China. He has served uh, three assignments in China, including right now as the Ambassador of Australia to China. I actually took a particular interest in one of his previous assignments as Deputy Council General in Nomia of New Caledonia. I asked the Ambassador whether he served in that capacity full-time or part-time. He said it's full-time. Holy cow, I want to have that position, working in the paradise in the world. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, New Caledonia is a nice place to visit. Um, over the past decade, globalization has faced a number of challenges. Uh, countries have placed a growing premium on resilience and security in their supply chains and pursued interventionist policies. Businesses have increasingly been keen to de-risk, with more companies factoring geopolitical considerations into their business decisions. And global and regional shocks such as COVID-19 and Russia's aggression in Ukraine have added stress to the trading system. In this environment, it has become popular to proclaim the end of globalisation, but the story is not so simple. 
Last week's WTO World Trade Report showed that claims of deglobalisation had been exaggerated, and recently there have been clear signs of re-globalisation. WTO report showed that trade flows both within and between blocks remained resilient despite recent challenges. So globalisation is not in long-term retreat, but it has changed and it has become more regional. For example, China is trading more with ASEAN and the US is trading more with Mexico and Canada. Other factors such as increased government, company and consumer interest on sustainability, climate and human rights have also driven changes. Put simply, globalisation is not in irreversible decline, but its complexion is changing. But why should we persist with globalisation at all? The answer is simple. International trade and investment are central to prosperity and to security. Without open trade, we would be poorer, we would be less resilient, we would be prone to more conflicts and we would be more unequal. Globalisation and economic integration are important channels by which we promote peace. That's not to say that we should be blind to the potential vulnerabilities arising from globalisation, but we should seek to manage those risks through the rules-based trading system in a manner that is balanced and careful. We should resist the impulse to turn away from the rules-based trading system on which our collective prosperity depends because it's this system that has underpinned the historical success of our countries in attracting investment and supporting trade flows. All countries, including China, have a key role to play in strengthening the system. It's yet to be seen if China will play a, a significant role in driving forward globalisation, or if policies adopted here and elsewhere will lead to further deglobalisation or fragmentation of trade into blocks. China's entry into the WTO has been hailed as a key moment in the history of globalisation. China benefited significantly from the transparent and predictable access to markets that WTO membership offered, and access to China's market also greatly benefited other members and encouraged investment into China. As the world's largest exporter and one of the world's major economies, the policies that China takes in coming years will go some way to determining the future of globalisation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. <laughs> Allow me to make a, a personal note. I think uh, Australia has China as its largest, uh, most important trading partner and has the United States as its staunch blood treaty partner. So my personal belief is that if Australia has to be forced to pick and choose between China and the United States, it will be a nightmare. The best position for Australia is to playing good offices between China and the United States to bring the two big countries closer together rather than having to pick and choose between China and the United States. But that's a decision for the Australians to decide. Now, allow me to give the floor to our last, not the least, uh, speaker, His Excellency André Haspel, the ambassador of the Netherlands to China. We know for sure that Netherlands has always been very well known, respected in China. More recently, Netherlands is becoming more well known in China because of this uh, fascinating role played by ASML, which is still an ongoing process. So let's keep our eyes open as to what exactly will happen to ASML and what will be the prospect of China Netherlands relations. Your Excellency, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And since in the previous panel ASML was also mentioned, I I'd just like to mention, first of all, and the speaker said that as well, that we should not focus on the smaller details of our cooperation, but focus and keep our eye on uh, the larger picture. And the larger picture is that uh, you are uh, the sec of you, we are the, the second biggest trading partner from Europe in China, and you are our biggest trading partner in the Netherlands. So I would first of all say that we keep that in mind. Uh, and when it comes to uh, ASML, uh, I think we've always been very open, uh, and we continue to be very open. We have almost on a weekly uh, basis we have discussions with uh, the Chinese counterpart. Part. Uh, and then, but I will keep that for the next time if you allow me, Mr. Chair. Um, um, I think strategic dependencies uh, and the risks of doing business should uh, 
should be applicable to every country, including China, uh, to take into account your strategic dependencies and your legitimate trade interests. So, so on that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I hope that I've briefly addressed the issue of ASML, but I've already noticed that in my first two weeks of being in China, I arrived two weeks ago, ASML is really a topic that we'll uh, happy to discuss much more often. Now, I'm not going to focus uh, on semiconductors in my uh, contribution. I'm going to focus on, uh, on the first question, which has to do with the, uh, the global challenges that we are facing and climate change. And um, uh, we all know that we need to, uh, to deliver results to make sure that the Paris Agreement can be fully implemented and also to show that the world is not backtracking on its commitment to climate issues due to the economic uh, crisis caused by, by COVID. And although there is always much more room for ambition, um, climate change is indeed a field where China has much to offer. And we very much welcome the, uh, the ambitions laid out by President Xi during his speech at the UNGA back in 2021, uh, in which he announced that China will strive to become carbon neutral by 2060 and to peak its CO2 emissions by 2030. That being said, Global challenges can, also, can only be solved at the global level, and that requires global partnerships. That does not only go for tackling climate change, but also for uh, subjects like energy security, food security, health care, uh, including elderly care, uh, as well as sustainability and biodiversity. So collaboration between countries on these topics are essential. And that's exactly why we, the Netherlands, are currently working on with China. To give you a few uh, concrete examples, Mr. Chairman, the Chinese Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation will be visiting the Netherlands next week. And during his visit, he and his Dutch counterparts will lay the groundwork for strengthening our co cooperation on science, uh, on technology and innovation in many different areas. Uh, including uh, uh, such uh, topics as vertical farming, sustainable urban development, water management and health care, including elderly care. Furthermore, the global challenge of health, and in particular elderly care, is important for our countries to collab collaborate on as well. Both China and the Netherlands face significant demogra demographic challenges due to rapidly aging population. And Elderly people uh, in themselves are not a problem, of course, but the question is how to ensure that these citizens can spend their life comfortably and in good health. And that is exactly why our countries are closely working together on, for example, medical technologies and combating dementia. And next month, the Dutch Minister of Health will be hosting a high-level ministerial level meeting called Defeating Dementia, including the participation of the Chinese National Health Commission. Finally, on the broader context, the Dutch government developed a global health strategy which focused to strengthen the resilience of the health sector, uh, infrastructure on pandemic pre prevention, etc., etc. And also for that topic, the Chinese delegation will be visiting the Netherlands soon. Mr. Chairman, these are just a few examples of our bilateral, bilateral cooperation that I believe are contributing to finding solutions for the global challenges that we are facing. And we might have our differences from time to time, um, that can cause friction, but I truly believe that only through joint efforts we can overcome our global challenges. And I very much look forward to us, the Netherlands and China, working together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the Ambassador. I think uh, the Chinese people and the Dutch people really share a lot of things in common. Both the Chinese people and the Dutch people dare to overcome all the challenges. Uh, and this is very impressive if you look at the Dutch people and what they have accomplished. It's the same case in China. And I do agree with you that China, Netherlands trade is much larger than uh, whatever that China deals with uh, as small. But allow me to also mention one point in my personal capacity. China by today is the only country in the world which can manufacture the most sophisticated smartphone all by itself. It does not need any imports, semiconductors or otherwise, from abroad. Now this was not something China chose to do, to start with. Lots of people abroad say, why should China do this? This is very disruptive of the supply chain involving semiconductors. China was left with no other choice. China was forced to go 
independent and now it is self-reliant. And uh, Huawei company is the only company in the world which can manufacture a very sophisticated smartphone in-house. This is truly impressive. What impressed me the most is the ability to build such a miniaturized uh, antenna allowing the smartphone to communicate directly on ground with a satellite 35,000 kilometers above ground. This was truly an engineering miracle. Now, I do believe China and Netherlands trade and bilateral relations will flourish in the future, but allow me to again quote in my personal capacity what was said by a very important president of a country. And uh, if uh, Ambassador Burns were here as he was this morning, I would say the same thing. The president said, it is very dangerous to be an enemy of the United States, full stop. Then he goes on to say, it is more dangerous to be a friend of the United States. What he means, you know, you need to be philosophical as to how to figure out. But I think uh, uh, Asmel, I hope, will be continuing doing good, brisk business with China by overcoming the maximum pressure from another country. I think the pressure against China, try to deny China's access to semiconductor, results in China becoming completely independent in semiconductor chips. This is truly amazing. China used to spend more than 200 billion US dollars importing chips from the United States and quite a few other countries and regions. Now you are talking about China completely independent and China makes smartphone more sophisticated in my view and in the judgment of many uh, experts in the industry more sophisticated than the latest version of iPhone. This is a revolutionary moment and I truly believe this will have tremendous profound impact on companies like ASML. I think Anna is waving to us saying our time is uh, uh, up so allow me and I hope you will join me in thanking all the important participants, the ambassadors, otherwise in our round table. Thank you. Welcome back. Now it is time for us to begin our fourth round table discussion for today's China and Globalization Forum. The business round table reset, renew and reinvent the private sector for economic rebound. Let's warmly welcome the chair of this round table, Dr. Mabel Miao, Secretary General of the Center for China and Globalization. Dear guests, good afternoon. Many thanks to all of you attending the ninth China and Globalization Forum. And uh, every year at the same event, we will see a lot of splendid topics to be discussed, including geopolitical issues and world trade and climate change and all aspects involving uh, globalization will be touched upon. And today, when we come to the third session, it must be around the economy as well as the recovery of China's uh, uh, economy. And uh, in July 14th, the uh, Central uh, Economic uh, Work Conference stated that China's uh, national economy is uh, resuming and the fundamentals are positive, but uh, still it is uh, fluctuating in a waving manner and uh, Right now, the challenges in front of us is um, the sloppish consumption and the difficulties faced by the enterprises. And there are a lot of um, conflicts uh, externally and a lot of uh, problems internally. And uh, also, the uh, risk recovery of the world trade is very sloppy. And uh, right now, the foreign investment uh, growth is also not very good and not, not very positive, as we have heard a lot in this morning and this afternoon that the situation, including the investment from uh, EU and from US, is decreasing in China. So the foreign uh, direct investment, the outlook right now is uh, still uncertain. And uh, for the private sectors, we can see a lot of challenges roaming on. And Chinese government has issued a lot of encouragements, policies, 
especially right now the state council have issued the circular of uh, incentivizing the uh, private sectors and do business environment um, for foreign companies and all of these efforts are supposed to intensify the confidence of the foreign enterprises, multinationals, and uh, that also aroused a lot of discussions. And uh, that is why today we invite a cohort of uh, diverse enterprise representatives today for the session, because uh, this is a uh, event held by uh, think tanks that we're going to talk about their policies. The term investment, foreign trade, and consumption has declined. Alongside the ongoing downward pressure on global foreign direct investment, foreign capital investment in China faces significant uncertainties in terms of policies, markets, and expectations. In response, the Central Committee of the Party and the State Council have introduced a series of new measures to encourage economic development. Notably, the State Council recently issued documents on promoting the development and growth of the private economy and uh, further optimize, optimizing the environment for foreign investment and increasing efforts to attract foreign investment. These measures are aimed at boosting confidence in, in foreign investment in China and have generated significant interest and discussion among the foreign companies and the investors. So, Today we have invited uh, the distinguished guests from the private sector in China, also from the multinational companies, the foreign invest investors uh, in China to talk about this issue. How to build up the research, renew and reinvent reinvent the private sector for economic rebound. Uh, so today, through two simple rounds of discussion, We'd like to touch upon this issue. First of all, I'd like to invite Chairman Jiang Xiping, who is uh, the um, senior um, counselor of uh, CCG, and uh, also President Jiang is a very excellent private sector entrepreneur. And I noticed that your company is uh, the flagship company since the reform and opening up of China. Keep growing always, and operation was very positive. And also, the uh, sector that you are in not only have deployment uh, of the whole world, but also in China in terms of the new energy development, you also have done a lot. And I'd like to listen to your ideas regarding in the position as the uh, company in the forefront, how to reinvent the private sector's confidence for the economic rebound, especially against such a very stringent environment. The domestic growth is very sluggish, and the external environment is very complex. So what is your view regarding this topic? Thank you. Dr. Miao. Yes. The Far East has been existing for 30 years, 30 plus years. And from new all the way to where we are, we have experienced a lot of um, storms. And uh, we are still navigating the uncharted waters. That's why I'd like to appraise the efforts done by a lot of supporters, because previously, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs or enterprises before, due to reasons diverse reasons. Many of them had collapsed or closed down. And that is, of course, due to the external environment. And I hope that more and more good resources can be put into the uh, private enterprises. If you are among the top three in the sector or in the segment, or if you are specialized in some innovative sector with your power and resources, you can encourage and accelerate the changes to the positive manner. And I believe that this is a very critical challenge in front of us against this background. The question is, how can we reinvent the confidence, especially to the Chinese economy and the world economy? And China's economy right now has to come back to the high quality track. And this is also the question in front of many people and uh, each one of the individuals has to face this uh, problem. So from the macro environment, 
we need the leaders of the states has to be on the right track, make good judgments, and we share the same planet. Although we are from the different countries, we are living in the different regions with the different backgrounds. But in nature, we share the same community with a shared destiny. So how to be sincerely and openly and fairly cooperate in a complementary manner to win the common prosperity, especially to create the legitimate environment for a positive development of the prosperity and to stabilize the world environment based on law and rules. And the top design has to be positive to unleash the potential for the dividend of the systems and mechanisms, which is especially important. And also that is something that the entrepreneurs has to do about, but I believe this is the shared principle and the shared spirit, which would provide a great space of opportunities. The issues daunting in front of us probably fragment us due to the different political decisions and the uh, duplication of the different pro uh, problems and uh, the states would prioritize the interests of their own. And that would lead to the divergence of the ideas. And this is one issue. And the second is from the micro perspective. Enterprises and en entrepreneurs have to face the problems squarely. And they have to be firmly uphold their principles and goals. And they have to sharpen their ability to do business. Right now, this is um, the diverse economy. So there are diverse examples of successes. And um, many of them are specialized, and many of them are flagship, many of them are role model. But in fact, right now, diverse ways compared to what we're talking about as a specialization will be more challenging. So we have to be focused, and we have to sharpen our respective ability, and we have to focus the issue at uh, current so that we can sharpen our ability to be more dedicated in what we're doing. And so we can actually translate what has been transferred from other countries to China and internalize them into our knowledge system. And we can make use of them properly. So the ability of innovation has to be maintained and also the overall and comprehensive ability and to make the knowledge more intelligent. And also, we have to sharpen our ability and to get it more innovative so as to get ahead of other countries in the world. Ni 当下特勾国外还有很多的交流张贝啊
，其实也是如此，啊，也是如此。因此啊，这个叫呃，能够啊、呃，真正。哎、呃，遵循商业规律，哎、呃，遵循经济规律，啊，这个你中有我，我中有你，才是各行各业企业家应该遵循的发展之路。谢谢。好的，非常感谢蒋希培主席哈。Every sector。今天上午。好，包括今天下午的场次，主要是这个政治家们哈，还有学者、专家们在讨论。So thank you.、Uh, this one is a business roundtable, so know the economic recovery. In the economic recovery, the interpreters、uh, and entrepreneurs have played an important role. There have been、uh, ambassadors calling for non-politicization of、uh, economic issues.、Uh, they talked about、um, multilateral rules for coordinated growth because、um, decoupling and、uh, uncoordinated、um, economic economic activities is a waste. It's not efficient. But,、uh, so thank you very much. Now I take the floor to Mr. Li Xue Hai, Vice Chairman of the C the CCG and、uh, Chairman, Founder, and CEO of White Exchange Group. It has a、um, huge、um, investment in China, in U.S.、Um, and、uh, the rest of the world. So now, Mr. Li, you have the floor. Thank you for、uh, CCG for organizing this、uh, very. Interesting forum. Because your slogan says、uh, to contribute wisdom to to China and the world. I've we've、uh, heard many、uh, in ex ex excellent speeches from ambassadors focusing on global issues. So. My company was formed,、uh, founded in 1981, in the U.S. We've、uh, come across many、uh, economic crises, like the real estate crisis and financial crisis,、uh, and we managed to survive and to develop. In the past, our our business has been increasing. Over the past two or three decades, it's、uh, the, the activities are due to COVID. We're experiencing down some downward pressure. But so the、uh, the topic today is.、Uh, To reset and renew and reinvent, I have a few thoughts to share with you. How we can boost、uh, confidence. A few minutes. It is a family business. Our group. It is a 42 years of history. Confidence is very important. We need we need to take into consideration many elements like technology and、uh, market. Different and these elements vary for different、uh, 
companies. There are short-term factors and long-term factors. So these all affect uh, confidence of uh, enterprises in, in doing business. So for example, our, our business in the US, we, uh, there are some uh, there were business that were easier to do, some were harder. We have uh, logistics, for example. But uh, the wage is uh, becoming higher and higher. The, the minimum wage is uh, more than $10 an hour. Also, uh, if we increase uh, rent and uh, other costs, uh, the, the industry is becoming more difficult. There are more, uh, there are easier industries, however, like uh, re, uh, like uh, big uh, residential areas and uh, big data and data centers. Uh, there are more profitable business. So we are uh, um, diversifying to keep uh, up with the. Uh, market in China we face the need to change real estate uh, office buildings export and import and uh, commercial uh, re real estate uh, and these are these are slowing down flow of investment and uh, debt level it's difficult but uh, the enterprises could uh, adjust themselves for example we have a chat GPT for example, whether we can use ChatGPT to reduce manpower or increase efficiency. These are all um, relevant. Also, uh, commercial real estate that we engage in. Real estate is bad today, but but we uh, have invested in outlets, seven outlets. But uh, the outlets, uh, their business is uh, becoming better because uh, the economy is bad and uh, customers would uh, welcome more sales at uh, of discount products at outlets. So in fact, these uh, they are doing doing better than before. Also uh, online retailing. Uh, the market share is increasing. We have other entertainment businesses so all of these will increase that is for sure we need to consider increasing efficiency using AI and also ESG that's a, another consideration So we need to think about how to update these business when we are facing a general downward pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know that you have been very successful entrepreneur. 
I uh, agree with what you said that uh, there are there are a few uh, uh, industries that are still growing uh, in the uh, in the economic downturn. For example, outlet. Also, there's a uh, AIA, GC, environmental protection that we should uh, pay attention to. So, uh, Lipso. Uh, Roberta Lipso is a vice chairwoman, American Chamber of Commerce in China, founder of the United Family Hospitals. I, I know all the uh, foreign friends here or multinational um, staffs know uh, United Family Hospitals very well. I'm also on the board of the foundation, this charitable one. Uh, so quite impressive uh, um, business as well in China. Um, and uh, Roberta also is the vice chairman of MCM China. So you represented a, a big ch uh, chamber of commerce, which is very active in China as well. You know, you have a strong sense about the uh, foreign investment in China, how to um, stabilize the, the kind of uh, uh, stabilize the expectation and uh, boost the confidence of the foreign investment in China. So for uh, revitalizing the Chinese economy right now, I, I think the, how to boost the confidence of, for those multinational companies is, is very important uh, uh, measure should be taken. So I, I think you, you can see some words about how to boost the confidence. Thank you so much, Mabel. Um, as we all know, too well by now, the economy has slowed. Lots of sectors are hurting. Unemployment, especially youth unemployment, is up. European and American companies have reported lower confidence in the future. They've been concerned by new laws which aren't fully understood related to restrictions on data transfer, genetic material, anti-espionage, and the ability to do due diligence which make it more difficult to do business. With the imposition of new export and investment restrictions, despite the US government's promise of a small yard with a high fence, US companies don't know what they will be allowed to sell and what they can commit to in terms of outbound investment. The converse holds true for outbound Chinese investment as well. The whole world has been looking to the troubled US-China relationship and wondering if further deterioration could lead the world into less peaceful times. Those politics, the COVID pandemic, disappointing economic indicators, as well as recent crackdowns on some US consulting companies have caused some US companies and other multinationals to re-examine their plans for China investment. In fact, we did see a slight drop in realized direct foreign investment in H1 of 2023. At the same time, there are reasons to be confident. China is still the second largest world economy, still growing at 5%. Business does remain strong for many sectors, including the service sector, electric, electric vehicles, new energy, and I'm happy to say the healthcare sector as well. According to the latest AmCham member survey, China continues to be the number one or the number two priority market in many categories, and 40% of our respondents didn't plan to reduce their investment in China, and another 24% still had plans to increase investment. But the results did show a slight more pessimistic outlook than in the past. We believe that the most important trade and investment pro promotion activity is to rebuild confidence and mutual trust. For example, increased economic data transparency and the ability to perform satisfactory due diligence is essential for companies to plow forward on their investment decisions. Recent high-level meetings between both countries' cabinet-level officials have been really encouraging, with four, four, with four secretary-level visits from the U.S. and Minister Wang Wentao's reciprocal visit um, to the U.S. Especially encouraging is the structure for an ongoing commercial working group, as well as an increase in the number of flights between the U.S. and China that was set up during Secretary Raimondo's visit last month. These leadership meetings are so important, and we hope that President Xi will also visit the US in November 
during the APEC meeting. Equally as important are people-to-people -people encounters. More and more U.S. CEOs have visited China in the last two months. The resumption of tourism, student, and academic exchanges are also so essential. We appreciate the long-term impact and restoration of trust engendered by some recently announced policies, including the State Council's 24 points, the NDRC's announcement this month on the new Bureau to support private industry, the extension of the individual income tax pal policy for foreign talents, and the excellent Beijing Two Zones policy, as well as the Greater Bay and Hainan Free Trade Zones. Some of these policies are extremely encouraging, but the speed and manner in which they are implemented will be key. I grew up in the U.S. in the 1960s, at a time when the world was also polarized and primed for war. Every week in my elementary school, we practiced bracing for an air raid. Then suddenly, Nixon visited China, and the narrative changed. Fifty years of increasing peace and prosperity ensued. We can and we should find a way to rebuild trust and change the narrative once again. Thank you to CCG for helping in that endeavor through meetings like this, and congratulations on the important work that you've been doing for the last 15 years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lipson, for your kind words for CCG and the very uh, insightful opinions are about the US-China and about the foreign investment in China. Um, yes, I uh, totally agree with you, especially you mentioned the last part of what you said is that the people-to-people -people exchange on the business side is very, very important. We should have more engagement in China from US, from the foreign communities. Uh, I, I don't think the pandemic is helpful, but right now we are on the process of recovery. We should have more engagement. Uh, this morning and this afternoon, there are three sessions. Also mentioned the engagement itself, our panel itself is a, a way of uh, engagement. I think it's good for business as well. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Lawrence Jean, who is the CCG Senior Council Member, Chairman of Global Service Group at the Deloitte. And Roberta mentioned the uh, consulting companies in China. And I believe that uh, Lawrence, who has been serving for multinational for so many years, must have a lot of experiences to offer as to how to invent the confidence in China. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, and uh, many thanks to all of you. Um, the team that I'm presiding over is um, the uh, governance affairs and the service delivery in Deloitte. And uh, today, I'd like to talk about how to help um, foreign companies to enjoy a better environment in China. And second, and how to help Chinese enterprises going global, especially private companies, to do business and scope up uh, their businesses in international market. And uh, previously, Dr. Wan has alluded to a lot of points, especially in this session. Dr. Miao has mentioned a lot. One is to incentivize. That is uh, 31 measures to incentivize the confidence of enterprises doing business in China. And the second is to create the 24 measures for the multinationals to uh, enjoy better and favorable conditions in China when they're doing business. So let me try to explain these measures better. And more importantly, I think for the decision makers or the policy makers in the government, what are the suggestions that are supposed to be pipeline to them? And what, in what areas can government and the governmental agencies and departments do better? So first of all, talking about the five private companies, this 31 measures, I'd like to list some of that. I don't know how many of the measures could impress you. One is to encourage the com global competitiveness of Chinese enterprises. That is have been clarified as priority in number one measure to incentivize the private sectors to broaden their overseas businesses, to cope with uh, the measures from the BRI, and uh, to honor the local laws and regulations to support uh, themselves into the globalized environment. So what um, is cared most by these enterprises? These are some suggestions that I'm 100% uh, vote for, but 
Let's take a look at the specific points that could be ironed on by the government. First of all, a lot of local governments and their evaluation, the systems of the performance has to be transferred or transformed from just uh, looking for the profits or looking for the money from the uh, sponsors, from the local enterprises, the big ones, of course, to the uh, overall balance the development pattern, especially compete in the international level playing field. Only when Chinese enterprises are winning the battle can China's enterprises at large becoming more and more popular and are doing business in the world. So the local government, especially in the uh, coastal areas, some local government at the coastal areas, they have uh, more sense of uh, pushing their enterprises go further. And the second, a local government can be positive as the leader to lead the Chinese enterprises going global. And uh, during the COVID, I've seen some enterprises being guided by the local government in Zhejiang province, which is also a local uh, coastal uh, government to lead their respective um, companies uh, to go global and trying to find out the investment opportunities. But uh, this is not the generous or general situation in China. That is not a overall situation. I believe that the local government, they have to somehow do their own business and to handle their business well before they make another step to push their companies to go global. They have to, help, they have to look at how to pave the way to create a good environment to nurture their companies to help uh, these companies uh, to do business and to sharpen the ability of profitability before they truly go out. And second, there is a lot of um, multinational enterprises, um, representatives. The multinationals, they encountered a lot of the challenges. First of all, from a single one dimension, China's enterprises, especially EV or vehicle, industry or the home appliance industries are very successful. That is um, the credit taken by a bunch of Chinese enterprises. But of course, when I was talking with the, the senior management from the multinationals, uh, they agree with me that Chinese entrepreneurs really need a very normalized environment to encourage themselves to grow. And in this top 500, I believe they also um, win a lot of battles and navigate a lot of storms all the way to where they are. And to Chinese enterprises, I believe the same truth from the uh, flights. Chinese um, uh, Foreign Affairs Office has uh, issued the measures on the uh, visas, streamlining procedures. This is just a minor matter, but that is a very good signal. And uh, that is not enough, of course. Because for us, when we have the business trip overseas, it used to be rather uh, daunting and uh, very complex procedures to grow through. And uh, at the same time, the laws and the regulations are very unfamiliar to um, a, a lot of uh, foreigners and a foreign sea also. They uh, plan to have their trip in China and uh, to visit China including the computer or mobile phones and electronics could not be taken with them. That is required and requested uh, by Chinese customs um, authority. And it is understandable, especially against this current external environment, if you cannot take your own mobile phone, that would exert huge pressure psychologically to the travelers. And so the understanding of uh, the uh, measures has to be fully um, explained to everyone, and uh, this is something that Chinese government really care about most right now, and uh, for the enterprises from overseas and also the senior management, they, what they care and concern most is that probably some information used to be very normal one when they were taken out of China, but now this information has been um, interpreted as uh, the sensitive information, therefore could not be uh, transferred outside. So I think a lot of um, clarification and interpretation has to be delivered to the enterprises, uh, multinationals. 
So frequent communication is very necessary, and China has um, made a lot of efforts in creating favorable uh, do business environment for multinationals. But still, it is not without problems. And so the procedures is procedure. We have to uh, review, and also we have to study, and we have to um, go back and forth about a certain uh, procedures before we lift it. And uh, some would involve the procedures of the SOEs uh, tendering, and uh, there also involves some commercial or business um, behaviors. And that has to be handled and interpreted as per um, regulations and rules and China's laws. So I think I really call for the um, policy makers uh, to be more understandable and to uh, make their measures more understa understandable to the overseas companies. Thank you, Lawrence from Deloitte. Thank you. Yeah, I see made a lot of uh, very insightful and uh, very objective ideas from the aspect of um, and multinationals. I believe that this current environment, which is rather new, be the 31 measures or 24 measures. Uh, they tackle some pain points to tackle the long-term pain points in terms of the policy makers. We um, can through uh, the think tanks or other channels to handle them well. Giovanni Di Giovanni, who is the chairman of the board of directors, Eni China. We know that Eni China is the um, leading energy company. It's a multinational one. We would like to invite Mr. Giovanni to say some words about this topic. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and uh, let me say uh, congratulations for this uh, fifth anniversary to CCG and. Uh, uh, Thank you to Harry Wong, uh, the President Harry Wong, to invite me. But overall, uh, to uh, maintain uh, this uh, very, very relevant uh, think tank in, uh, in this moment uh, of the world, it's no easy, I know. Uh, in this moment of uh, difficulties, uh, in the moment of uh, uh, very low compression of, uh, of the reason why of the one side of the world, uh, organizations like CCG are very relevant to maintain the bridge uh, from one side and the other side and create opportunity to dialogue and to conversation. So, you know, uh, my company is the sixth largest uh, uh, international uh, energy company in the world and uh, we are in China from a long time. We are here from uh, the 60s. And um, uh, the topic uh, that I am talking uh, about uh, uh, today is the, the business opportunities created by China's energy transformation for foreign enterprises in China. Uh, China is uh, the world's largest energy consumer and carbon emitter country, as you know. Uh, in response of climate change, Chinese government has proposed the goal of uh, carbon peaking and carbon neutrality for 2030 and 2060. It's a very big deal, it's a very big achievement. This will promote the transformation of China's energy structure from fossil energy to renewable energy. In the Chinese market, we are witnessing a magnificent energy transformation process in these days. In this transformation, China is not only committed to achieving sustainable development, but also bringing unprecedented opportunities to foreign enterprises around the world. I would like to take uh, ENI's important energy transition pillar as an example, or obviously I'm talking about uh, biofuels. First, China aviation fuel consumption is huge and growing rapidly. Driven by the dual carbon goal and influenced by the overseas emission reduction systems, it is a general trend for China to develop biofuels, mainly biodiesel and biojet fuel. The means, <coughs> this means that uh, there is a huge demand on uh, biojet fuels market, providing broad market opportunities for a biojet fuel supplier and home and abroad. Secondly, China aviation fuel suppliers, such as Sinopec, for example, 
have begun to try and produce biojet fuels on a large scale. Sinopec uses a gutter oil as a raw material and adopt the hydrogenations on fats on oils route to produce biojet fuel product and has passed the certification of a sustainable biomaterials roundtable becoming a first company in Asia to obtain this certification. This marks that China's biojet fuels industry has entered a new stage of development and will further promote the expansion of the biojet fuel market. In addition, biojet fuel is cheaper to produce because it uses renewables biomass feedstocks that are widely available in the nature and are obviously cheap. Uh, the low cost makes uh, biojet fuel competitive in the market and may become the main force of aviation fuels in the future. Finally, with the increasing of global demand for renewable energy and the pressure from overseas emission reduction systems, biojet fuel has uh, broad market pro prospects uh, not only in China but also around the world. Therefore, China's uh, biomass jet fuels market has uh, huge opportunities. The attractive investment environment uh, and the broad market prospects make this fuel, fuel a business opportunity. However, although there are obvious opportunities in China's biomass jet fuel market, there are also challenges. For example, issues such as uh, collection, conversion and transportation of biomass feedstocks needs to be addressed. In addition, the production of technology of biojet fuel needs to be further improved to achieve large-scale production and improve production efficiency. At the same time, policy support and tax incentives <laughs> are also crucial to the development of the biofuel market. In general, China biomass jet fuel market has both opportunities and challenges. However, with the continuous advance of technology and continuous policy support, we have reason to believe that this market will have a greater development space and potentials. Both challenges and opportunities always exist for every kind of energy. In China, foreign enterprises also face some development obstacles. For example, policy changes, market access and technical barriers and other issues are in front of us. In order to overcome these challenges, foreign enterprises need to pay close attention to China's policy trends and have a deep understanding of the market dynamics and actively conduct technology research and development. At the same time, foreign companies can also innovate according to the local conditions based on the needs of a Chinese market to adapt to changing market environment. Next, I would like to share some specific strategies of foreign founded enterprises. These companies have demonstrated keen insight and excellent uh, protocol capabilities in China's energy transformation progress. For example, for foreign companies uh, choose to invest uh, in new factories to make uh, full use of China's abundant clean energy resources and uh, favorable policy environment. Some companies as a shift their research and development focus on the field or a new energy to comply with the trend green development. There are also many companies that choose the strength and cooperation with domestic renewable energy companies to jointly promote technological progress and market expansion. In short, China's energy transformation has brought unlimited opportunities for foreign enterprises in China. In this process, foreign enterprises can not only expand their own business, but also contribute to China's sustainable development. Let us work together to promote a green, clean, and sustainable energy in the future. Thank you very much to everybody.
Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Giovanni. Your great speech. Uh, 下面呢，我们想募到这个呃，彭宁科先生哈，他是 S N A M 中国。Next, I'd、uh, give the floor to Mr. Peng Ningke, board member and、uh, senior vice president of、uh, Snap China. It is a big、uh, infrastructure company in Europe. So. And because uh, we have uh, uh, we have limited time, maybe uh, you could uh, speak for about three minutes. Thank you.、Uh, it's a good、uh, round table. I think that、uh, globalization and climate change are closely linked together. We have、uh, been listening to many excellent speeches. So. So、uh, climate change is very serious, yes, and whether we have been doing enough,、uh, of course not. So, from the perspective of an energy company, let me share with you my views. Whether there is a a, an, a way for us to control or even reverse climate change, from our perspective, I think that the answer is yes, because as Giovanni,、uh, Mr. Di Giovanni said. Though natural gas is、uh, is a fossil fuel, but、uh, it's the cleanest fossil fuel. Also, biomethane. It's it's completely green.、Uh, wind to solar. Also, hydrogen. We believe that、uh, hydrogen might be the ultimate solution. So,、uh, from in our perspective. To realize this、uh, transition from、uh, fossil fuel to green fuel, it it is、uh, techni tec technically and、uh, commercially viable. So the answer is definitely yes. In 1905, Max Weber said, "In the spirit of capitalism," he said, "Well." 在我看来呢，可能比如说今天我们用这个，还用这个天然气这样的这个化石能源，可能就是。So in my view that、uh, that、uh, it is necessary for us to ensure both the present and the future. Of course, there are challenges. The biggest challenge is、uh, that our market must be open. There shouldn't be much、uh, barriers. We need to break down unnecessary regulations instead of、uh, over regulation. And over the past three years of、uh, COVID,、uh, it uh, presented uh, a lot of challenges to our entrepreneurs. And now that COVID is behind us, we are free to seize the opportunities. We think that uh, the uh, disadvantages, disadvantages、uh, thing for us is the、uh, political barriers, and though we we are entrepreneurs, we、uh, I, we we believe that、uh, politicians have the wisdom to to address these、uh, issues and.、Oh. In his book on the brink,、uh, Paulson said, "Actually, ultimately, the market will win." So I think, facing climate change, facing energy transition, with such a huge so、um, in terms of this、uh, huge uh, challenge, uh, we have a hundred and a、um, trillion、uh, U.S. dollars worth of、uh, world economy. So uh, uh, there is uh, the, the the world economy is is、um, absolutely capable of、uh, addressing the the carbon challenges. We need international cooperation between China and EU, China and the US. As long as there is、uh, technological companies,、uh, they can participate in market、uh, competition. So long as there is demand,、uh, there will be、uh, 
um, an enterprise to satisfy that demand. So uh, I believe that uh, and the confidence comes from this uh, this aspect. Uh, Bill Gates uh, said uh, in his book that uh, if we can seize the opportunities to do today choice uh, 2023 time is still enough for us to grab this opportunity we have a choice to make but maybe if we don't take this choice it's too it, it's going to be too late for us to take the choice tomorrow 好我就讲到这里谢谢 Thank you. Our discussion today has been revolving around climate change. It's an urgent issue. It is a, it is a choice for all of us. So we'll have um, input from uh, entrepreneurs and uh, politicians alike. I give the floor to Madam uh, Wang Tsong, Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications of Novozymes APAC. Novozymes is in a, a, a biopharmaceutical company. Thank you for this opportunity of sharing. The topic today is Reset, Renew and Reinvent. So on one hand, I'd like to share with you uh, the new poles of uh, growth and uh, also I'd like to share with you our uh, the challenges. For example, Mr. Jin has uh, raised a few uh, problems that, uh, that uh, foreign companies face. So I'll be focusing more on uh, industry-specific uh, growth poles, double times as a provider of uh, bio solutions. Our products are used in uh, more than 130 um, countries. We use uh, microbes and enzymes to help industrial clients to reduce emission, to help our agricultural clients to increase their output, to, incre uh, to help our consumer um, goods producers to increase the quality, the quality of their products. So, uh, there's a bio manufacturing. This is uh, what we do. So for China, uh, at the present, the opportunities uh, lie in the following aspects. The first is uh, a green transition. So for the, our discussion today have been revolving around uh, uh, the challenges and opportunities um, against the backdrop of uh, carbon peak and carbon neutrality. A biopharmaceutical is, uh, is in itself, uh, by definition, uh, sustainable. So I believe that uh, we'll be able to make more uh, contributions. For example, we have been uh, helping uh, conventional um, Industries uh, like ta uh, paper making and uh, tanning in factories to in help them reduce use of chemicals, uh, water, and emissions of carbon dioxide. As I was seeing that uh, uh, this is a very good opportunity uh, for bio uh, pharmaceutical bio uh, manufacturers. And second, we see new demands in the market uh, that is. We satisfy part of the demand in the market, especially currently in China, be it in the urbanization where it poses the uh, high requirement for the high quality livelihood or for the senior citizens who requires uh, more proteins and uh, more nutrition or for the young people who look for the uh, individualized uh, and personalized uh, uh, lifestyle. So these are the demands that we see as opportunity. And the third one is that as uh, a leading company in this segment, we have to look into the future for uh, business opportunities. Right now, our company has been dedicated in some uh, frontier areas development, especially to revitalize the uh, market 
uh, where the uncertainties are roaming around, we think definitely we need to invest. And uh, 20 years ago, in the uh, biomass to um, alcohol production, we uh, started uh, the research and uh, development investment into this realm uh, when it was uh, in the beginning. And right now, this technology has become so sophisticated. And then we're looking forward to the new development and the new technologies uh, to provide uh, more materials and a new space uh, for the livelihood of uh, more species. And uh, like, for example, the uh, synthesized uh, protein and uh, artificial um, plants. So all in all, in um, or uh, areas in this industry, we see nothing but opportunity. Of course, uh, in some other occasions, we can talk about the problems. But uh, in nature, we have to see more opportunities in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. Last, last but not least, I'd like to invite uh, Madame Zheng Yali, who is the director of the strategy making. Department, China Society of Auto uh, Automotive uh, Engineers, because today we're talking about only the domestic companies, but also multinationals. But at the same time, uh, talking about the resilience and recovery of the world economy, China's economy, we could not uh, spare the um, going global companies from China. So yes, we have seen some investigation against Chinese uh, EV companies. And that would also influence a lot in Chinese um, uh, vehicle enterprises. So I have a question. I is going to uh, Ms. Zhen, who is uh, from uh, a very, she is an uh, expert on this field. Uh, she's from the, um, she's a director of the strategic planning department, China Society of Automotive engineers. Uh, we know that the European Commission has recently launched their investigation, investigation into Chinese electric vehicles. What is the possible impact that the investigation will bring to the China's electric vehicles manufacturers? manufacturers? Those people, those people as also a group of people also about the uh, Chinese private sector or the Chinese companies going global, they are very important part of our economic recovery. So, uh, so next question is regarding the EV. So the question is addressed to Ms. Jen. So first of all, many thanks to the chair, Madame Miao, and I'm very happy to attend this um, round table. First of all, to answer the question regarding the investigation, initiated by UN Commission. So talking about the carbon issue, actually this is uh, the uh, common problem faced by all uh, vehicle companies, especially for EV companies in China. Starting point for Chinese enterprises in EV production is also aiming to low carbon development as a future trend. And uh, for China, we will do innovation by ourselves, of course. So that is the principle. And second, talking about the green development and uh, low carbon uh, transition, China and the world, the core issue in front of us is to cooperate or uh, anything else. I think uh, cooperation is the mainstream. And the vehicle industry is a globalized industry. The global market requires us uh, to be cooperative. And second, um, talking about the think tank for the automotive engineers at the national level, at the industrial level, we have to more to uh, manage and control the carbon. For example, some carbon footprints, management systems, regulations and laws and legislations from the EU or the database repository development. And we have to intensify the cooperation in all of these fields with the EU, with the European countries, to make the um, low carbon synergy systems of the vehicle industry more and more transparent. And I think uh, talking about this issue, I'd like to share with you my viewpoints. For the multinational vehicle companies, especially the joint venture, is always the uh, major momentum for Chinese um, automotive industry from zero to one and from one all the way to where we are. So uh, in the process of the industry development, so it also creates the business opportunities and also benefits to the multinationals as well. 
So it's fair to say that for the industrial chain development, the companies of nurturing and the standard making and the industrials um, values creation, these are all the bases and the contributions. So I think uh, right now, from the traditional uh, vehicles compared to international arena, we are actually ahead of uh, the uh, international arena. And in the future, for the uh, intelligent technologies development for the vehicle industry, we believe that we still have to cooperate with international counterparts. But uh, we also can see some deglobalization risks against this background. When we are looking at the domestic environment, opening up is uh, very important, especially we have to encourage the development of the uh, businesses from overseas. And in the next step, we must exert the completeness of um, the uh, uh, industrial chain in China for the vehicle industry to create better business environment and uh, to introduce better talents and uh, innovate uh, the uh, management system to coordinate with the international arena. And also the association like us like to make ourselves as a bridge to facilitate the communication, dissemination, implementation of the policies to guide the enterprises from overseas and the domestic companies to communicate further with each other, to incentivize the mutual trust between each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Jen. It, this topic is uh, very commonly concerned as well, so that's why we invite you to talk about this issue. So now I'd like to conclude. And uh, two representatives, um, just two representatives to summarize due to time constraint. First of all, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Jiang as a Chinese uh, enterprises representative. And then I'd like to invite Roberta as a multinational company. And, uh, I would like to invite uh, Miss Roberta to say some words to conclude today's event. So firstly, so, Chairman Jiang, one minute for one person. China's uh, private sectors, private economy account for six, uh, seven, eight, and nine percent. Actually, private sectors are the um, sectors uh, belonging to the civil um, environment or the civil society, I believe. Although the challenges are daunting and numerous, but in the future, market will be definitely the dominant driving forces to allocate resources which rely on the legislation, which is also aspired by uh, the all human beings and uh, the citizens of China for better life. And I believe with that, we can live better life. Thank you very much. Very positive message. And I can feel your confidence as well. First of all, we have to trust, and then we can rely on this trust. So, Roberta. Uh, oh. So, Roberta, then, maybe, I'm so maybe from you then. Howard, okay. no problem. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, so, based on the message from this morning and this afternoon's panel, In order to win the general recovery of the economy, governments play a role, enterprises shall pay a role, and so each one of us would play the role. The government has to readjust some of the uh, internal policies to incentivize the confidence of the enterprises at home and abroad and uh, to encourage consumption in the market and the uh, international relations also right now in shortage of trust to this end um, all leaders of the government of all countries shall make an effort talking about the responsibility shared by all enterprises individuals has to consider sustainability of the growth especially the global warming low carbon and carbon abatement are the issues on the shoulders of all. So looking to the future, we must be more positive and more energetic on that. Thank you. So, Ms. Lee. 
private sectors include uh, foreign investment and the uh, foreign Chinese companies because 60 million overseas Chinese are living outside and uh, more than 2 million uh, businesses and uh, more than 100,000 leading companies overseas. So with the 40 years of the development, these uh, overseas Chinese enterprises have done a lot of contributions to the modernization of China and reform and opening up. Right now, the pressure very daunting and very strenuous because right now the funding of uh, the overseas market are still wait and see. So for the overseas um, Chinese entrepreneurs to invest in China, they claimed a lot of uh, human resources and relations and the funding resources. So I believe they must have a role to play in contributing to the recovery of China's economy. Thank you. Oh, many thanks to all of you due to time constraints so much for today's um, second uh, session in the afternoon. And we have invited the Chinese enterprises, multinationals, and also the uh, representatives from uh, European enterprises and uh, US enterprises to discuss on the same topic. I uh, believe right now everything is seeing the downward pressure for everyone, and I have repeated, yes, we have to build up neutral trust, which also have been mentioned by the previous chair of the previous session. This trust not only comes from between the countries, but also coming from the uh, civil society, from the enterprises as well, and uh, from the different market entities, and all of us has to shoulder this responsibility to build up the shared trust to make it more transparent and to make it more sustainable, to make it more st stable when it comes to the policy. Like Pre Chairman John mentioned that the legal environment shall be more transparent so as to push forward the mutual trust-based market development for all, for all companies. And today we have invited uh, the experts from the government talking about the uh, geopolitical issues the ambassadors and also the uh, officials from Chinese government, and I, finally, the uh, um, local government uh, and the uh, central government measures on how to incentivize the confidence in the market. And uh, we've been talking about the measures and the policies and uh, also the innovations from the enterprises themselves. Well, right now, the recovery after the COVID, the trust is uh, ebbing against this uh, environment, what we have to do is to uh, better off the economy, to incentivize uh, the confidence of the uh, people, the uh, sense of security is coming from the security of the economy and the confidence of uh, uh, living a very good life by all the people. Thank you for important the key issue is economic recovery. It's uh, the most priority for the development and for the Nation, the for national security and the global governance. Thank you all. Thank you very much. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Our fifth and final session is on the Belt and Road Initiative. To start, let's warmly welcome Dr. Zhang Jinglian, who is Vice President, CCG, and also Head of Research at CCG, to do the CCG report launch, the 10th anniversary of BRI, Review, Outlook, and Multilateralized Development. Let's warmly welcome her. Ladies and gentlemen, now on behalf of uh, the CCG team, I'm going to launch the report, uh, the 10th anniversary of the BRI Review Outlook and Multilateralized Development. So we have uh, uh, separated the development over the past 10 years into into three stages. Uh, the, the first stage was uh, building framework since uh, 2013. On uh, October the 3rd, 
President Xi Jinping first mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative in his speech at the Indonesian Parliament. In uh, May 2017, the first International Cooperation Summit, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative was held, um, putting forward the uh, formal framework of cooperation. By the end of uh, 2017, the Belt and Road Initiative was uh, incorporated into the statute of the CPC. The second stage is from 2017 to 2019. So we have uh, multiple infrastructure programs being implemented. All parties start to engage in, in cooperation. The uh, the first uh, CIIE was held in 2018. At the in December the third, 2017, at the fourth World Internet Conference, the initiative was uh, incorporated in the uh, documents of that conference. The third stage is from 2019 to 2023, during which we have witnessed the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite that, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative cooperation has remained resilient. Uh, trade with uh, the relevant uh, countries has increased from 29.3% in 2019 to 32.9% in 2022. For example, uh, we also seeing uh, in between uh, in the RCEP that uh, came into effect uh, on Ju January the first, twenty twenty two, China started negotiation to uh, to join the DEPA and uh, is uh, preparing to join CPTPP. Also, uh, with uh, global. Doorway and uh, B3W. We're now seeing a chorus of uh, infrastructure uh, development uh, initiatives. Second, um, the aspect of uh, connectivity, uh, mutual learning, and uh, trade and economic cooperation. And people-to-people uh, -people exchanges. These are the four main uh, parts of uh, BRI cooperation and the uh, ten suggestions of CCG. The first is to establish a multiple multilateral cooperation center of BRI uh, in the following the pattern of uh, the ACC to provide guidance And the second is to establish a multilateral guiding committee or international consultant committee of the Burton Road. And third is to establish uh, an international cooperation organization to dovetail with uh, existing regional uh, mechanisms and uh, in organizations and uh, rules. And the fourth is to build a, a four-party uh, platform to connect with B3 Dublin Global Gateway. To increase uh, global in, uh, input in infrastructure. In fact, is uh, following uh, the example of G20 and APEC, we can hold the uh, Belgian Road uh, International Cooperation Summit uh, alternately in in willing countries and seeks is to establish a international development bank alliance under the guidance of the AIIB and in conjunction with World Bank and ADB. Also 
will also encourage um, private capital to take part in this effort. And seventh, we will uh, seek to join the Paris Club uh, prudently to seek coordinating the sustainable re uh, solutions for debtors in uh, payment difficulties to ward off external debt risks and ensure global financial stability. And the eighth is to establish an international alliance of enterprises for uh, information exchange and uh, business exchange. And the ninth is to establish a online service platform for professional talents building the Belgian Road. We need to establish a database and assist systemic service systems for to facilitate enterprises in looking for uh, appropriate international talents and also help professionals find uh, partners or uh, platforms. We encourage uh, China and relevant countries to uh, pr promote these, encourage more uh, exchange students and uh, scholarship programs. And uh, Think Tank Plus on uh, Belt and Road mechanism and other multilateral mechanisms to conduct a regular think tank summit forum seminars and to build up the uh, uh, brands for the think tank mechanism. So many thanks for all of you. This is the end of my report. And this is the QR code. You can uh, scan the QR code and uh, you can join in the discussion of uh, the report and uh, download the report. Thank you, Dr. Chen. With that, we will move to the uh, roundtable of uh, BRI with the theme of multi-stakeholder engagement for global development. What will be the next uh, decade bring? The chair will be the vice president and the senior fellow of CCG, former managing director of uh, DXC Technology Greater China, Mike Liu. Roundtable. Multi-stakeholder engagement for global development. What will the next decade bring? Let's warmly welcome Vice President and Senior Fellow, Center for China and Globalization, and also former Managing Director, DXC Technology Greater China, Mike Liu, to chair the session. Many thanks to Dr. Zhen for such an informative sharing on the research from CCG on BRI. So I'd like to take this opportunity briefly share with you some uh, figure. This is the 10th anniversary of a BRI proposal and uh, more than 150 countries and many international organizations signed the documents with China on BRI. Bilateral trade volume surpassed um, 170 billion USD. And uh, it is estimated that by 2030, from the uh, current uh, trade zone, we have created 420,000 job opportunities by 2030. We will create the opportunities for 7.6 million to live out of um, poverty, absolute poverty, and moderate poverty, and um, so the livelihood of the people living along the Belt and Road will be better off. I know this is um, this year is um, the tenth anniversary of the proposal of BRI of China. So next month we are going to hold the conference for BRI. One hundred and ten countries show their willingness to attend the meeting. And uh, today I'm very honored to welcome the distinguished guests to share with us their viewpoints regarding the industry policies, the practices and experiences from BRI implementation, as well as the next step of development of BRI going forward due to time constraints. Without further ado, I'd like to invite the first speaker. President of the China Association for International Economic Cooperation, Ms. Gao Yuanyuan. Ms. Gao Yuanyuan has um, very fruitful experience in the economic and trade realms, and 
Okay, used to she used to be the uh, the economic counselor of um, China to Italy embass uh, embassy, and in 2022 all the way to now, he served as the president of uh, CAFIEC. The floor is uh, yours, Ms. Gao. Please share with us your experiences that you have witnessed during the past 10 years and your expectations in the future. Thank you. Thank you for CCG's invitation and thank you, Mike Liu. After one whole year, uh, one whole day of discussion, I have learned a lot. Yeah, this year is the um, 10th anniversary of a BRI proposal, so to reflect the past 10 years and look into the future in coming 10 years. And previously, we can see from the information from the last report by CCG regarding the BRI figure sharing. I was pretty much impressed, uh, but I will be very concise. Some of my experiences and impressions. For a long time, I was engaged in international trade cooperation and uh, ODI, uh, as um, named by the international arena. And I've been visiting um, South Africa and African countries and uh, Latin America, uh, Asian countries, to witness the status of the developing countries. And the poorest country, the uh, developing countries, and the least developed countries are the areas that I frequently visited. And I have witnessed uh, how poor they are, how daunting the situation were, and their lack of the drinking water. And there are a lot of uh, barriers for their development. The basic conditions are in shortage for the livelihood, maintenance, the supportive facilities, and the conditions for the industrial development are also very fragile. When the disasters are encountered by them. Their ability to withstand these disasters are very vulnerable, very weak. Usually they would in great need of uh, um, human assistance. And uh, I've been engaged in UNDP, FAO, WFP, OECD, and um, the consultations of the official negotiation mechanisms. And I feel that the mission could be shared. Faced with uh, the current disparities between the North and South, poor and rich, a single country could not conquer all of these problems or provide any single solutions by itself. So. The uh, solutions has to be integrating the different development factors to synergize all of these uh, factors to create the uh, conglomeration of the momentum. In 2013, President Xi Jinping proposed the BRI. To summarize it is um, to implement the new concept of development, coordinated development, Green development shared by all. And the five connectivities. Connectivity in terms of the policies, infrastructure, trade, funding, and minds of the people. In 2013, when President Xi proposed this uh, initiative all the way to 2021, I was working in European country, and I deeply felt that uh, from the uh, development of the uh, foundation to the uh, development um, of uh, the preliminary results, the prosperity shared by all, and uh, the win-win development platform from the beginning all the way to now. I've been engaged in some of the conferences, seminars regarding BRI, and also have um, witnessed the reflections and feedbacks from the uh, Italian society on the BRI. And uh, actually, we've done a lot in the promotion and dissemination of the message of this initiative. 
like the six uh, corridors and the six roads, the uh, connections of the different construction uh, uh, infrastructure would generate new momentum. And we proposed uh, to develop the AIB and the Silk Road funds, uh, provide the funding modalities for BRI projects. We push forward the um, projects regarding education, sports, and poverty alleviation, and so on and so forth in these uh, BRI countries, deepen the um, friendship between the people in these countries and the regions. And uh, I've been engaged in the um, official development initiative uh, or mechanism for a long time, and we believe the connectivities in all aspects has been fully implemented step by step, milestone by milestone, since um, the beginning of this initiative, and um, which is um, uh, for the benefit of uh, the livelihood, better off of the people along the Belt and Road, and to better off uh, the uh, cooperation in terms of uh, the businesses and the trade among the countries. And uh, we have seen a tremendous effect created from this uh, initiative. I think common development as a concept had been demonstrated and deepened in the minds of the people step by step, day by day, during our daily cooperation. So in 2021, uh, there is uh, Many uh, some years ago, the um, uh, UN has proposed uh, the SDG 2030 agenda, which is uh, also uh, in the same boat, on the same page with uh, BRI and uh, President Xi. Also, previously proposed the uh, GDI, emphasizing healthy and uh, green development of the world, which can contribute to the accelerated growth towards the uh, realization of the uh, 2030 agenda of UN. So I firmly support the uh, position of UN and influence of UN in the international arena. So right now, we are in the midst of uh, the changes which is not seen in the century. We can see the geopolitical conflicts, and that is obvious, and uh, the globalization, some counter currents against the globalization and the recovery of the economy are very sluggish. The supply chain are shocked. Developing countries right now, the poverty alleviation also quite challenged to attain the uh, SDGs of UN. The way ahead of us is full of bumps. And we have to face the challenges squarely. Uh, faced with this very complex environment, President Xi mentioned that we must uh, come from the original intention of a BRI proposal to explore the uh, common development as our perspectives for not only us but also our neighboring countries and all to create the road of uh, happiness shared by all. So we are looking to the future. Or during the 14th five-year plan period, we already proposed the concept of high-quality development as the main core, and uh, to push forward the sustainable of the uh, green growth. So high-quality development, we must um, still insist in the principles of consultation, sharing, and uh, co-development to formulate new connotations of BRI in the future. For example, previously you mentioned the big topic is about grain and grain development. So BRI also include the uh, grain development like the solar power, PV power, and so, uh, wind power as um, the uh, bullet points to work on. And uh, China is uh, quite strong uh, at all of these areas in terms of the exports, for example. So I believe that all of these efforts can generate the uh, growth momentum to transform the energy structure to win green development for all the countries along this road. And a digital transformation like 5G utilization or BEIDO are all the new directions of uh, connectivities and connotations of BRI through three years of fight against COVID. 
from battling against uh, a single virus all the way to develop the full-fledged health or uh, public health system. And uh, not only the green uh, way of development, but also the green development, uh, blue development, like the uh, maritime sustainable development, and the uh, incumbent international norms and regulations. And uh, these are the norms and regulations that we have to uh, conform to. And uh, we have to respect each other and respect the current international rules and regulations, costumes of the different cultures and uh, different norms and also different rules combined together. As a background, the BRI must be root by law, root by rule, for the better uh, communication and connectivity. So we talk about high quality growth in Belt and Road Initiative. It exceeds um, bridge building and road building, the, these tangible projects. It's becoming more uh, multi-tiered and diverse, which needs new plans and resolutions of uh, global governance. Also, uh, talent training and capacity building. One of the major assistance, way of assistance is um, human resources. This is uh, very uh, important. We have signed agreement with more than 152 countries. Some even don't have uh, different uh, have language, different languages, and different cultures. So we need uh, training, human resources cooperation to strengthen the exchange and the cooperation. So uh, climate change and other elements are reshaping international rules. China advocates multilateralism and reform of the uh, global governance system and contributes its share in building a more fair and equal global governance system. I believe that uh, the global community of shared future calls for peace and uh, development, whether it's uh, developed or developing countries, so we need to move uh, towards each other, and thank you. Thank you very much for... Hadi Tahola. Hadi is an Indonesian-Korean diplomat. He joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia in 2002. And uh, Hadi has uh, accumulated rich work experience related to foreign affairs, especially handle bilateral relations between Indonesia and the countries in East Asia region. So given this uh, time, uh, can you just uh, keep uh, very brief uh, within three minutes? And the uh, floor is yours, Hadi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mike. Thank you for the opportunity and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Hadi. I'm from uh, the ASEAN China Center. So allow me to uh, respond to your question, Mr. Mike, uh, from the perspective of uh, ASEAN-China relations. As we know that uh, ASEAN-China relations is very close, very strong, very robust. And in fact, uh, China has become the largest trading partner for ASEAN, at least for the uh, last 13 years. So for, 
for ASEAN, China is uh, not only uh, neighbor, not only friend, but uh, China also a strong partner for Indonesia. And uh, but the question is, uh, what about the, the BRI? Do ASEAN countries really need the BRI? Is BRI really important for ASEAN countries? I think to answer these questions, at least it's my perspective as an ASEAN people, I'm Indonesian, so I think the answer of this question is yes, def definitely yes. ASEAN countries need BRI. Why? Simply because most of ASEAN countries are developing countries. Uh, all of us, ASEAN countries need to build, to build the infrastructure, uh, connectivity, to link cities, to link areas within the country and to link them with the international uh, market. But the problem is uh, most of us, most of developing countries, we don't have money. We don't have uh, financing. Uh, so we need uh, we need uh, financing from outside, from other countries. In the past, uh, most of the financing, infrastructure financing, uh, were coming from uh, developed countries, from uh, Western countries, from institutions like uh, World Bank, like IMF. But now, our fellow developing countries, our friend, our neighbor, our strong partners, which is China, come to us and offer us with the financing of infrastructure. So. I think this is why uh, most of uh, ASEAN countries uh, widely welcome, widely open the doors for the BRI. Uh, now the, the next question is, uh, is there any opposition? Is there any concerns about the BRI? And the answer of this question is yes. There is still some concerns, some uh, opposition of the BRI. Whether you like or not, there is still some view, uh, negative view, or even uh, negative sentiment on the BRI. Uh, for example, uh, some view, some view, it's not, not usually it's not the government view, but uh, other uh, element of the country. The, the view is that uh, BRI is only, uh, what is that, uh, the, uh, the trap for the recipient countries, for the participating country. They said that uh, China only bring that to trap the country, to control the, con the, 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 the participating country. So, debt trap. Debt trap is uh, one of the concerns. And the other concern is uh, some view that, uh, that uh, BRI is used by China to control, to dominate the region and countries beyond the region. So I think this is the big homework, uh, big task for Chinese government to overcome, to address this, uh, this uh, concerns properly. Uh, uh, how, how to overcome this uh, or to address this uh, problem? I think China should uh, improve the transparency. China should uh, uh, build the trust, the confidence among the countries in the region. And if uh, China could address this uh, problem or this concern properly, I believe that uh, BRI will even more widely accepted, welcome by uh, countries in the region. And uh, I do believe that uh, if this could be addressed properly, uh, BRI will contribute to, to a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Hedy. Uh, that's a very uh, the comprehensive view, and uh, I'm sure your role with uh, ASEAN China will definitely push forward this initiative. Next, let me uh, invite next distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Harvey Dodding. Uh, Dr. Dodding is a former vice president of uh, ABC Television in New York. And he is a senior fellow uh, of the Center for China and Globalization. Uh, Dr. Dodding was appointed by U.S. President Jimmy Carter as his lawyer on presidential committee. Uh, American Biography Institute recently named Dr. Dodding one of the uh, 
great thinker of 21st century. Dr. Todding, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike, and a warm thanks to Henry, to Mabel, and the very hardworking staff for an incredible day. Uh, I learned so much. Peter Drucker, a famous Austrian US management guru, said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And that's exactly what President Xi Jinping has done uh, with BRI, or then called Idai Lu, um, in his first months of becoming the Chinese leader a decade ago. Of course, there were many doubters, but they were wrong. Uh, one observer got it right. Um, a veteran diplomat and president of the China Foreign Affairs University said that uh, OBOR was perhaps the most important initiative in China's history of 5,000 storied years. Tragically, uh, this diplomat died in a car accident in 2016 before his prediction could become clear and uh, fully realized. Today, there are multiple BRIs beyond the original. As we've heard already, the green Silk Road, the digital Silk Road, and um, there's more to come. They say that imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. And um, BRI has plenty of potential imitators. Trump had his half-assed plan, which was, uh, I call it, BRI Ultra Light. Then Biden has his uh, Build Back Better World. And the EU has its uh, gateway. Competition is good, but I don't think China has anything to wor worry about. So how about the next 10 years of BRI? With a decade of experience and learning, China has polished its BRI model to a very bright shine. And combined with President Xi's Global Civilization Initiative, BRICS Plus, uh, RCEP, and potentially Trans-Pacific Partnership, the prediction of the diplomat Wu Jiamin um, is poised uh, to become a reality. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Heavy. That's uh, very inspirational, uh, very insightful uh, remarks. 下面我有请那个下一位那个那个嘉宾。Next, I'd like to invite Mr. Lin Hong, Vice President of Hua Chiao University. He's also head of the uh, International Relations School. Is a member of the advisory council to the overseas uh, Chinese Federation of the State Council. He also has uh, many other titles, so the floor is yours, Mr. Ling. First of all, I send uh, many thanks for CCG to invite me to join this high level, profound, diversity, inclusive uh, forum to discuss the most important topic. Uh, although uh, this is the last section, everybody is very tired, but I think it's very important because I think the BRI is the most uh, uh, important international public good in uh, current stage. Just as Mr. Harvey Jordan mentioned, uh, the. BRI is the most project in the human history. Uh, I am from the Hua Chao University. Uh, my university uh, is served the more than 60 million overseas Chinese. Uh, and the 40 million distribute uh, in the BRI area. So, uh, and the uh, we, we all know the overseas Chinese is a very, uh, have great uh, resource. For example, uh, almost have uh, five trillion dollar 
is uh, occupied by the overseas Chinese enterprise. And uh, uh, three million is in the, uh, is distributed in the BRI area. So I think the overseas Chinese uh, play a very important role in the BRI. And uh, this year, we see the 10th anniversary of BRI. Uh, I think the next decade is more important for BRI. Uh, just a uh, next section topic mentioned, uh, the question is what will the next decade bring? I, I think my answer is the next decade is golden. It's golden decade for BRI. Why say so? We, we all know the, uh, in the CPC 20 Congress report, uh, we say we should high quality to develop BRI in the next decade. Uh, what is uh, high quality mean? I think uh, from Chinese perspective, it is two things. One is do more better or say it more better, I think. Uh, I think uh, I have two points to, uh, to, to say what is the high quality. The first one, I think the next uh, decades, I think the BRI uh, is, a, is a very important key to resolve the international society crisis or challenges we face. Uh, we all know uh, today we found a profound changes unseen in our century. And uh, these changes is speed up in recent years because we all know the pandemic and uh, Russia invade uh, Ukraine and so on. I think it's even trigger or speed up the, the, the dramatic change for the uh, international situation. And I think that, that today we face more uncertain uh, security. And, and it, yeah, so how to solve the problem? I think the BRI is a very important key. Just as the ambassador of Germany this morning saying, uh, the global challenger need a global solution. So I think BRI is a global solution to solve the global, secure, uh, the global security issue. And, uh, and, and the second point, I think, uh, I think the BRI entered the next decade. I think from the China, China, China perspective, we besides to, to do the thing, we do the first decade just as building, building, building. But I think a large important thing we should to, to sum up some value, some value, just as uh, we have the common value of human society. For example, uh, such as the uh, extensive consolidation, joint contribution, and uh, shared benefit. And uh, we should have the peace, development, and fair justice, uh, democracy and freedom, and so on. I think this is value is is the common value of the human being. So I think BRI should to, to spread to how to say to uh, to spread this value more to the world. Last but not least, I'd like to talk about my own experience in Chinese. A case. to showcase my aspiration about the future uh, human being society. About five years ago, I was um, in Panama, which is um, in America continent. Panama is uh, like the bridge of the transport because uh, the canal in Panama is connecting Atlant Atlantic Ocean and Pacific Road Ocean. And I, when I was visiting this uh, country, and um, with me, there is a Chinese company in the BRI programs. And uh, this company is located um, at the uh, bank of uh, the Panama Canal. 
who is supposed to construct a 15 tons of uh, the ship for a certain a client in Panama. We know that the capacity of the transportation has been actually lifted or increased from only 5 tons to 10 tons all the way to 15 tons after the canal was cleared. But when the canal was constrained and no ships could get through, then the company was running a port and uh, I was visiting that port and uh, I have uh, seen a building which is made of concrete and I was curious what it is. And the people receiving me told me that 20 years ago this was um, a um, weapons reservoir of uh, a U.S. military forces. But now it has become the uh, warehouse of uh, the concrete and the steel materials for China because 20 years ago it was uh, for the ammunition storage of uh, American military force but of course by that time it was uh, for the purpose of um, international order guarantee but now it also for the purpose of uh, human beings orders guarantee so it is an option up to human beings what is the development and what is the defini definition of a future development it is um, the option in our hand thank you president it is really um, informative um, uh, story including uh, your own experience your anecdote which broaden our viewpoints. And uh, now I'd like to invite Pan Xingxing, the founder and the chairman of and the president of Star Times. In 1988, President uh, Pan started, uh, founded uh, Star Times. And then he was um, recruited as uh, the uh, Vice Chairman of uh, China's Association of Entrepreneurs in 19, 2019. He was um, nominated as uh, the Vice Chairman of uh, China-Africa uh, Businesses Association and the Chairman of um, the uh, Private Enterprise Association between China and Africa. So I'd like to ask for your impressions about the influence on the businesses along BRI after BRI is initiated. Thank you. Due to time constraint, please control time. Thank you. Many thanks to CCG's invitation to me. Yes, yeah, so this year is um, the 10th anniversary of the birth of a BRI. And uh, this 10 years is um, a fruitful 10 years. And um, BRI has become the most popular platform of cooperation in the world for this 10 years as an enterprise starting our sailing from this platform. We also gain a lot of um, upper hands from this platform. Yes, we were registered in 20, uh, 1988 as a high-tech company. And in 2002, we started broadening our business in Africa. In 2007, we started investment in African continent. In Africa, we mainly invest in the uh, licensing licensed construction of the networks and the network and the digital TV and the um, paid DTV programs network in Africa altogether 1.5 billion RMB yuan has been invested into African continent so probably we are one of the biggest um, investor as a private company from China and we are dedicated on the network construction of uh, the uh, video facilities and uh, TV live broadcast and the uh, the network has covered 45 um, countries in sub-Sahara Africa. 1.2 million people have been covered by our business. Right now, our company has uh, become the biggest uh, platform spreading the content, digital content, to the local residents. Altogether, 830 TV towers were constructed, like the uh, towers that has been deployed by CCTV, CGTN, and uh, Phoenix TV, and other mainstream TV pro uh, TV stations. 
and on our platform, there also spread the content not only from the mainstream um, strat channels of China, but also the content from their local mainstream media. And um, so Star Times provide the platform and the content through the channels to the local residents. After 10 years of the development, uh, we also have uh, developed uh, the integrated programs production, editing, and the delivery of the media content on the platform altogether. We can transmit it every year. Chinese programs. The capacity is uh, more than uh, 10,000 hours per year of Chinese programs and Chinese um, um, content. We are using more than 10 languages to broadcast this content right now. The, uh, the content were demonstrated 24-7 using four different languages, Chinese, English, Spanish, and French. And the four languages were adopted to broadcast Chinese movies and TV dramas so that the best programs content of Chinese TV and Chinese films could be delivered and disseminated to these different countries, touching all of these people and audience. I'd like to emphasize especially the children's content. We've started the Star Times Children Channel broadcasting three languages 24-7 to the local children. Star Times right now, the investment in African continent facilitate the broadcast radio and a TV network experience the fundamental changes in African continent. We deeply feel that the visions that we proposed in the beginning when we set our feet on the continent to let everyone in African continent have the access to TV and to mobile phone and to the network of the continent. Because in the beginning, the TV is something like luxury, could not be accessible by all. But right now we can see more and more people access to the the best quality content, not only within their own community, but also from China. In 2015, Johannesburg Summit of China-Africa Cooperation Forum, President Xi Jinping proposed to provide the satellite TV access to 10,000 households. Satellite TV That is um, a movement to provide the access of the satellite signals to 10,000 households. That was very uh, influential, and the impact is very tremendous. We deeply feel that in rural areas in particular, to turn on the signal of the TV, the households of a whole village will feel extremely happy because they can gather together to view and watch these um, mu movies and TV dramas with excitement. Talking about the next 10 years of the development, I truly believe that the wars has been ceased and the society has been stabilized. Right now, all corners of life are in great need of um, development and economic growth. So we can see in the next one decade, looking for the popularization of power will boil down to the popularization of um, the digital access to all households because that can generate the democratization of the power access and to invitalize the livelihood of the people and create more beautiful pictures to the normal people of daily life of the people. And uh, we feel very confident about that. In the next 10 years, BRI development, especially in African continent, would embrace even more promising future. Thank you. That's all for me.
thank you, President Pan, for your experience in Africa. You personally have witnessed the rise of one continent. Thank you. With that, I'd like to invite Pan Xiaodong, Dr. Pan Xiaodong. Pan Xiaodong is the chief engineer of uh, Great Bay Areas Association, who is also the the uh, Director General of, um, of the Water Resources Development of the Drought Areas of uh, the National Committee of uh, BRGBA. And um, he has um, been engaged in a lot of uh, research, and he had issued more than 100 articles. Thank you. Uh I, because I work for the CAS, uh, I'll talk about technic scientific and technological cooperation. It's an important part of, um, of uh, uh, Belt and Road cooperation. It is also an important bridge and bond linking different countries. The first is uh, we see that the uh, platform continues to expand since the uh, launching of this uh, initiative. Uh, we have um, seen progress in uh, technological, scientific and technological parks and joint laboratories. By the end of 2022, we have. Uh, have uh, established uh, joint uh, scientific uh, cooperation re re relations with 84 countries and uh, having uh, put in a lot of uh, resources in, in various areas. At the same time, the CAS has initiated ENSEL, the Belt and Road uh, re Joint Research association. It is comprised of uh, universities and research institutes along the Belt and Road. We have now 67 members in different continents in the world. So uh, we also have uh, different uh, have eight and transnational technological transfer centers in different regions. And second, we have uh, we are seeing deepening cooperation in talents, talent exchanges. So we have uh, more than eighteen thousand people come having come in, come to China for for technological exchanges. We also uh, ha we have conducted multiple times the, uh, the scientific uh, visits for for young scientists in ASEAN countries. Well, we have also been uh, engaging in in cultural exchanges between these uh, scientific personnel. And also, we cooperate uh, with each other in in, the, in authoring a thesis. In 2021, uh, we uh, penned together more than 20,000 papers. They are concentrated in uh, chemistry, physics, and uh, material science, and microelectronics, etc. So these are very important for us to realize connectivity, helped us uh, dovetail with uh, other countries in our respective uh, development uh, uh, initiatives and uh, programs. At the same time, we are also seeing that uh, in, against the more and more complex international landscape, we see uh, at our uh, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, cooperation will play an uh, unimportant role in the future. 
So we advise that we pay more attention to the legal and regulatory aspects of our of our cooperation. I give more attention to to the um, to platform building. So first, we need to um, s set uh, standards, uh, set uh, rules for uh, for scientific data, and also we need to. Um, strengthen cooperation with the UN and UN bodies. Um, we should uh, leverage ENSO and Chung uh, Sun Forum and Top Scientists Forum, etc., uh, and other platforms to pay more attention to common um, issues of uh, challenge. I also need to have more uh, targeted cooperation in different areas. And fourth, we need to pay attention to building platforms. So this is the. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'd give the floor to Mr. Tang Hao Xuan. CCG Senior Council Member and Chairman of FUETA International. So please control your speech of at under three minutes long. Thank you for uh, the next uh, decade of uh, Belt and Road. I have uh, three observations to share with you. The first is that after 10 years of development, Belt and Road has become an important platform for international cooperation and an important public good. So uh, I think that enterprises and governments are fully confident in the Belt and Road Initiative. I was paying a visit to Indonesia in 2018. Uh, many Western countries in, uh, and Japan have been uh, uh, rooted in uh, Indonesia for many years. But uh, so I asked them, why didn't they um, carry out something like the Belt and Road? Um, this is uh, only China in the world is uh, capable of this uh, noble task. Uh, so with this in mind, we'll uh, march with more confidence into the next decade. So well, the second point is uh, what was the um, the characteristics of the uh, that define the past decade and what are we going to do in the next ten years? Uh, you speak in the past ten years uh, we focused on the numbers, but uh, going forward, it has already become a, a very a favorite uh, public good. So we need to focus more on quality instead of. Uh, quantity. So in the future, we need to have uh, priorities, uh, be it uh, priorities in countries, regions, and uh, or uh, projects. In the past, it was possible, but uh, it's going to change in the in the future. And the third. The future depends on ourselves as well as the the inter international environment. In 2015, on March the 12th, uh, the UK has be became the first founding member among the Western countries of the AIIB, and also Italy. And became the first G7 country to sign a Belt and Road uh, Memorandum last year on uh, 26 of uh, June last year. There was this uh, infrastructure and partnership uh, agreement. Uh, so Italy and uh, UK wa were included, and also at a Indonesia, Middle East and uh, Europe economic corridor project. So if it is uh, some uh, imitation after China's uh, Belt and Road, it doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is that uh, 
it, it has emerged, if it uh, can co contribute to the development of uh, developing countries or and that of uh, humanity, we should all welcome it. Be it the result of imitation or uh, in the the result of guilty conscience. So the thing is that uh, these countries they are uh, they are parties both to uh, the Belt and Road and also to other development initiatives. Domestically, uh, our departments and enterprises and local governments. Should, uh, for example, our local governments at the national level, we have this uh, Belt and Road uh, Leadership Group, le led by uh, Vice President Han Jin. It needs to be uh, advanced in, a, in an orderly manner with a coordination, nationwide coordination. Uh, according to my knowledge, there's uh, such a leadership group in every province, so we need such a coordination uh, uh, in the government for, uh, for going, going out of uh, Chinese enterprises. Uh, we're not uh, unfamiliar to this uh, to this concept because this is what has happened over the past 40 years so many countries like uh, Japan uh, they they the enterprises went went abroad when when they have already become strong but China it's a different story we uh, we are going abroad uh, as we develop. Uh, we have been very um, very clear when we proposed the Belt and Road. It's not a solo. It's a, it's a, it's a symphony. If it is a stage, then uh, there's uh, the old countries are actors on playing on this uh, stage. I understand that among the 160 industrial parks, most of them are led and by, by enterprises, but that is not enough. If we can have uh, design at a higher level, things would have been different. The enterprises would have more freedom and discretion in choosing their destination. So we need more uh, top-level design. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Mr. Xie Hao Ming, Vice Chairman of HNA Aviation Group among other titles so Mr. Xie you have the floor thank you very much I'll briefly share about our participation in the Belt and Road Initiative HNA is part of uh, China's civil, uh, civil aviation industry building the uh, Aviation Belt and Road is uh, is a part of our objective. So for so for us, uh, we are actively promoting uh, avi uh, flight rights and uh, increase in f flight rights and flight routes among the uh, Belt and Road countries. So we're seeing uh, that uh, in this regard, uh, the situation has been much better uh, for those countries. The uh, passengers account for more than 71% of China's international uh, passengers. 
so that's uh, higher than in the past. So Belt and Road Initiative uh, has uh, stimulated the growth of uh, China's aviation industry. HNA opened its first intercontinental uh, flight, uh, the one between uh, Beijing and Budapest, to suit the needs of our cooperation. And later, uh, after that, we uh, began to open more and more flight routes to, to more destinations. Then this, our efforts were uh, part part of the uh, general uh, and efforts of the Chinese industry of aviation. We have uh, opened new 83 flight routes. 2.9 million people will be transported and the Hainan Airlines. Safety in flight operations has become uh, one of the top aviation enterprises. And IGCT have launched the uh, air fuel efficiency ranking Hainan airline is an, um, top one among the top 20 and for 12 consecutive years we have acknowledged as um, five star airline companies and the single one company receiving this acknowledgement in China and uh, Hainan airlines also have its uh, upper hands in the integrated industrial chain we also deployed the um, overall uh, industrial chain, including the uh, cargo, passenger transportation, the uh, maintenance, um, MRO, and the investment in the uh, air trafficking, and uh, the SRT, Martar uh, production base, because the uh, ACG is in Turkey, and um, the technical, and in uh, Ghana, of Africa. We also have um, the um, Africa World aviation programs to correspond to the BRI to realize the common prosperity and a common development cooperation is in place to honor our responsibility and authority. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, Hainan Airlines have uh, contributed tremendously to the BRI due to time change. I will directly invite the next speaker, Zhang Jiuan, Director of Research Management and International Cooperation Department of Academy of Contemporary China and World Studies. Dr. Zhang, in the BRI research and the world's uh, opinions, have done a lot of research. So good afternoon. Very happy to attend this uh, seminar. So uh, in terms of the international communication, BRI, in terms of uh, the uh, spread of Chinese uh, development and China's uh, type of the development, uh, BRI played a very important role in spreading this uh, pattern of the development and uh, to uh, give focus on the enrichment of the content. So I'd like to touch upon three considerations. In the past 10 years, the think tanks of the world. Their focus of the attention of uh, BRI is um, very high, especially the Asia-Pacific region's think tanks is uh, one times more than the think tanks are from EU countries and the uh, US. US, uh, Japan, and uh, South Korea, and uh, Germany, the publications from the think tanks about uh, BRI is uh, the most and the biggest in terms of the number of the publications. The benefits are given to the uh, BRI countries in terms of the infrastructure, development, momentum for the growth of the economy, and uh, so on and so forth. The contributions has been highly acknowledged by the international opinions. And uh, thirdly, U.S. and uh, European countries also have uh, provided some kind of uh, substitute of BRI from last year on. The so-called replacement or substitute of BRI by EU and US has been raised. And we have noticed that China versus um, EU countries would not see this uh, substitute as um, in the same page of a BRI. 
in terms of the number of the programs and benefit created to the local community. So in the future going forward, I have three suggestions. The first one is uh, to look at the basic conditions and requirements and demands of the local community along BRI so that the articles, the publications of the research could be more refined. The actual demand and expectations in this research is yet to be unleashed. And the second, we have to set up the typical showcases so that the small but beautiful cases could be demonstrated in a larger scale as a role model. And the third, the think tanks on the BRI shall introduce Chinese perspective to push forward the knowledge uh, from China side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John. Very concise, very concrete, and uh, very specific sharing. Due to time constraint, I'd like to do a very small and a brief wrap up for this uh, round table. There are different viewpoints. First of all, personal experiences of four directions government, international viewpoints, enterprises viewpoints, and universities and research institute viewpoints. Personal experiences and the four dimensions fully demonstrate that BRI showed the responsibility to push for the realization of common prosperity of human beings and a community shared by all. On behalf of CCG, I'd like to give my thanks to all of the representatives and panelists for your sincere sharing, and many thanks to the very patient audience for staying with us for the whole day. With um, the conclusion of the last round table, we, on behalf of CCG, like to show and express our gratitude for your attendance for this uh, ninth China and Globalization Forum. Looking forward to seeing you in the next year.